Q&A app. Yes, this Hangout is live. Yes, we have a Q&A app. We have three viewers waiting for us to get started. It's like literally just ending now. Oh, that's perfect, Mike. So for those of you just joining us, all three of you just joining us, we are in the process of moving our Hangout um, from, from being uh, part of the Astronomers Without Borders Hangout to bringing it back to its home uh, over here on, um, well, on my YouTube channel. And we are bringing back our Hangout-a-thon to my attic set. Um, and we're glad to have with us this hour uh, the amazing team that are the founders and the driving force behind Empty Set Media. Um, I feel like I should blather longer while I work on getting our audience back. Um, <laughs> yes. Our audience is currently <laughs> shifting um, between Hangouts. Uh, I just want to, I, I was tuned in for Mike's broadcast. Uh, so thank you, Mike Simmons, and the whole crew over there at Mount Wilson Observatory for a really well done, professionally videoed uh, tour of the Solar Observatory there. That was really great. So I don't know if you guys can hear now, but if you're watching this later, thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone at the Mount Wilson Observatory for that amazing tour that you just gave us. Uh, I actually watched the viewer numbers all move from the attic to you guys. And so hopefully they're all moving back now. So if you're watching this, uh, share the link out. Tell people to refresh the page. Tweet out the link. Get people back in here. Uh, because we are going, we have several more hours of hang out a thon We to go. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> How much more do you have? Uh, we are going, it is now 3 p.m. Yes, we have seven, seven hours, more hours. And I hate to say this because you guys are rock stars no matter what, but... Um, uh, this year, with the built-in super naps, or you know, power naps, I, you yeah. seem to be a little less loopy. <laughs> <laughs> a little <laughs> less loopy. Yeah, it it was it was truly truly required. I hate 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 having to admit that, but um, she hates admitting she's human and needs sleep. Yeah, sometimes you got to do that. <laughs> yeah, I I completely disagree. Sleep is not necessary. No, no need for sleep. I would rather watch you guys go. We should make it 48 hours, no sleep, with possibly some kind of chemical additives. It is science. They, oh, dude, they are so hopped up on caffeine and apparently natural sugar that comes from fruit. Yes, there is a lot of fruit and Nutella and peanut butter and and goodness here. Yeah. Nutella. I I do have a a fruit addiction that that has been getting fed throughout this hangout. It's really kind of amazing what happens to fruit when it is left near me. <laughs> it um, doesn't last long. It doesn't last long, let me tell you. And I'm loving the comments. So so thank you so much for following us back from the Astronomers Without Borders hangout at Snow Observatory at Mount Wilson. Um, I can see Rich Hayward saying, cool observatory, I want one. I think we all want one. And Jeff Seltzer's coming back with Magic of the Internet from Mount Wilson to Pamela's Attic. Woo! And um, <laughs> I don't know how long this is. This has been around. Uh, Jim Meeker is saying, "Donate people. The weather gods are angry. We yes, the weather gods are angry. So donate to quiet the weather gods." Yeah, we totally had a, like a minute of sunshine when Donna was on. <laughs> you guys missed. Donna McGavro, the uh, misinformation. No, something of doom. What does she do of doom for She's you guys? She's a diva of design for us, He's actually. A diva of design for you guys. Uh, she was on. We had a little bit of sunshine when she was here, and then it went away. When she went away. So, that's yeah. that's exactly how she acts in everyone's life, actually. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so so we are entering our final segment of the the 36 hours of insanity. Um, of awesome, of win, of raising money for science. Because as my my shirt says, science can do anything. And it's a verb now. <laughs> so science. And and one of our favorite groups of people to work with on, on science things who have always been so willing to play along um, is, is A. Kovacs and Scott Sigler. Uh, we got to collaborate on a project um, a couple of years ago called Free Wi-Fi on Mars, where we subjected poor Scott, 
along with Mer Lafferty, Nathan Lowell, who will be coming on later this hour, and Christiana Ellis, we, we subjected them to a lecture on science by Bill Keel, and then challenged them to an Iron Writers Challenge, where they took turns speed writing and answering questions, and at the end of it, they had created science fiction stories based on the brand new science they had learned, and randomized abstracts I created and inflict upon their poor souls. And we created something awesome. And, and we are back to talk about how science in, invades um, uh, all of these different things. And we're also going to let you invade this Hangout. So we are using the Q&A app. And uh, for us, this is just a link over on the side of our screen that gets all of these questions flowing into our Hangout where the group of us can see them. And occasionally, we will go to answer them. So the one that's on top right now is from Gary Lindros. And I'm going to go ahead and click select on that, pop it up. And, and Gary is asking, what is Scott's favorite astronomical body? <laughs> hmm. That's a tough later. question. because <laughs> There are uh, so many of them to choose from. I would have to say... It's a three-way tie, and no, Gary, no comments about the uh, the three-way tie there, since you're clearly trying to lead the question. Number one, well, no, it's it's equal. Num the moon is always quite impressive with the amount of impact that it has on our world, and the whole tidal system, and how much that may have factored into currents and stirring things up on this planet to facilitate evolution to start with. Number two, I think, uh, is it. The Andromeda Galaxy is the closest one, is that correct? Mm -hmm. It's the, the closest, closest galaxy to us. large galaxy. Closest large galaxy. Uh, that one I have seen through a telescope. And um, seeing a whole, it's like a whole other galaxy. Seeing that through a telescope absolutely blew my mind. <laughs> Could not, just still can't quite process uh, how much is going on in our galaxy. And then there's a whole other galaxy, and then several million more of them. And then um, the other thing that, that, tripped me out was looking through a telescope and seeing the moons of Jupiter. Oh, I'm so and glad you said that. I was going to say, <laughs> if you don't say, I was going to tell them all about being at the star party at Dragon Con. Yeah. And like, get the f Yeah, that was yeah, great. I could, not believe, I could not believe I'm like, it, it's like, so on the one hand, it's a whole other galaxy, and on the other hand, it's a whole other planet. And those three things of, um, the moon, of course, we see all the time, but the other two just Really blew me away. So those are my three favorite astronomical bodies. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the, the tasteful, lovely answer. <laughs> so we know a bunch of your junkies are coming in, but we've also got a bunch of astronomy peeps that have been with us for looks like pretty much the whole time. Yeah. Tell them who you are, because if they don't know who you are, they need to get addicted. Yes. <laughs> I am Scott Sigler. I am an author, and I have written five books for Random House, which are modern science horror thrillers, a lot of hard, um, sorry, modern day horror thrillers, a lot of hard science justify the carnage that tends to happen in these books, no supernatural elements to them, and so that should appeal, if you like your fiction, with a, a dose of peer-reviewed science, that these books have it. So they are thrillers that have a couple of biology PhDs and um, MD and several military consultants and police consultants, etc. go through them. We made things as realistic as possible while remembering we're still telling a crazy story and sometimes there's monsters, so not entirely scientifically accurate, but a lot of fun. Then Co A. Kovacs and I put out the Galactic Football League series, which is a young adult series that 700 years in the future where alien races join humans to play American football, and that is the backdrop to a kind of a traditional hero's quest story. We have our main character, Quentin Barnes, who comes from an all-human system, and it's all-human because he's been raised to hate all the other species, but he wants to be the best football player that's ever been, so he has to go and join the league that, ha that is fully integrated with four other races playing, send their physiology at the different skill positions. So those are the two main things we have up. I have another series coming out next year from Del Rey, which we're very excited about. And you can get, give away all my stuff as a free podcast over at scottsigler.com. You can also find almost all my audiobooks either as a paid download at Audible or iTunes or free at iTunes.com. Just search for Scott Sigler. 
yes, this man responsible for many, many nightmares, uh, but also <laughs> entertaining me while putting together many, many lectures uh, for class time when I'm trying to find the perfect image, just listening to your stories, uh, as well as when I lived seven hours away from Timothy, the partner of mine who shows up later. Um, yeah, so I, I love all your work, and it is super cool getting to hang out with you. And also, here, little, when you send me astronomy questions, when I know you're working on a book, I'm like, ooh, 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 it's next book of Ooh, I'm getting little tiny spoilers. I love it. So it's, it's totally awesome. And, yep. and I have to say, one, you are responsible for one of the best quotes of the Hangout so far, and two, you are responsible for scaring my horse. And these two things are, are uh, <laughs> interrelated. I, I, I have a horse, his name is Ben, his Twitter handle, which he doesn't tweet very much, is uh, Ben Strider, and uh, I have done all manner of different things to try and distract myself from all of the scary noises that exist outside of the barn, ranging from barking dogs to people practicing shooting their guns, it's the country. Um, and uh, so I've, I've tried listening to music, and the problem I run into is my uh, off the course thoroughbred, here's the music, it's like, I can go to the rhythm of the music, which is usually faster than I'd like to be going for as long as the music lasts. Um, and so I was trying to listen to Nocturnal while horseback riding, and everything started fine, because it didn't start in one of those scenes, but it progressed <laughs> to one of those scenes. Oh, the new Nocturnal. And, okay. and horses are extremely sensitive to pheromones. And as my body started to go, this is a scary thought, my horse started to go, because <gasps> he was trying to figure out what the heck it was that I was scared about that he needed to either bite or run away from. He didn't know what was wrong, but he knew, as I'm listening to Nocturnal, that there was something scary. And, and so I've had to realize I can pretty much only listen to science podcasts while riding my horse, because my horse is not That's afraid great. of science. My horse That's is great. I now, now I know I have managed to frighten a, another species, and that's, that's quite right. a feather in the cap. So that's great. <laughs> yes, without you know yelling at the how at the dog. The stories have actually scared horses. That's pretty. Scary. And and I admit I'm one of the people that went a long time without reading your stuff because people kept telling me it was too scary to read. And I've learned that when I'm undergoing long airplane flights and need to be kept awake, that is the appropriate time to listen to Sigler. So I have very Good. definitive memories of triangular scariness being removed from things and stuff <sighs> while standing in various restaurants. Especially the stuff, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> things so, and so stuff. There, yeah. there are places that are yeah, so where I can't eat anymore because of you. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's good too. So the books are the books, except for the Galactic Football League series, which is uh, a little bit more fun and very much more spacey. Um, you know, the novels that I write really appeal to people of scientific bent. People who really dig supernatural fiction and science like the people who mostly focus on supernatural fiction. Sometimes they dig them, sometimes they don't, but it's, it seems to be kind of rare. And there's a handful of authors who do it, definitely. But it seems to be kind of rare for people to go, oh, I can tell that you took the time to research this and get a bunch of it right anyways. And, and all of the scares are based on science, which... If you know science, tends to make you get pulled further down the rabbit hole because you can tell that I'm pandering to you people. <laughs> and, and one of the results of you working so hard to create universes that are realistic, that are neatly tied together, that are scary as all, insert every expletive, is uh, Ray Hayward points <laughs> out that Scott's work is virtually all five star on Amazon. Yeah. And, and we're really happy that, that the media company that the two of you have founded, Empty Set Entertainment, um, has actually picked us as, as one of your charities that you contribute to. And while we would have had you on, even if that wasn't the case today, to talk about how science and fiction get twined together, because that's just stupid fun and I can do that all day long, um, you guys are actually going to do everything you can to help our fundraiser. And you're going to leverage the Sigler junkies and their uh, rabid... Um, thirst, although rabid isn't thirsty, so I don't rabbit. understand. Rabbit hunger, that one. <laughs> rabbit rabidity. <laughs> Rabbits get thirsty too. Totally okay. <laughs> uh, your your uh, Sigler junkies hunger for 
stuff that, that is from the Siglerverse. Um, and, and I'm going to let you uh, introduce what it is that, that you are going to give as thanks to people who donate within this segment. So we have a handful of things. I, first, I want to tell you guys, I finally caught up from yesterday. Um, we had a matching hour yesterday where anybody who donated, we, we matched up to $1,000. And then I left you guys hanging and didn't do the match. So I just took care of the match. Hopefully, we'll see that soon. Um, and then this hour, while we're on, um, we have two things, I, I think. And Pamela, I know we have one, but if the other one's not quite right, you let me know, uh, timing-wise. First one, while Scott and I are on today, we whoever donates the the lar makes the largest donation this hour um, will get a pristine, brand new, unnumbered copy of the MVP, which is uh, currently sold out. The hardcover of the MVP is sold out, and we can't number it because we sold out of the numbered copies, but we have some few left over. And so instead, we're going to have Scott doodle on that front page where the number would be. Um, maybe he'll draw his favorite uh, astronomical bodies. I don't know. Um, and uh, and that way, it'll be special, even though it won't be a numbered copy. And you know, obviously, because they're limited edition, we can't do a lot of that. But we figured that would be this would be the right place to do that. So minimum is it has to be um, a minimum donation of $100 because, as Pamela says, nobody gets a free lunch, and that is uh, about the amount, I guess, uh, for an astronomer to go to lunch. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. That's no. a Wish. big anniversary dinner. With yeah. A big anniversary yeah. dinner. Yeah, yeah or, or the going out to celebrate because, because this was successful and we're paying for everyone in this room to get dinner. That, that's exactly $100. right. Or, or probably the cost of fruit for the entire Hangout-a-thon, 3636 <laughs> Hangout-a-thon. Maybe. I don't want to know. Yeah, Dawn, who is the supplier of fruit, is shaking her head. I'm a, I'm a little bit disgusted at myself for how much fruit I've consumed. <laughs> of all the things, yes. you can bend, John. You're fine. <laughs> yeah, no, it's exactly right. You can, really can't go wrong with fruit. It's good for you. Uh, so anyway, that's it. We're going to give away a brand new, unnumbered, but uh, special astronomical doodle from Scott Sigler uh, in the front cover, inside front cover, where the number should be. Um, and how you can do that is you make the largest donation this hour while we're on, and in the comment section when you're making the donation, you say you want the MVP. And whoever makes the most or donates the most, you'll get that. In addition, this is the part I'm not quite so sure about, Pamela, so correct me if I'm wrong. We have 10 sets of the first two um, books in this series, the GFL series, the Rookie and the Starter. We have 10 sets of paperbacks that we're willing to give away. That doesn't, for, for me, however you guys want to do that, we can do that this hour, we can do that for the rest of the time. I don't know how we do that part because that's, um, I think there's more to play with there. So you let me know how we should do that. So, so I'm thinking... Uh, Well, while she's thinking, I'll tell you a little bit about this Rookery and the Starter, um, which are the first two books in the GFL series, because we had a comment from Guido Bieber saying, uh, and, and others may be feeling that way, horror, I don't know how I feel about it, like with Pamela, she wasn't, didn't know how scary things would get, you want to get started on Sigler's books, and you're not sure about the, the horror and the gore, start with the GFL, uh, it's it's because it's a young adult series, it's a bit friendlier, and the Rookie is where the story starts, and we are four books in now, and five is coming out. At the end of the yep. summer. Can I, what's the, yep. is five the champion. Title? Yeah, it's public. It's called The Champion. Champ okay, so it is called The Champion. Uh, so Rookie and Starter are where the story starts. Um, and it's, you know, I, I used to watch a lot of football as a kid. I still do every once in a while, especially when I was one. J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. Jets, Jets, Jets. <laughs> 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 I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell everybody a little bit about that. It, um, the, the Galactic Football League series, it starts with the rookie, and one of the most common responses we get from our science-based fellow nerdy, geeky people is, oh, yeah, I don't like football, and, right. and I don't like sports. It's extremely common, and when I started this, I gave this away as a free podcast after having given away several books free podcast and urged the thousands of people listening to yeah, I've given you all these free books. All I'm asking you for is is four episodes, which basically would correlate to four. You get the rookie ebook or the paperback, and you give it four chapters, yes. and you will find that it, you know, because it's it's um there's a lot of world building and galaxy building in it, and you find that the football number one it it's largely a backdrop. It provides the setting by which our character's motivation is to 
overcome his incredibly racist upbringing, and he just flat out doesn't know any better. This is the way he was raised, and he's never met any other species. And but for him to compete at the level he wants to and achieve his goals, he has to join. He has to integrate with the rest of the league. So our main character is kind of a dink, you know. When it starts out, he's really a jerk, and you watch his growth. So you don't really need to don't need to know anything about football. And then the other sort of treat to this is that as you're reading the story and following these characters that I the, I hope these characters are engaging and, and keep you captivated by the story, I do sneak in an enormous amount of football, basic football knowledge. And it is an incredibly complicated sport, but if you can get a hold of the basically the first 40% of the fundamentals of, of the rules, and there's so many little rules, if you watch football on TV and don't know what's going on, it's just chaos. It, it's not it's not interesting. It doesn't hold your attention. Once you learn these little bits that are seeded in with the story, well, all of a sudden, you understand what's going on, on screen. And probably the most satisfying thing I've had in my career as an author is getting emails from my fellow nerd slash geeks saying, you know, I, I'm 30 years old. I've never watched football. I hate it. Now I watch the game with my mom or my dad. I understand it. And I was able to sit down at Thanksgiving and watch a game. And I figured out what's going on. And people are then very interested in watching the sport because it's not, you know, it's 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 very complicated. And there's an enormous amount of math in it, particularly in the rookie when you go through the passing tree variables or how much math a quarterback has to do in about three seconds yep. while people are trying to knock his head off. It's There's a lot of really cool stuff, so you don't need to know football to enjoy it. Absolutely. I'm loving the comments that you guys are provoking. Um, but before I go into to hitting on those, I think we're going to invoke the math sequence again. There's a, a wonderful math sequence that leads to the golden ratio. So if you've ever seen one of those animations, and if you haven't, I will have to create one, um, of, of a spiral being created out of squares and rectangles, that's the, go golden the golden ratio leading to that. And the mathematical series is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, uh, 34, can't do math in my head. Um, so, so we will give out the, the MVP, uh, not the MVP, the, the first two books in the Galactic Football League, the GFL series, to people during this hour who uh, say GFL, so you have to put GFL in the comment, who are donors, the first donor to put GFL, the second donor to put GFL, the third donor to put GFL, the fifth donor to put GFL, and you have to donate, since this is two books, you have to donate at least two astronomers going out for a nice launch. So at least $20? Yeah. So at least $20 to get these two books. So there's no free lunch. You're paying for lunch. For two astronomers, actually, we don't buy food. We're not allowed to buy food per university rules unless there's paperwork and things and stuff that that is only once or twice a year. Don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> is only once or twice a year is that line broken. Um, so, so any money that you donate, this is going to go towards uh, us being able to do science, communicate science, do the software, do the infographics, do the citizen science we announced yesterday, we got Mars! Um, so we're going to be doing a citizen science project with the planet Mars. So we're going to have Moon, Mercury, Mars, Vesta, which strangely doesn't, belong, doesn't uh, begin with the letter M. Um, we need more worlds not beginning with the letter M. Um, we're going to eventually be getting serious, assuming Dawn stays healthy. Um, you guys are helping us facilitate that, but you guys are actually very strongly interested in trying to get like we are, people who aren't science geeks interested in science. And and we're looking at the end of this Hangout-a-thon and the 36 days after it, uh, working with you to launch a new Kickstarter project that you guys are going to head up and we're going to get to be part of. Right, exactly. We're really excited about the Kickstarter, actually. Um, and Scott, jump in whenever you want, but I'll sort of start it off by saying we have had this interest for over a year now. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we're finally kicking it off, which will I make. I Google Doc. <laughs> I know. Which I was just about to say, which will make Nicole super happy because she's done all the work on this that has been done so far, um, and then it sat fallow for 
because we're all quite busy and, and everything else. But now we're going to put it into action probably in June uh, after the 36 hour hangout-a-thon is over, after uh, the 36 days are over. Not quite after the 36 days. Well, maybe we'll wait till then. Um, and the, the sum of it is this. We are going to create, if you're unfamiliar with Scott's books, all of Scott's books that take place in take place in something called the Siglerverse. And the Siglerverse looks quite a lot like the universe. Uh, the things, all the rules that apply to our physical universe now pretty much apply to the Siglerverse. There's things like faster than light travel, which we accept as a conceit because otherwise not as much fun. Um, but yeah. other than that, look oh, quite a lot games like... Would be really hard. They really, really are. Difficult. <laughs> really they hard. Really yeah. difficult, but yeah. They did really yeah. Really yeah. The two big ones, there, there's three big conceits that we have done, and they are, there, there's, there's three. There is um, obviously faster than light travel, which we have a, a different approach to it, which is based on gravity wells and large, large bodies out there. Um, so you, you can just go in any direction. If you know you have faster than light travel in any direction, that makes war almost impossible. You can't stop anybody from coming at you. For many ways, so we figured out a way to create choke points because the Sigilverse isn't just the Galactic Football League, which is 700 years in the future. It's also the Crypt Era, which is another set of stories 500 years in the future, where in Galactic Football League everybody gets long place football, in the Crypt everybody's killing each other and often eating each other too. It's 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 kind of nuts, but there's a lot of starship battle, etc. So one of the ways to figure that out is we have faster than light travel, but you have to go from point to point so that you can actually have fronts and choke points, etc., to make it fun. Second one is uh, artificial gravity. Just wave my hand, and the ships have normal gravity because otherwise you have to do tons of explaining, which takes away from the story. And then third one is although the aliens have completely different physiology, we don't just have you know human bipeds with some junk on their nose, and they are a slightly different color uh, because we're not writing TV, and we can actually make up anything we want. Most of the major races all kind of breathe the same atmosphere that we do and survive in a largely similar gravity, et cetera, exposure to the sun. So they can same all play football frame. together. Same time, And they all evolved in roughly the same time frame. Well, you where, mentioned that in the um, book. You mentioned that scientists are baffled. Yeah. And so you still put in there the reality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we put in there that the scientists cannot figure out how did all these, how did 20 races kind of evolve in right about the same time. So we uh, introduced the mystery, and that makes the mystery go away. So it all works out pretty well. So we've got these three major conceits, but other than that, what we're trying to do with this Kickstarter, and I'm sure that other authors and creators have done this before, I'm just not familiar with it, is we are trying to map all of the worlds of the Siglerverse to actual stars and planets especially the exoplanets that we are now discovering. So that's right. that's where CosmoQuest comes in. And let's get it as close as we can. I've got a map of the Siglerverse, and we're going to try and you know, have Noisy map that to an actual galaxy map and say, well, it could be this planet. <laughs> we're going to try and nail down real, real planets where the species actually live. So it should be very exciting to people who love the series because they can. You know, it'll, it'll be kind of like looking through the telescope and seeing Jupiter. It'd be like there's that moment of, wait a minute, these are actual plants that could possibly actually support life, that could possibly actually have an alien culture on it. Actually, yes, that's what, we're, that's what we're going yeah. for. Yeah. Yes, could actually be the fifth home world, and you know, then there is hopefully the other side. So that'll light a lot of kids on fire, I think, and a lot of people who just enjoy the series. That wait a minute moment gets them interested, hopefully, in science. So wait, this is an actual real thing. And the other side of the coin, too, is people who are interested in science, maybe not interested in the fiction, will have that wait a minute moment. Wait a minute. So you're telling me that the, you know, the random fake worlds that you have invented in the story actually map to real astronomy? And you'd be like, yes, that's what we're going for. So that's what we're right. trying to accomplish with our Kickstarter. And the Kickstarter end result, I think, um, is... Uh, we'll, we'll firm up in the next uh, month or so, but right now we're targeting creating a f an actual physical poster um, that that at the end of the Kickstarter, at whatever donation level, you'll, you'll receive a poster in the mail. Other than that, we'll obviously be able to sell them um, that will look cool and, and be 
as accurate as we can get that with the known exoplanets and the known uh, heavenly bodies, as it were, uh, now. And um, at least then you can sort of follow along at home the same way that uh, we get a lot of email where people think that something that Scott's written is totally made up and then they Google for example, Morgellons disease, which shows up in the infected, um, every once in a while somebody will be like, I thought you were making all that up, and then I Googled it, and this will be sort of a way to, people can kind of look at, wait a minute, so this is the quith, potentially the quith homeworld, or whatever, will be pretty cool, I think. So there's a whole bunch of things, uh, again, that Noisy did all the work on, uh, uh, levels, uh, wind, stuff like that, but part of the plan, I think, is that uh, at a certain donation level or a certain... Um, uh, uh, you can claim a dinner at Dragon Con with the three of you guys uh, if that's your bag or whatever. So we're hoping to put it into play in June, have it ready to go so that we can hand out um, those level reward level things uh, that need to have the three of you in the same place. Hopefully and Dragon Con. The reason we need to kickstart this is because postage is not free and we're planning to play in the physical world instead of the digital world. Exactly. And so we're, um, empty set will take care of the printing and stuff like that, so we'll absorb some of the, the sort of the fundamental cost of getting it done, and most of the, and yes, we have to pay for postage, but most of the money that we make from there, and then the profit from the, um, the after the Kickstarter is over and the, the, the um, poster exists, the profit from that will all go to CosmoQuest. And, and we're going to turn that into a curriculum that allows schools to do things like um, here are planets, here are science fiction, discuss. So we can get into mm -hmm. the topics of astrobiology, the mm -hmm. topics of evolution, the topics of uh, things like Fermi's paradox, and, and so we can turn the Galactic Football League into a teachable moment so that all of these kids who may be science fiction fans or heck may not know they like to read yet but are encountering Scott's books. We we can create readers who like science who are learning reality. I've actually and, and I think Scott knows this a couple years ago, I actually used the GFL books in a college course that I was teaching about astrobiology as examples of interesting, not at all human like biology. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I did use the, I did actually use the GFL books in a college course on astrobiology. Nice. So, that's that's awesome, and we we have a curriculum guide for the Rudy, which is free from at scottsigler.com. Find that, but uh, they, and this largely been uh, an accident that A and I have kind of stumbled onto. I wrote the original first draft of the Rookie. I'm going to guess 15, 16 years ago now, somewhere in that ballpark, and it was originally very foul mouthed because my football experience on the football field. There's a lot of uh, colorful language on a football field when you play in. Michigan, and uh, a couple things happened, and we, and we got some feedback from, of all things, Apple at the iTunes store, and said, you know, you could turn this into a YA series, and there's not a lot of fiction like this that appeals mm -hmm. to athletically minded kids or some of the sci-fi minded kids. Most sci-fi minded kids are tend to be good students. A lot of them aren't. So they said, you have a, a resource here that could help get a lot of kids into reading. We're like, all right, sweet. So we turned it into a Y series, made some very subtle changes, and now we're finding that this is used by teachers, sometimes in college, sometimes in high school. We've got people emailing us uh, from different places in the U.S. and even the U.K., which is fascinating. Uh, the, the, there's three schools in the U.K. where teachers are using this series to kind of do that that same thing that Noisy did. Like, here's real physiology. These aliens make sense. They could have evolved this way. They don't look like us. And then you've got all the other, uh, the um, the political elements going on. So it's, it's very exciting to be able to have this be part of turning kids on to reading, turning kids on to science. And then we think this Kickstarter is going to bump that up a notch. And it's, it's we've never done a Kickstarter before, and the first Kickstarter we do all the profits go to CosmoQuest. So uh, it, you know, we love we love helping out CosmoQuest, and we're going to be really excited to get out there and pimp it. And the best part of it is, since you know the money's not going to us, I'll be able to be absolutely obnoxious about pimping this thing because <laughs> money's going to <laughs> the money's going to an exceptional cause, and it's helping you know science awareness and science education. 
And those of you who know and, me, if you think I'm already obnoxious, wait till you see this. It's going to be something so else. Empty set entertainment running the Kickstarter. We don't have to worry about state of Illinois issues, which are the reason that we're doing our hangout a thon. So, so for me to stand here or in reality sit in a very comfortable chair with a fish pillow behind me, um, um, this, this, the state of Illinois, we, we just have a lot of legal restrictions, and, and so there's a lot of things that we can't do. So when I'm asking for money, um, I'm saying I need you to donate it to Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, which is where the build team for CosmoQuest, which is a giant collaboration, is located. When you're supporting this particular hangout on air, this hangout-a-thon for 36 hours, what you're supporting is our core team maintaining our software, creating new features, designing educational resources, uh, all the different things we do, paying stipends to teachers who come out for teacher professional development. You're, you're supporting our core goals and giving to our core programs. We also partner with a lot of other entities. We had Youngstown State University on earlier. They contracted us to do narration work for them, uh, for their planetarium shows. Uh, we, we work with partners to develop things in, a, in this wonderful environment where we all work to support each other, and um, it, it's through mutual partnerships, mutual support, and, and love, um, promote love and science, not war. Um, that we are able to accomplish amazing things. And and right now, as, as special thanks from you, bypassing us has nothing to do um, with touching my postage or anything else. You guys are offering to send as your gift uh, of thanks books one and two of the GFL series, which we will be mapping to the known universe, which is also cool because we can use data from the Kepler mission to create activities for kids. Um, so that we can get them actually like looking at how the planets that they're talking about eclipse the stars they're orbiting. We can play with data with children with minds and create a map and things and stuff. I'm just going to keep saying that. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting because we get, we, since the um, sort of advent and evolution of Kickstarter, we have a lot of folks who email us and say, well, wait, why don't you guys do a Kickstarter? And part of it is that's, you know, our business model is different and, um, we have the ability to kind of do it in a different way, which not every author uh, can do. We also do a much bigger, um, we, you know, we have a, a whole store and everything else for us, but certainly it's a useful medium, and we're just now, um, for the first time, Scott's joined uh, the Storium Kickstarter, uh, just so that we can sort of get our training wheels done and kind of know what we're looking at and know how much updating is required and know how much work is required and all that other stuff so that we can launch this Kickstarter in June. and. Uh, you know, part of citizen science, I think, is understanding one, science isn't as scary as you think, and two, if you're if you're not part of it, you're you're missing out. And so, while you can't do a lot of things because of the state of Illinois, we're gonna get our feet wet with Kickstarter with you guys and rely on the sort of you know Scott going out to to the con the contingent that are sort of his fans, and then. I know there's some overlap, but I think you guys have a totally different reach, and maybe if we combine forces like that, that'll be a pretty successful um, endeavor for CosmoQuest. And, and, and I'm looking at our donations right now, and um, there are still books to be given away, and that MVP is still unclaimed. <gasps> yeah. Special edition MVP. This is sold out, you guys. This is the latest book. You can't keep going without knowing what happened in the MVP. It was ah, no spoilers. <laughs> it was amazing. So, so I'm gonna let you read. Well, I, I, I will make an appeal to the people watching this. No, it's Scott. I know what I'm going. I'm. I know it's a hundred bucks, and if you've already donated, okay. But if you haven't donated, it's going straight to Cosmo Quest. I will personally draw in there. I was going to just draw the moment before the Big Bang and just put a little tiny dot and then that was it. Cheating. And, but Cheating. I think, Cheater. <laughs> <laughs> I think I will draw, I will I will put as many as two original drawings inside of this. I will personalize it to you and and part of that personalization is going to be extolling your vir virtues as a supporter of the sciences, announcing that you are a pillar 
of the establishment that helps make science happen. Without your purchase of the MVP, everything might possibly collapse and we would not teach science in schools anymore at all. So that's 100 bucks. That's Maybe not bad. You can bust that out of the party. Okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> the next time, the next time, some smart aleck is at your house bragging about how they did this and how they did that, and they got all this thing going on. You pull out this copy of the MVP, you open it up, and say, "This author said this about me." Where's your book where the author says that you are a pillar of the science education community? And they got bupkis. They got nothing. <laughs> so to donate, go to cosmoquest.org/lowercasehangoutathon. Um. And and that MVP is is waiting for someone to get their name on it. So so we have um, a congratulations from Guido Vibra who says congratulations on going across twenty thousand dollars. This hangout a thon is hang out a thon is now officially more successful than last year's, and there are still some hours to go. I'm just happy my hair is still safe from being dyed blonde. Fifty thousand people. For now. Come for on. Now. What? For now. That's for, for now. now. There's for still now. plenty of time. That's true. Um, so, so we have Dean Martin. Um, really? <laughs> I, I kid you not. We have Dean Martin. We had Stephen King on earlier. So um, we have Dean Martin on saying, I can finally help PhD students. I can help you learn the rules of football in exchange for helping understand the universe. And I'll, sweeten the, I'll sweeten the pot a little bit more. Um, so. Obviously, Empty Set has made a matching donation from yesterday. Scott is willing to extol your virtues uh, as a p pillar, something, something, something in the MVP. Um, and if you make a $100 or more donation, you get the MVP. I'll also match that personally. I'll make a $100 donation if you do. That'll double down for CosmoQuest, and you'll be what? apparently fantastic and a pillar. That's crazy. That's an extra hundred bucks. That's so your hundred bucks becomes two hundred bucks. Exactly right. That's not exactly. wild. Buck my toes. Yeah. <laughs> Make it happen. It's the uh, it's stem cell of donations, really. You put in a hundred bucks, boom, it magically becomes two hundred bucks. Get what could you like? Blood. <laughs> <laughs> not you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Scott's around. I get louder. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Refreshing pages does not help things come in faster. Mm. Uh, so, so we'll make Scott continue to yell at you. <laughs> oh yeah, and you know there's going to be a lot of yelling in the video for the Kickstarter. There's going to be a lot of drama. <laughs> I, I had I had totally forgot about the asset that I have at my disposal for the Kickstarter video, which is getting noisy all spun up and seeing we can uh, not only get her to yell, get her to slip into her native accent and watch the fun happen. It's going to be really good. Really it good. Yeah, it, doesn't t it usually involves wine and or mention of a certain jet <laughs> coach from the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will never forget the Dragon Con after she had a job offer-ish, but before she'd actually been... It's before I'd officially gotten the job offer. It, it was when we, we knew that the job offer was coming, but the job didn't officially exist in the system and it still had to be competed. But I knew there were only two people on the planet that had the skill set I needed, and the other one lived in Australia, and I didn't think she was interested. So so we, we did uh, a never aired, as far as I know, um, interview with... Your your cousin Vinny? No. 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 no, because you'd like his cousin Vizzy, Vinny. Unfortunately, <laughs> you interviewed with his cousin Frankie. That was a totally different thing. Yeah, Francis Dominic Olivieri interview, which I think has been lost, fortunately. I'm not I think entirely safely sure. safely is a one time only you had to be in the room. You had to be in the yeah. room. And, and I got, she got liquored, I got liquored. I got dragged in. Liz got liquored. 
Liz got third in the third. <laughs> Hi, Liz. I know she's watching. And, and for those of you who think this simply sounds drunk, there was actually a purpose. This yeah. was the 10 shots, 10 questions. No, it was supposed to be five. I think it's five plus a bonus question, but that might explain you. No, 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 no. It was supposed to be five, and it became ten, because Pavel apparently takes a long time to get drunk. And Scott was trying, Frankie was trying to get her so drunk she couldn't science, and he failed. He failed. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I have to admit there was a secret weapon that liver. Frankie didn't know about. No, it had nothing to do with my, my liver. I have an extraordinarily slow metabolism, so there's like a 30-minute delay on <laughs> drinking. And this is extremely bad in most cases, <laughs> but it allowed me to get through that particular interview and just keep sciencing. Oh, that is the Brits you hang out looks with. Like, looks like somebody claimed the MVP I'm seeing. Is that true? Is that true? Oh, hold on. Refreshing. Oh, we're at 21,153, so... Where did oh, you see that, Scott? So, so I see under have... questions, uh, Mr. Bibra. I hope I pronounced that correctly. MVP should now be claimed. I don't know if we that's We now have or... two people who donated $100 within 10 seconds of each other. All right, here's what we're going to do. Oh, here's what we're going to do. I got this. I got this. Okay. We'll throw in a second copy of the MVP, and I'll match the 100 bucks for the second copy of the nice. MVP. Nice. So oh, I got the first one, I got the second one. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Yay! So you do not have to fight it out in the octagon. Uh, you will no, 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 no. They, they have to fight in the octagon. But <laughs> whether... You don't have to fight in the octagon. I'm sorry. Never mind. Come on. What are you talking about? they got to fight. There's got to be blood. Hopefully they both live. But if you don't, then your heir will get the book, and the money still gets donated in your name. So it's not that bad. It's a good deal. <laughs> so, so that's good. Ten seconds, $400. That's not bad. That's not bad. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Not bad. I, I'm... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Free Wi-Fi on Mars. <laughs> and and so here we have another giveaway. Um, so we are going to give these away to um, the the. Uh, it's a comic book that has been signed. I don't actually have one of the signed ones. I have the one that I read in the middle of the night when I'm forgetting which of uh, which characters in Nathan's story has which gender, which led to an interesting reading of the first two pages when their genders were reversed. Um, Here's a story. Yeah. So, so this is um, a... So I've told this story from my perspective a number of times. I would love to hear from your perspective what free Wi-Fi on Mars was. And Nathan's here. Nathan's joined us. Yeah, that's a Nathan. Yeah, job. that's Nathan. Hi. Uh, it was uh, it was amazing. It was terrific. It was uh, the story jam trying to write a story live in front of a studio audience uh, while being heckled and periodically interrupted by um, having to answer questions that uh, were, um, I think, aimed to be exactly as exasperating as possible. Uh, it was uh, it was it was it was wonderful. It was terrific. I. I'd do it again. And and hopefully we'll have opportunities to do it again. So Free Wi-Fi on Mars was a project where the initial writing was funded by the Space Telescope Science Institute, and they paid for an initial run of comic books, all of which have been given away for free. Um, I then went and personally paid for the printing of another set of comic books, uh, they actually are from a different printing company because I did a short run. So the ones that are from Kablam are a slightly different printing company. Um, and A went and got a group of the, the comic books signed by Murr, Scott, Nathan, Christiana, the four authors involved. And we're going to hear these things cropping up periodically. Um, we're going to give away five of these to donators who uh, give, so this is a gift from uh, Empty Set Entertainment who orchestrated the signing of this. Um, we're mostly only thanks. donating postage. I think that you guys raised the, you know, they, they're still your books, so we're just yeah. donating postage. But yeah, we'll send, I think it's five sets we have to give away now. Yeah, um, and, and so we are going to continue our Fibonacci habits. Um, so, so if you donate uh, the, the Let's go with $5 on these because $5, that's 
that's half an hour of undergraduate life, and I know sometimes that's all someone has to give. And, and so let's go with $5 or higher for signed copies um, to the Fibonacci oh, series 112. If you're person one, you don't actually get two copies. Sorry. So 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. Until we're out, I can't do the Fibonacci in my head past 21. <laughs> um, so, so Nathan, you're another author who gets science into your fiction. Scott, you're an author who gets science into your fiction. I know as a scientist how expletive off I get when the science is so bad it takes me out of the story. Mm -hmm. As a fiction writer, what does this do to your brains? Well, um, it may. I honestly think it makes the process a great deal more difficult, time-consuming. Maybe time-consuming is the word for it. You're still doing... Still trying to create compelling characters that will pull someone through the story, and you're still trying to create believable characters, then get into conflict situations and drama, and that activate your you know your emotional core, and you start to slip away from thinking, oh, this is just a book, and these people at some point in your subconscious spring into reality, and you're genuinely worried about what happens to characters, or you find yourself rooting for one another, or you know having real hope that these characters will make it through these difficult situations. So all of that skill set is still there, but when you add in trying to make that happen within a real scientific construct, and it's not, uh, a, the thriller books have their own set of very complicated research that the authors have to do, you know, government, military, a lot of things. If you're going to make it believable and not pull soldiers out of the story or politicians out of the story or anybody who's done community service out of the story, there's rules you have to account for. Science is a similar set of problems, and it's a lot of work. And, you know, my chosen profession is telling stories, so I'm not, a professional scientist, and there's a bunch of stuff I know at the superficial level, but once you get past that and get into detail, you have to go get help. And that's what really makes the book process take longer for me, is coming up with my, uh, you know, layman level science knowledge and then coming up with a story, then turning it over to real scientists and saying, how close are we? Can we get away with this? And most often the answer is, no, you can't, and here's why. And then you have to try and fact. And so it it's... It, the really deep level stuff, like if you, you know, upper graduate level and professional level science knowledge, I think if scientists read something that's wrong, they see something is wrong there, they let that slide. Because a lot of scientists also love Doctor Who, and there's not a whole lot of hard science going on there. But it's the easy stuff, I think, that takes people out of a story. Yeah. If you get basic con science wrong, that all it takes is a Google search or someone, you know, with a, a BA in science to review your story who could correct that for you. I think that takes people off story because people work hard on science; they want to know other people are working hard on it too. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I think um, you can get a lot of mileage out of uh, big mistakes in in little tiny corners, but if you make a little mistake on something like where does the moon rise, uh, you've got a problem. Uh, because there are a lot of people who actually know when the moon is supposed to rise. So if it's a uh, you know if it's a full moon, it's uh, it's going to rise at at uh, at sunset and it's going to set um, at dawn. And it, you can't have a full moon um, at sunrise and have the moon directly overhead. Uh, so really basic ideas about uh, astronomical bodies uh, relating to uh, our own atmospheric area is is. Uh, is, is problematic. The, one of the things that I had to do for uh, my fantasy story was uh, do the orbital mechanics so that I would know when the um, when the seasons changed because I didn't want to have the same orbital mechanics as the Earth. So that if you read the stories, you you can you learn that this is not another Earth. This is not just some sort of other Earth. It's it's a completely different planet. And, and this is actually one of the things that really bothers me about J.R.R. Martin's stuff. And, and we did an entire segment on this last year and reached zero conclusion. We can't figure out how to create a world that has winter coming on this random weird cycle on top of the north. We were baffled by J.R.R. Martin's See, well, stuff. You, George R. R. Martin, 
So you yeah. were, you're, you're bothered by it. I think it is endlessly fun and hilarious. <laughs> but. I have a question. I have another yeah. question then, real quick. I'll, I'll go back and watch that if I can find that, but going back to one of my favorites, the Dragon Riders of Pern series, where, you know, there's a, an elliptical orbit for a planet that only crosses paths with uh, the planet where our heroes live every couple centuries, enough time for people to forget about what happened and have to suffer it all over again. Was that ever brought up? Why you guys know this stuff? Could another planet... What's that? No, no, Spoiler that's the basics of the story. I'm kidding. Could another, could another planet coming around screw with, you know, the, the normal orbit of the planet, like tweak it out of orbit a little bit or something, and then when that other planet goes away, it gets closer to the sun? Yeah, all of that stuff can happen. You you can change. So so one of um, a, a science fiction story I considered reading last night that that um, I absolutely love. It's Construction Paper Moon. It's it's a Creative Commons available story. Um, if you want to get, I think the PDF in a rational manner, you need to pay two dollars. But seriously, it's two dollars. Pay the author two dollars. Um, and it talks about uh, an incident that causes the Earth's moon to get torn away, and that's all I'm going to say. But it goes into a lot of the consequences of this. And it's just a very simple scientific idea of goodbye moon um, instead of good night moon. <laughs> it's much more traumatic. <laughs> and, and so you can do really bad things to our solar system, and humanity can survive. But it changes how we experience seasons, how we experience years. All of these different things change. So, so what's your favorite example of your reading along and one of your authors destroys science and it takes you out of the story? Oh, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to say, I guess. Most of the time, like I just finished a book by one of my favorite authors, and it I thought went on maybe 20% too long than it needed to, and it kind of dragged out at the end. So um, I just put up that I read it, and I unless I'm going to give a five star review, I don't give a review. Period. So because uh, these everybody works hard on their books, and they don't need another author bagging on them. But uh, there's one that goes way back, and this book came out before my whole career happened, and the author's never written another book. I've kept an eye out for it, so I didn't even think it was a real person. I think it was just a pen name, and somebody slapped something together and put it out, and it was called uh, Natural Selection, and the author's name, I think, was Dave Freeman, and it was really hard to read because the concept uh, in this book of Natural Selection is that the species evolves kind of in a matter of months. So it starts to develop, and like that's the whole pitch of the because like well evolution could create this species that could put mankind in jeopardy, and the whole thing happens in a matter of three months, and you're like, that's okay, that's not how it works. That's you know that's adaptation. You're not going to get yeah. all these massive changes, and that's not evolution. That's a completely different thing. So that kind of took me out of that book. And then the weird thing was, I never was able to figure out, but. The author's one of the author's devices to show the passage of time and the ascent of a major character was there was the ranking system for how important you were in your particular field of study. So at the beginning of the book, Dr. Pamela Gay is the twelfth ranked astronomer on the planet. And then two chapters later, she's the sixth ranked. And then two chapters later, she's the second ranked. And I'm like, I don't think it works that way. I don't think that there's a chart somewhere ranking who's the most important in their particular field at any given time. And it was great as a, a plot device to show you the ascent of the character. But those two things made it a really hard book to read. Just someone writing a biotech, a bio thriller, and not really having basic understanding of how some of this stuff worked. It was, I, I, re I finished it, but was t completely taken out of the story. I, I saw the trailer for the new Scarlett Johansson movie that is not Avengers 2, and it starts off with, uh, we only use 10% of our brains. And I was like, duh, you lost me. You lost yeah. me. Yeah. That is so not true. I want to see an awesome kick-butt Scarlett Johansson movie, but you lost me. <laughs> so. yeah. That was my latest, aw, take it out. 
But yeah, if you want to get scared by, uh, you, you managed to make evolution absolutely freaking terrifying an ancestor. So, yeah, thanks and, for the nightmares, jerk. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> ancestor. And if you're gonna write, if you're gonna write books with real science, they want, you know, it's it's a it's a creature feature. Ancestor is a classic creature feature. So let's take this tried and tested, very entertaining trope, and let's try and put some real science behind it. We were able to get around that with uh, this is a, I don't think it's a spoiler alert, but the you know digitizing a a gene which people have done. So take the we've analyzed the full genome. We have put it into a computer, and then you start to do some in silica evolution where we're doing evolution on a computer, and then combine that with some other technology to take that eventual genome that the computer says and actually print out, uh, you know, s sequence by sequence, print out DNA that it becomes a chromosome that could then be inserted into a donor egg, and you could possibly give birth to this thing, and then it gets to entertain you in the way the creature features entertain you. But, like, that was a way around it, and anybody who's got scientific knowledge is going to read this and go, yeah, this is fairly improbable, but it's plausible. Everything in this to get us from point A to point Z is actually real stuff. We're just not that good at all this stuff yet. But if you can create things where real science is the, the basis of the story, it really lets scientifically minded people dive all the way in. And I think... Um, that there's also the the especially Nathan and Scott together. If you if you're fans of both their work, you have the ability as an inherently if you're an inherently science-minded person or not, you have the ability to say, right, this looks and feels like what it's supposed to look and feel like. Yeah. So, for example, you know, if Nathan starts to put in, we're going to do this in silica, whatever, like, it doesn't make any sense. It's not part of the, the world of the characters and all that other stuff. And all of a sudden, you're like, yeah, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm pretty sure you're not doing it right. At the same time, if, you know, traversing the Atlantic Ocean takes a day, that also doesn't make so much sense. And you start to go like, I know what the world itself feels like to me, and that's not it. Um, so even when you're not writing about science, as long as you're writing in a realistic scientific, uh, in a realistically plausible way, anybody with a scientific mind can turn off, like like Noisy just said, can turn off the part of their mind that doesn't believe that winter is coming because it just came or whatever and be happy about that. Like one of my very favorite books in the world is a book called Forever. Um, the writer's name is Pete Hamill. It's preposterous. It's total fantasy set in New York City over 240 years and it's ludicrous. Like, and the science is non-existent. The science of, of, of this is, uh, spoiler alert, because it's called Forever, so hopefully not too much. Uh, it's one man's journey over 240 years on Manhattan Island. And obviously that's implausible. And the explanation for that is you will live as long as you never leave Manhattan Island. That's it. I know some people believe mm. that. Right, right, right. Shoop, nothing. Nothing else. There's no here's why. There's no this is what happened to you. There's just poof, now this is you. It's one of my favorite books. And normally that would that would give me pause, but I'm buying in because I understand, right. You're not yes. gonna try and sell me on that. You're gonna sell me on the architecture of the Manhattan Island. You're gonna show you know, the politics of Manhattan Island. You're gonna do all that and I'm gonna give you this one. So I think it's important both ways. If there is science and even if there's not. And, and this has been a really great segment, and I have to say, looking at the donations, we still have the, uh, we still have uh, copies of both free Wi-Fi on Mars and uh, books one and two of the GFL series available. We're going to spread that into the next segment. We're bringing on scientist Hannah Tackery. I probably mispronounced her last name because by don't. Not Tangare, apparently. No, not it's gin. not. <laughs> it's it's spelled like the gin, and that's not how it's pronounced. Um, we're bringing her on to talk about the importance of citizen science and the manic rate at which, at some point, we're going to be mapping an asteroid. Uh, so we're bringing her on as part of our asteroid afternoon. Um, keep donating, let me, uh, or actually keep mugging other people to donate. Those of you who are out there watching, I believe a lot of you have probably already donated. We have Thomas Traniker who's commenting, I believe that Pamela is tired. Yes, but that's okay. It's for science. 
uh, we, we have Salvin Westby, who's one of our longtime community members, saying, having fun too, Tatiana. Um, for beloved humans over the endeavor of science to galaxies and back. But all of you guys donate. I've already blown my budget, saved up since last fall for this wow. donation. Mm. That, that just, yeah. Hugs. Yeah, even Joe, who's like half asleep in the corner, just with hugs. Um, and 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 then uh, Guido, I'm right there with you. He writes, I must admit that I've not yet had the courage to check out the works of Scott Sigler. I'm a bit of a wimp when it comes to horror and similar stuff. I was in that position for years, and Scott had been so sweet about going, I understand, it's not for you. I, I judged some of the Tales of the Crypt for the Parsec Awards. Oh, so you went right for, like, the worst. <laughs> and, and I did it while watching a meteor shower, and I watched that. more of the meteor shower than I intended to that night. Oh, my God. Yeah, the Crypt is... Oh, there needs to be more Crypt, Scott. Scott! Oh, yeah. There well, needs we're, to be we're, more Crypt. We're working on that. Okay. The, the Crypt is... The Crypt is uh, trying to bring real science into, you know, what... I, I'm, I love Star Trek. I love Star Trek. But the whole concept of the Gene Roddenberry universe where we all basically just get along, maybe, maybe you can do that when everyone looks exactly like you do. You know, we find another spaceship from another culture, from another part of the galaxy, and wow! They're not only like us, they're kind of hot, and we can make out with them. You know, that's... That, that's that's one thing uh, that's going to make it pretty easy to integrate. But if you're fans of evolution and you know that the alien species will probably not look anything less, that's what the crypt gets into. And the harsh realities of meeting alien species when they are horrifying to us and we're horrifying to them, plus the fact that even on this planet where things look almost exactly like we do, we still kill the crap out of each other all the time. Yeah. So yeah. the crypt is really, really, really violent, and we'll get into more of that later, hopefully later this year or early next year, but that's another um, free podcast you can find by going to iTunes and searching for my name. People can listen in and check it out. But I have a question. I'm a little confused. How do they, people watching now, what do they have to do to get copies of The Rookie and the Starter again? They, they have they to, so to get copies of Rookie and the Starter... They have to donate $20 or more, and uh, we were looking to give them out to people who donated one, one, sorry, one, two, three, five, but we, we haven't even made it to, to that many numbers of donations because I think we, we, need, we need more junkies and less people who've been watching us for 36 hours and have already mm. like, given up all their money. So I'm going to actually mm -hmm. kick you guys out after one final piece of science and say, hey, go promote us to the junkies. Um, Michael Jobin leaves us with a thought I'm going to part you with. Um, hey, we only use 10% or 20 of the brain because atoms are elect are fluffy. <laughs> so the idea <laughs> okay, is... Okay, fine. 10% like volume. Fine. <laughs> atoms are mostly empty space, so by volume we are actually only using a very small percentage of our brain. And I, I love nobody that. likes nobody likes a science smartass, sir. By my, by I don't know. I, mean, so I kind of like a science smartass. I, I'm, I'm science I'm, smartasses. I like a science smart Alec. And, and, and so I love all of you who've already donated. Thank you. You can stop and go do science now. Share. Retweet. Mug retweet. other people. Share the no. link. And, and, and let's work on getting the junkies in here. Junkies, show us how much you love science. Um, challenge. Even though I am the luckiest junkie because I get to help Matt the Sigma first. Yay! Yep. <laughs> Get the um, so we're we'll also, gonna... I'll sign, I'll sign those. I'll draw little pictures in those too. So you know, whatever I got to do to gas this up a little bit. I think what you need to go do is use social media. So, so All the right. donation uh, link is on cosmoquest.org/lowercase hangoutathon. I know Nicole's been tweeting it while I've been talking. Um, All, the All the tweets. All the tweets. Um, and we now have the wonderful Hannah in here, whose hair is so much shorter than I'm used to. <laughs> Keep confusing me. I'm used to a long-haired Hannah. 
Um, Hannah is a graduate student at the University of Arizona, and she is working on asteroids of awesome. Can, can you tell us what you do, Hannah? Right, so like you said, I'm a grad student at the U of A, and uh, I work on the OSIRIS-REx asteroid sample return mission, which is going to go and study the asteroid Bennu and bring back a sample of it. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, one of the reasons that you and I have, have been talking, beyond the fact that you're just a fun person to talk with, <laughs> is you guys are going to be faced with a, oh my god, how do we map an asteroid that fast? Right. So, so for people who don't know about I OSIRIS Rex, can you give us a rundown on the mission and the challenge that you're facing? Sure, sure. So. We're going to be launching in September of 2016, and it's going to take us a while to get there. Probably, it's going to take us over a year to get there, but once we get there, one of the mission objectives is to make the most complete map of this asteroid that we possibly can, uh, using all of our scientific equipment that we've got on board, including visual images. And so, even though this asteroid is relatively small, it's about 500 meters in diameter, that is still a lot of surface to look at, um, especially because we're going to have very high resolution images. So there's just going to be a ton of data. And we're going to attempt to assimilate it in some type of way that people can study for years and years to come, right? Uh, so. So that's, uh, that's kind of one of the challenges, is making these maps. The other challenge is we have to figure out where we want to get the sample from. So that's the part that comes in of how that we have to do it quickly. So we need a really quick turnaround time for some of this stuff. We have no clue what the asteroid surface actually looks like. We have a little bit of an idea from some remote sensing that we've done. but And we're really hoping that it's real nice and smooth with these perfectly sized bits of regolith that can just get sucked right up into our collection bin. Uh, but if, if it's not, we're going to have to really analyze the surface to find the ideal spot to land. Or, to sorry, not to land, to take our sample. Uh, and we're going to have to do that quickly. So that's another challenge uh, with the mission. So. So, so we may actually, we just found out, keep you on longer to talk more science if you're available because the group that was coming on next is having tech fail. Alternatively, sure. we may do more arts and crafts with Tiny Intern. Um, so so one, one of the things that you bring up is the, the difficulties of, of mapping surfaces and not knowing ahead of time what they're going to look like. This is one of the things that we dealt with with Vesta. Um, we, we knew from the surface of planet Earth that, that Vesta was, was lumpy. We were pretty sure it had a giant crater in its bum because literally the South Pole region of it just, it kind of, we had hints that there was a giant crater there. And yes, it does have a giant crater in its South Pole bum, basically. Um, and it was only when we got to Vesta with the Dawn mission that we realized not only does it have a crater in its bum, but it was hit so hard in the past that it squished it in and created a wrinkle ridges around its waistline and yeah. actually distorted some of the craters in the process. And I'm breaking the coal right now. <laughs> 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 and and as we've been looking at, at Vesta, we're discovering bouldering activity that we didn't even know made sense because you'd think that when you hit an asteroid, the boulders would fly away. No, not necessarily. There's all this cool stuff that we didn't understand. And Vesta's pretty big. Its physics is pretty normal. Bennu is a whole lot smaller. Can you tell us a little bit about this asteroid that OSIRIS-REx is going to? By the way, coolest name mission ever. <laughs> I know you're not responsible, but I'm highly jealous you get to say you work for OSIRIS-REx. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally, and you guys should go on the website and see the t-shirts we have now, because it's actually like a T-Rex, like eating an asteroid. It's really, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so much jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, but, yeah, so Bennu, Bennu is... Like I said, it's pretty small, 500 meters diameter. It's roughly spherical, and uh, it's a carbonaceous asteroid. It's actually 
a very, very dark asteroid. It has a very low albedo, so only about 4% of the light that hits it is reflected off of it. It's basically like a giant piece of charcoal, which is another challenge that we're going to face in actually imaging it, although our cameras are going to be made to image a very dark object like that. So we're not too worried, but uh, it's like I said, it's carbonaceous, so this means that it has a ton of carbon, it has a ton of organic uh, minerals in it, and that's one of the reasons why that makes it so compelling to go visit, that it has these organic compounds. It's compelling as, uh, as studying the origins of life, it's compelling for uh, possible mineral resources. I can tell something exciting is happening. <laughs> We're going to share this with everybody. So, oh, this yeah. is I have the, the t-shirt that that has been designed <laughs> for the Osiris Rex. I'm going to like have to find someone on the Osiris mess Rex mission and beg. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, person on the Osiris Rex team. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going to get a t-shirt. Um, so, so as we we so so we have a it's basically a giant chunk of something that's not coal because it's not organics and coal comes from dead dinosaurs right, right. T Rex dead um, right. that's the source of coal but this is a similar sort of I'm just going to absorb all the light hitting me kind exactly. of exactly yes and that's going to be a pain in the proverbial things I shouldn't say on air um, to try and find craters on because craters, one of the awesome ways that we find them is we look at them when the sun is at a nice angle to the surface creating beautiful shadows. Um, the shadows aren't going to be all that different from the, the surface color it sounds like. That is true. I mean you can do a lot of things in post-processing with these images to increase the contrast and I imagine that we will probably need to do some of those things. Also, our cameras are designed to collect a lot of light. In fact, um, if we were to image something that was much brighter, like if we were to try and image the Earth with them, that would be bad news because um, our cameras are designed to image really dark things. So I'm not exactly sure what these images will look like, but uh, they'll probably look decent. And also, another thing is from what we know from imaging asteroids like Itakawa, which is also a very small body, Itakawa really doesn't have that many craters to speak of, at least not the ones like we're used to seeing like on the moon or Vesta or something like that. Um, it mostly has a bunch of boulders, so that's kind of another thing that we're probably going to be looking at with Bennu, but we're not really sure yet. And, and the bouldering, I this is something that the folks are still trying to figure out and the problem with boulders is what you'd expect is you have a nice friendly little tiny baby asteroid uh, something that hasn't made itself round because it's gravitationally large enough to go into hydrostatic equilibrium that's a phrase I just love saying uh, <laughs> I don't think there's enough Scrabble letters to use it but uh, <laughs> round things are round because they have so much gravity that they flatten things that try to be too tall and, and so when we're looking at these small things that are too small to make themselves round, um, you'd expect that they also don't have enough gravity that when you hit them hard enough to break them apart to keep those chunks. Mm -hmm. You'd expect any boulders that are created during these impact events to fly away. And, and so there's teams that have been trying to figure out how to produce boulders. And one of the interesting theories that I saw presented at the Euro European Planetary Sciences Conference two years ago is, is there is a team, and I believe it was a Russian team, that was basically taking boulders and heating them up and cooling them off and heating yes. them up and cooling them off. Yes. And, and go ahead, tell us about the, this experiment. I love what you guys do to rocks. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of cool experimental work that can be done with this. Um, so yeah, so this is called thermal fracturing is one name for it. It's one theory of how we can get actually regolith on the surfaces of these tiny bodies and so as these guys orbit they are heating up and cooling off and you can actually reproduce this in the lab um, kind of what happens to you know your sidewalks as the seasons change if you live in a climate where your seasons change drastically they'll kind of freeze get really cold uh, in the winter 
and then in the summer when they heat back up, and then over years and years time, you'll see cracks starting to form in these previously coherent sidewalks, right? So it's kind of the same thing with the boulders on the, on the surfaces of these asteroids. They can fracture, they can form this regolith layer. That is one theory, and that is one thing that people are studying right now. And, and we don't know. And this is where it starts to get so interesting to be able to go out and grab ourselves, grab yourselves, a chunk of asteroid to bring back. Because there may be evidence in just how the regolith was formed that starts to get us hints of some of this past history. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know. We, we don't actually know uh, what we're going to find until we bring it back to the lab. Right. Now, now, one of the things that we end up answering a lot on CosmoQuest is why the heck can't we just use computers to find craters? Why is it that your team is so stressed out about <laughs> figuring out how to do sample return? Right. So there are many automated feature detection algorithms. And people might be familiar with these if you're on Facebook at all. You can tell when you upload a picture Sometimes it pops up and it says, would you like to tag this person in this photo? It's actually really creepy because it knows exactly who that person is. So that's an example of an automated feature detection algorithm. Where yeah, Scott Natalie Portman was me and I was so pleased. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I get suggested in my mom's photos to tag myself a lot. So yeah, so th so so that's an example of an algorithm which, as we both just pointed out, sometimes fails. It's, they've gotten these facial detection ones really good because most people's faces look pretty similar. You know, you got two eyes and a nose and a mouth, right? But some of but it's there becomes to be a lot of complications when you're looking at different surfaces. So now we know like craters are mostly round, right? Uh, but sometimes they're not. <laughs> and and a lot of times you have very different lighting conditions. So we do have these automated algorithms to try and look at images and pick out, okay, here's a crater, here's a crater, here's a crater. However, they fail a lot of the time. <laughs> and uh, so that's when uh, human beings come become very important, right? So it's it turns out that the human eye, as you guys know, can pick out shapes and features a lot better than a computer can. And, uh, and that's just, our brain can just interpret it very, very well. So it becomes a, solving the automa automated feature detection problem is an extremely difficult thing to do if we were to create an algorithm which could flawlessly detect craters all the time. You've basically created an artificial intelligence. You've created data, and <laughs> you know, and that's a long way off. So. And and the thing that makes this so hard for what you're doing is we can't even solve this problem for the moon. Right. Uh, on the moon, depending on the algorithm and where it's applied, you can get 70 to 80 percent accuracy, and that high end, these best algorithms are ones that have been trained by human beings on one type of soil, so all the light stuff, for instance, all of the regolith, um, have been trained on the light stuff, are consistently being shown the exact same lighting conditions, and you control the data that you give the algorithm to make sure the algorithm gives you back good data. But the reality is not all soil is the exact same color. We can see this from the surface of the planet when we look at the moon where we see the mare which is black and the regolith which is white and there's all the colors in between when you start looking at things up close. Um, as, as Joe pointed out earlier, um, when we first got vested data, one of the phrases that I think all of us used at one point or another is we sort of did the hold your laptop out and go, Vesta, you are drunk. <laughs> yeah. It's a lumpy surface. Yeah. And depending on the sun angle, you can get shadows going in all sorts of crazy directions because you're looking at craters on hills and it, it best of you are drunk. And and you can't program an algorithm to deal with a drunken surface. Right. So yeah. what's the current plan for Osiris Rex? Uh well we're still quite a ways off for when we start getting our data down. Um, but the current plan is I sit there and I count boulders. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> um, okay. That's not entirely true, right? But I have been working a lot with previous data sets like that, um, like what we've got for Itakawa. Um, and we've been, we've been looking into options of get just getting an army of undergraduates <laughs> or something similar like that. Now, I mean, when we do come down to sample site selection, it'll probably be, you know, a committee of people that are pouring over that data for days, you know, making sure, doing that manually, you know. The, the uh, bigger concern is for our long-term science goals. Uh, for, you know, for the very the very quick things, we probably will just have a ton of people sitting there manually going through data. But like I said, this mission has very ambitious long-term science goals of mapping this asteroid. And those plans are not entirely fleshed out yet, although we have we do have some ideas. And, and this is one of those things where mission science gets very tricky. And there's a whole lot of who has what intellectual property. And people have been looking working on this for decades. And who's allowed to say what. And, and we here at CosmoQuest have been basically sniffing noses with a variety of people from OSIRIS-REx for several years, trying to figure out how we can help one another, how we can partner. And because things like this, there are lifetimes of work tied up in the spacecraft. Um, so we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we are saying that we at CosmoQuest are here to help. And this is why Hannah and I talk on a regular basis, is we're trying to figure out how do we effectively get software into the hands of the students, the professionals, and whomever else gets sucked in to deal with this long-term data. And we are testing the waters with, with the da data that we have on Vesta, so go map Vesta. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in the next hour, I think one of the things that we're, we're going to do is we, we were originally planning to have one of our good collaborators who does Family Science Night up at Rochester Institute of Technology come in, but he's so busy as, as a professor with students and minions and things and stuff that, that he couldn't tear himself away um, to, to come on to our hangout and had to last minute cancel, which makes us sad. But we're, I think, going to, if I can talk to Nicole, who's madly typing into it, we're going to combine live crater marking um, and me reading one of my favorite science fiction stories, which is about when the Earth loses the moon. Uh, so marking craters on the moon and then reading a science fiction story about what would happen if we lost the moon. Um, on the donations front, we have up for grabs. If you donate between now and 5 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Pacific, um, we have several uh, uh, copies of the first two books in the Galactic Football League. Uh, you must have a minimum donation of $20 to qualify for that because there's no free lunch. And uh, we have several issues of free Wi-Fi on Mars that's a minimum donation of $5. And those things are thank you gifts being sent from you, not to you, not from me, but from the folks at Empty Set Media. The folks at Empty Set Media would like to say thank you. Uh, for people to take the time out to, to help make science possible. So, so Empty Set Media is one of our, our favorite supporters, friends. I occasionally get very drunk while discussing funding issues, group of people to be with. Um, <laughs> Nicole is dying of laughter over in the corner. Oh. Um, so, so, so Hannah, you're a first year graduate student at this point, and yes. you're what? She's a baby! <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and you attend an Eastern Illinois State Univers Eastern Illinois University here in the same state that we're in. You're one of our sister campuses alumni. Yes. And um, uh, so now you, you've gone from Eastern Illinois uh, down to the University of Arizona, um, showing that that anyone who works hard enough can can accomplish your dreams. You were at a university that rejected my butt. Um, that was my first choice of university to go to. And now you're working on a NASA mission. Um, <laughs> what's this wild ride been like? Because we've known each other since before you got in. And it's just been a giddy thing for me to get to watch you go through. Aww. <laughs> well, yeah. So it's been incredibly insane. Like, yeah, some days I just like, sit back and I'm like, I don't really know 
what's going on? Like how like how am I actually here? <laughs> like that may never go away. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, I guess. Go with it. <laughs> it kind of yeah, like when I started studying physics, I feel like I ran at it so hard. It's like when you're running down a hill and you can't stop when you get to the bottom and it's like now I've just started to slow down and it's like, "Oh, how did I get here? <laughs> That's kind of how it feels. <laughs> but, yeah. It's so been, it's, Michael it's been Dobin crazy. is making the comment, Hannah is a data monster. And I, I think that's completely legit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you work with asteroids, you kind of become a data monster. Because I don't know if you guys know, but there's a lot of asteroids. Oh my gosh, yes, but there's a lot of asteroids, but they don't have the density of Han Solo's asteroid belt, so there's this weird Correct. dichotomy going on. But yes, there are a lot of asteroids. Continue your sentence, sorry. Yes, and now that you mention Han Solo's asteroid belt, I'd really like to put in a plug for some really cool quick-draw science videos that we've been producing out of the University of Arizona called 321 Science, and they're very cool, and um, we do one that we always have geeky sci-fi references in them, so that's what brought it to mind. But they're really fun, and you should totally go watch them. They're fun for the whole family, and my hand is in some of them. So, <laughs> yeah, totally go. <laughs> okay, why is only your hand in some well, of them? So what happens is they just film us drawing on a whiteboard. And okay. so if you've ever watched Minute Physics or something yeah. where they kind of do it and they erase, okay, so that's that's kind of, that's that's what it is. Yeah, okay. so I tell people my hand is famous on the internet and it's not what it sounds like. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, moving back to what we were talking about before, I don't even remember. Uh, you're a data monster, and there's lots of asteroids, more asteroids than, more peop than most people think. Yes, there's a ton of data out there, and most of it is, has not been analyzed yet. <laughs> um, I mean, most of it has been seen, but not necessarily analyzed, because we have these huge surveys who have data on tons and tons of asteroids, and it's just sitting there waiting for people to do cool stuff with it. So. And... and what, what's really funny is um, when I go to the Lunar and Planetary Sciences Conference, the, the first time I went, I went as a baby journalist working for Astronomy Magazine back in 2003, and at that point it was still um, held down in Clear Lake near uh, uh, NASA down in Houston, and the, the hotel that it was in at that point had a bunch of conference rooms in the main hotel, and there was a second building that was generally used for wedding receptions. But for this particular conference, that's where they banished the asteroid people. Oh, <laughs> and, and I was completely new to planetary science. And I had several senior journalists pull me aside and basically say the moral equivalent of, sweetie, don't go in there. <laughs> because you, I, I did win it, go in there because I'm the type of person that when you tell me there's scientists in there and I shouldn't go listen to them because they're not interesting, I, I go listen and I went in and there were people having deep intellectual conversations about cross sections of meteorites that had been collected here, there, and everywhere and comparing the spectra of these meteorites to the spectra of different types of asteroids. And it was this amazing discussion that I wanted to read rather than listen to. <laughs> right, right. Yep, that, that is basically asteroids. I've, somebody that I work with says that with asteroids, we're kind of still in the stamp collecting phase, meaning that, you know, we're, <laughs> we're trying to get data on as many of these guys as we can, right? Because, you know, you, you want to make cross correlations and you need... You can't make cross correlations with ten objects, right? It means nothing statistically. So we're in this we're doing this huge amount of statistical analysis is kind of where we're sitting right now. But it to me it's really the very most interesting thing because these asteroids, these bodies, are basically telling us what the solar system was like when it was forming. And that's what I'm really interested in. So Okay, so I have to share this because this will make you giggle the same way it made me giggle. Uh, Phoenix says, Hi, Hannah! Phoenix! <laughs> Yay! 
<laughs> Felix is uh, the, the gentleman who ran our green room yesterday along with Roxandra and is uh, one of the fellow survivors of the cruise to not end the world where several of us almost died on a Mexican ferry boat. Oh my God. <laughs> Best boat ride ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It made me feel so alive. <laughs> December 20th of last year, the group of us went to Coba, and Fraser Kane abandoned my ass and didn't <laughs> go with us to the ruins. And so the whole group of us, uh, astronomy cast related people, went to the ruins together, and we had a fabulous time. And then when we caught the ferry to go from, from the Yucatan Peninsula back to, to where our cruise ship was docked on, off the island of Cozumel. Um, let's just say the seas were rough, a few people <laughs> had to get IV fluids. We didn't die, but I don't know how no one got hurt, injured, killed in the process right. of getting, yeah. Right, it was one of those things where it's like, I don't know that this would ever happen in the States, you know, like basically, oh man, like, because us trying to get back on the ship when it's literally rocking, like, you know, five feet both ways. And <laughs> it was getting crashed into the dock we were on yeah. so hard. It was snapping ropes. And yeah. I, I kid you not, they had one of the Mexican ferry boat workers watching the waves, two of them holding the, the not-attached gang yeah. plank and yelling, Andale, 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 stop! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when they yelled stop, the boat would come crashing and the gangplank would get flipped and I yeah. don't know how none of us died. I know. Yeah, and I and I saw you guys up on the second deck because you guys had gone, or no, some other people had gone first and they were like cheering people on as we came onto the ship. It's like, was a huge accomplishment. Like, yeah, you yeah. Now you didn't die. <laughs> so, so... <laughs> Uh, uh, Victoria and Eric were up there cheering people on. Phoenix yeah. and I decided to be the last two of our group onto the boat. They were the first two onto the boat so that we keep make sure our whole group didn't die or right. all died together. That right. was the two options I decided <laughs> upon. Um, yeah. Didn't die. <laughs> but it was all in the name of science. Um, so, so this is this is the story of how all of us got to know each other, and we are truly building a community. Because what I love is that was the first time I met Phoenix, the first time I met you, and I'd seen all of you guys on social media at one point or another, and then from there, you and I uh, were at the Midwest Regional Women in Physics Conference last year, and we got to catch up. and I've seen Phoenix a few times, and now here we are together on this hangout. And this is what I love about working with CosmoQuest is we, we are a community of people that clearly like each other. Uh, <laughs> and, and so we find ways to build community, increase our understanding of the, the solar system and the universe beyond. We laugh, we giggle, we try not to die in Mexican ferry boats. And yeah. I'm, I'm running out of words at this point, other than, than um, tell us more about your asteroid that you're going to be study at studying. And we have a hello in the comment thread. Uh, Silva Westby says, uh, greetings to the Osiris-Rex team and to Michael Puzio, who named asteroid Bennu. Uh, can you actually tell us a little bit about the naming of this happy little asteroid? Sure. So it was named by this little boy, and they had a contest. I guess it was probably last year. The name had originally been 1999 RQ36, and they wanted a cooler name than that. So um, Osiris Rex is act Osiris is actually an Egyptian god, and I cannot completely remember which what god it is at this point, but. The reason why the name Banu is so cool is because it is also um, an a, a reference to Egyptian mythology. Banu, I believe, is some type of bird, so it's very uh, it's very appropriate because our spacecraft Banu will be flying to, or our spacecraft will be flying to uh, intersect this asteroid, and so 
so that's kind of how it worked. I think they had this competition last year and they got tons and tons of names and kids wrote essays and they kind of went through which one was the best and, and this guy uh, won the won the contest. So so we thought that was pretty cool. And and I, I just looked up the, the Greek god uh, Greek deity relationships and Venu is the ancient Egyptian deity linked to the sun, creation, and rebirth, which is the opposite of Osiris, which is the god linked with the um, afterlife. Right. So we have death visiting <laughs> life, and there's something kind of awesome about that. Yeah, that is very cool. And then we've got Rex, of course, which was added a little bit later, uh, which the, the R-E-X in the name stands for Regolith Explorer. So that's the part um, where we actually are going to get the sample. So, And it also, of course, means king. So, yes. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. <laughs> so, so we have the king of the afterlife going to visit uh, the, the life force of Bennu. Right. <laughs> so so uh, what an amazing story to walk in to graduate school and get sucked into a multi-year project to yeah. uh, explore all the awesome. Now, I personally had the misfortune when I was a graduate student to be waiting for data from an X-ray satellite that decided to explode on launch. Ooh. Yeah. And, and, and this is why I have said several times that all spacecraft are dead to me until they safely <laughs> return first light data. Right. How how do you deal with the stress of working on a mission that hasn't yet set back data? Right. Well, so the timeline is such that unless I was going to be in graduate school for 15 years, <laughs> uh, it's probably unrealistic for me to really count on using this mission for my thesis work. And it's probably also a bad idea <laughs> <because> <laughs> to base your thesis on something which can you know, explode. So, um, or impact incorrectly. Right. Exactly. There's, there's, yeah. So, so really, probably my PhD will focus on something that is very related. I mean, I'm very interested in asteroids and things, and you know, primitive bodies in general. Um, but it's, it's not really going to be directly related to the mission. So, yeah. <laughs> So, so you just used a phrase that, that gets thrown around in the planetary world a lot that I hadn't heard until I started going to planetary conferences. You just called it a primitive body. That sounds like rather insulting. <laughs> uh, what is the difference between a sophisticated body and a primitive body in the solar system? Right. So a primitive body. So whenever the solar system was forming, according to the accretion model of, of solar system formation, you have little things which accrete onto each other in this cloud, this disk of gas, that form larger and larger bodies. And some of them get so big that they get, they turn into planets. That's a very simplified explanation. But so what, so we think that the asteroid belt is <clears throat> the remnants of those things which did not turn into planets, but stay, but are representative of those, that cloud that formed our solar system. So when we say primitive bodies, we basically mean the word primitive is referring to things which have not had a lot of stuff done to them. So they haven't been processed as much as, like, say, the Earth has. A lot of crap has happened to the Earth since it formed, right? And the other terrestrial planets as well. But we think that these primitive bodies in the asteroid belt have not seen very much action, so to speak. So if, we're, if we can study them, then we can maybe figure out how, what the conditions were in that early solar nebula. So that's kind of what we mean by primitive bodies. And what, what I find interesting, uh, one of the things I've now had like explained to me four or five different times, and I still don't totally understand it, is the process of differentiation within planets. Mm -hmm. One of the things that deeply bothers me, and I'm starting to slowly understand the geology of it, is the Earth has veins of silver. It has areas of the planet rich in uranium, areas of the planet devoid of uranium. South Africa seems to be where all the cool minerals went to live. Um, yeah. 
we have all sorts of different mineralogy and my brain is like but 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 but, but it all came out of like a nebula of stuff that just sort of accreted together why do we have veins of silver why isn't it just all evenly mixed together and and the kind of cool thing is all of the things that perplex me about how the chemistry and hydrology and plate tectonics of the earth have like carried things around and left them in isolated groups with with asteroids that's not a problem you actually end up with things that are fairly well mixed or I guess the other way to put it is fairly undifferentiated mm. and it's as, it's as you start to get to the larger bar bodies like Vesta and Ceres that we start to get the differentiation right. um, go ahead no um, so so What's cool to me is finding out that things like Vesta were starting to get differentiation. It's still not a round body, it's still lumpy, but it's big enough that we start to see the, these geophysical processes that are carrying this stuff around and creating cool layers. But as we look at Bennu, it's still small enough that when you grab a chunk of it, you're grabbing probably a representative chunk of it. Right. Yeah, we, we hope so. Yeah, it's and that's actually a good point that you bring up, grabbing the representative chunk, uh, because we have we have questions of how are we going to figure out what, where to grab on the asteroid? Like, you know, say that the whole thing has perfectly sized regolith for us to ingest, and that so that would be like the perfect science case, right? We don't have to worry about safety, now we can focus on where's the coolest scientific spot to look at. Well, what if we see there's one spot that's spectrally different than all the other spots? Do we go for the, the part of it that's most representative, or do we go to the spectrally weird spot, right? So and you only get one chance. Right, right. So it's, it's kind of something that, you know, with these missions that you have to... So that's why we need lots more missions. We want to go to as many of these as we can, right? So Exactly. And, and the budget for CosmoQuest will never be enough to launch a spacecraft <laughs> an asteroid. Hey, you guys don't know that. Well, that's true. That's true. That's being <laughs> pessimistic. Hey, I'm just currently both mutually sad and happy in different parts of my brain. The parts of my brain that worries about paying my staff it's very sad that I'm not in jeopardy of having to dye my hair blonde oh, because maybe man. it's a 50,000 mark. <laughs> but the part of me that likes my hair is, is <laughs> glad that we're, we're hovering at the halfway point to 50,000. Oh man, hair grows. Come on, somebody somebody put down that 25 grand. We really want to <laughs> see this happen. <laughs> so so to look at the comments um, and so that we can see why Nicole is giggling and maybe she can explain this comment to me because it makes no sense to me. <laughs> uh, so first of all, we have one that does make sense. Phoenix writes, plus 11 for that, Pamela. We are definitely a close-knit group, yes. We are building a community of win and... I'm, I'm so deeply grateful for all the friends that I have made um, in the name of science who are my friends beyond just discussing science. I also have to share the fact that Tiny Intern just came in, looked at her nest of, of, of beanbag in the corner, found Joe asleep in it, and just sort of turned around and sat cross-legged <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> It was the saddest look. It was truly <laughs> awesome. And we, we are all laughing so hard at Joe, his eyes opened back up. Um, can you explain Paul Fern's comment? Uh, well, I think it was just referring to the fact that, I don't know about the first one, this is this time last year, I found you when I came back from the loo, which Nicole did mention on air. I probably, this is probably something I would do. Uh, and when, and he was just pointing out that I just disappeared and came back and correctly, and correctly deduced that I have been to the bathroom. So that's just why I'm taking this kind of bathroom humor. <laughs> anyway, you'd just like to say well done for the last few hours and last year, Brill. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> and our donations are currently sitting at, um, I'm going to tweet the next. <laughs> Our donations are currently sitting at 21,593 and we still have things to give away from Empty Set Entertainment and this isn't me giving them away, this is A. Kovacs and Scott Sobler saying thank you to the people who take the time out to donate during the last hour and this hour. They have copies of the GFL, books one and two, the Galactic Football League, 
as well as copies of Free Wi-Fi on Mars, which is a graphical uh, anthology that we got to work with them and uh, Mer Lafferty and Nathan Wall and uh, Christiana Ellis on. Um, so if you donate, or if you make someone you love donate so that you can hit them up for one of these things, that works too. Um, you have the potential to get that thank you straight from Empty Set Entertainment, who is one of our dear benefactors. Speaking of things that are dear, I have a horse whose name is Ben. And uh, uh, Guido uh, notes, every time I hear Bennu, I think of Pamela's horse. Maybe Ben and Bennu are co cosmically related. Um, my, my horse is occasionally afraid of sunbeams. Um, I, I can't imagine him surviving orbit very well. Probably not. No. no not <laughs> and the whole vacuum of space might be problematic. Yeah. That's why we need spacesuits for horses, right? <laughs> so, so, so my horse is one who he can do pretty much anything to, and he's cool with it. We painted him last year for Halloween. Tiny intern and I had a moment of we're going to celebrate Day of the Dead by painting my horse. Sweet. Me and there are pictures of this on Google Plus, and it was fabulous. And I rode my horse in a really long steampunk skirt and corset, and it was cool and wind. Nice. My horse is cool about these things, and and Joe uh, actually made a chainmail bonnet for my horse, and <laughs> it's probably going to get grown and grown and expanded upon because chainmail on my horse. Um, my, my friend Dee's horse, Maggie, less calm. The mere act of trying to put a piece of chain mail on her forehead around her ears caused horse explosion. <laughs> um, so, so the idea of putting a horse into a spacesuit, something tells me that when we start taking mammals to space, it's more likely to be something like a goat that's very chill and capable of eating anything and producing milk and other such useful things, and not so likely to be a horse. You're you know, probably so right. On Mars. Oh yeah, one of the, the uh, Dina's show name is Footsteps on Mars. Oh, that's Dina's the, the, okay. the horse that I jump, because my horse likes to jump things with two to three foot clearance, even when they're only six foot tall. <laughs> the horse that I do jump, uh, her show name is Footsteps on Mars. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, okay, I'm now blathering, and you work for a super cool mission that I'd like to hear more <laughs> about. Oh, actually, Kyle came up. Do you remember Hannah, Kyle? Hi, and Kyle. he's not about to come on camera to say hi, but he's shaking yeah. his head. And it's beautiful. <laughs> I would be friendly, except it would require me to come on camera, so I'm going to loom. My husband's six foot four. He looms very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. As, as you're working to, to figure out all of the challenges and as we get to play together on these different things, um, what is the biggest surprise that you've hit as a first year graduate student getting to play on a NASA mission? Well, um, I think that when I came into it, I thought I was kind of thinking, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I was kind of thinking, oh, this is NASA, like, you know, everybody's got everything figured out, like, they've got all these plans, you know, they've got all these huge documents, and, like, everybody knows exactly what they're doing, right? And, like, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, floating around, I don't know what's going on. And, but when I started, start to actually talk to people, it's like, and I would ask questions, they'd be like, you know, we don't really know that. <laughs> and, like, so, which is cool. I mean, it's part of the, the scientific test, but yeah, it's actually it's with a mission that's in its early stages like this. There's still a lot of stuff to figure out, and and you know the the people who are higher up that you really look up to, like they don't always <laughs> have everything figured out, right? So it's it's just this ongoing process of continual, continually iterating, continually revising everything, and. It's just this team of people that's really just figuring out all this stuff as we go, right? I mean, nobody's ever done anything like this before, so <laughs> it's it's really exciting. And and this is one of the things that, that I love about what we do with CosmoQuest is we get to walk up to scientists like you and say, hey, 
let's brainstorm solutions for new and creative things because a lot of times, I kid you not, when, when they start working on these missions, there's certain assumptions of this will have been figured out by the time we hit our launch window or this will have been figured out by the time our spacecraft gets to location X. Um, my favorite example of this is watching the New Horizons team trying to discover the targets or targets that they can send their mission to after it gets to Pluto. Right. And when they launched New Horizons, heck, Pluto was still a planet at that point. <laughs> right. And, and over the past several years, as they've been getting closer and closer to target, um, first of all, they hit the major uh, wordless stare of discovering that Pluto is surrounded by moons and may actually have basically a ring, ringlet of icy bodies. That's a bit disturbing when you, you have a spacecraft that's going to be flying essentially through that collection of bodies. Right. And then the second issue is they, they have enough fuel on board to redirect their spacecraft to at least one and possibly two other bodies if they're located in the right place. Mm -hmm. And so I've had the privilege of getting to watch this team desperately trying to find those bodies and they're running out of time uh, to get sufficient orbital mechanic solutions on things to be able to redirect the spacecraft. It was just kind of assumed there'd be something at the correct orbit. Um, we hadn't discovered that many Kuiper Belt objects when they launched and it turns out they're harder to find and telescopes break and clouds happen and um, so so yeah it's it's science by the seat of your pants and yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not an easy solved complete problem right yeah New Horizons I'm really excited about that one <laughs> which I guess it'll be getting there next year and I'm just so excited to see what Pluto looks like finally I can remember you know like whenever you're in elementary school and you are looking at the pictures of all the planets you know and then you get to Pluto and I'm just like what is that like <laughs> That's not, that's like a, a blob. I don't even, so, you know, and I asked my parents, like, what does it actually look like? And they're like, well, that's the best that we have. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're young enough that you got the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah. Uh, surface map of its splotchiness. Right. It's right. a 16 pixel across Pluto. Right. When, when I was in school, Pluto was a slightly large star. <laughs> and, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is why I'm kind of okay with its demotion. And what what I also really love is, so we, we, we work with the Dawn mission, and if all goes well, and if, if budgets remain healthy, we should be able to work with um, series data coming from the Dawn mission in a new Asteroid Mappers series edition in the coming years. Series is another object that was demoted. When it was first found, it was thought that it was a planet. And then it was discovered, oh, wait, uh, Ceres has friends. And um, the friends are also fairly large. It's the largest of them. And it's actually big enough that it is round. Um, but Ceres and Pluto are the only two objects in our solar system that have not yet been visited by a spacecraft and our objects that have once upon a time been called a planet. And Dawn gets to Ceres next year, and New Horizons gets to Pluto. And at that point, we will have visited every object in our solar system anyone ever accused of being a planet <laughs> in a textbook given to elementary school kids. Right, yeah. That's pretty awesome, yes. <laughs> and and it's it's been absolutely great having you on. And I, I know that at one point last week we were talking about when we talk about collaborating more and looking at the image problems and pitting computers against citizen scientists and all of these things that I'm hoping that we can do and your donations help us do. Um, we want to figure out how to start solving some of these imaging problems as some of the science that we work on with CosmoQuest. And so when you contribute, you contribute to us getting to play more with data. And um, I sent Hannah an email last week that basically uh, was would like to talk science, but can't, must do hangout-a-thon, talk to you after hangout-a-thon, after I wake up. Um, and so I'm looking forward to having a coherent conversation with you Yay. about science next yes. week, because science can do it. Yes.
Oh, you have a dinosaur on your shirt. You already have a dinosaur shirt. Cool. Yeah, so so this oh is, I, I'm going to get closer to the camera. This, this shirt came from Cafe Press. I'm pretty sure that it's a pirated image. I don't know what <laughs> copyright rules I'm breaking. I love this particular shirt. I'm a little bit too close. Okay. <laughs> I love this particular shirt because T-Rexes have little tiny arms that they can't really do anything with. And with science, you can give a T-Rex awesome mechanical arms capable of doing absolutely anything. So science can do it, including making T-Rex has powerful arms. Yes. Awesome take-home message right there. Yes. Science can do it, and can do. since it was an asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, astronomy wins when it comes to science. <laughs> yeah. Totally. So, <laughs> I'm going to leave you uh, to go science, because I know as a graduate student, the lot in life you're faced with is too much work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm deeply grateful for this hour that you took out of your life, because uh, I know that's hard to do sometimes. Well, um, thank you guys for having me on. It was really fun. <laughs> it's, it's, we, we, heart, thank you, Hannah, so much <laughs> for coming on. Um, let's keep playing together and Create yes. science. Yes. So, so thank you. Um, so, so Nicole, you looked about to say something. No, just smiling. I'm making, I'm making secret things happen that we will reveal later. <laughs> I'm suddenly quite afraid. No, you know what it is. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll see you guys later. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank Thank you. Bye. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> See, nothing scary. Okay. <laughs> so thank you, Hannah. It's been great having you on, and I look forward to having a coherent conversation with you about looking at all of the imagery problems of, of doing crater science and programming computers, and we shall overcome. Awesome. Sounds okay. good. <laughs> Talk to you later, Anna. Bye. Um, you don't have to come on camera, but can you explain the awesomeness you've been creating in the corner? Yeah, she's been in the corner. No, that has to be on camera. Oh, but you she don't doesn't have to be, have to be on that camera. That has to be on I camera. I got bored and found poster paints in the corner by your desk. She got bored and did this. <laughs> How? I cannot even look at the pretties. <laughs> anyway. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, it's so tiny intern. Um, we have uh, Bill um, uh, Bill Hunsaker is saying it was wonderful to meet Hannah. Hannah is indeed a wonderful person that we need more of, um, but she needs to focus on science because she's a graduate student and that's responsible. Um, so then we have a person whose name I'm going to let Nicole pronounce. Falconio. Falconio. he has been here like the whole time. I know, but last time I said his name, you mocked me. Okay, so so we have uh, Falconio making the comment, I haven't enjoyed geeking out this much in a very long time. And, and Nancy Graziano um, is saying, thanks, Hannah. Yes, thank you, Hannah. Um, and, and we are currently at... We are currently at 21,593,000 nice. and holding with My Little Pony. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's inspiring something, which is why. Oh, is she making pony art? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Should we auction that off? We can't auction it off. Not auction, you know what I mean. So, so Lindsay is allowed to give as a part commissions for donations. And she is allowed <laughs> you know to give I mean. as can a part she, she gift. gift from her can heart. She gift off this for donation. If she wants to. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, those are awesome. <laughs> Nobody can see what's happening off camera. It They're just outdid me, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're gonna wait. We're gonna give it. A uh, I mean, it's up to you. Go for it. Okay, so whoever wants this lovely gift of, of tiny interns, awesome, super cool, this is her board. She doodled amazing things. Uh, what should we do for that? If, if, you, if you place a donation 
and in the comments put heart tiny intern. The heart. first person to do that, because I'm sure there'll be many. <laughs> yes. Heart tiny intern. Yeah, totally. And there is, I think, in the kitchen, on the desk in the kitchen, an entire box of art supplies. Okay. So the next person to donate, minimum of something. Minimum of what your heart feels for Tiny Intern. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> for heart, Tiny Intern gets Tiny Intern art. Yay. <laughs> um, and, and there's an extra $10 that went in through a different feed that I'm going to move between so it shows up on the correct donation tracker. So, so you've been sitting on the Twitters. What, what, what do we have coming in from the Twitters? Okay, we have uh, Chris Willow, who's currently manning the green room as well, saying, despite ignorance and scientific literacy, joining to CosmoQuest. Uh, Nathan Miller is back from RavenCon. Glad to see I've not missed the CosmoQuest hangout at Thon. Osiris Rex tweeted about us. Uh, lots of other people are doing as you said and sharing the link and sharing the love and, and getting more people watching and looking and donating. This is great. Um, and I did realize we will overlap with Cosmos, so there will be some Cosmos-themed tweets later on tonight because we will be overlapping with our time zones uh, version of Cosmos. So, yay! Uh, I know I realize some of you may drop off to watch, but then come back because the last hour is going to be a screen. It'll be fun. It'll be awesome. So, uh, yeah, that's what I was getting links and things ready for, and I'm yes. <laughs> oh yeah. yes. So, so we were planning at this point to have in uh, Jake from Rochester Institute of Technology, who is, what are you Technology. laughing? Technology. What did I actually say? Technology. <laughs> <laughs> you guys heard that, right? This is just me. <laughs> I'm sure their students have tech knowledge, but there is an extra letter in their university name. So, Jake <laughs> from Rochester Institute of Technology um, was planning to be on with us, but he, he actually, he's one of these horribly, wonderfully overworked people who is so busy doing things, he doesn't actually have time to come on. Um, and actually, I think he broke everything. <laughs> well, there's that too. Um, and so, so one of the things that we're looking forward to working on doing is with our Gorilla Citizen Science Project, we've been going out and mugging people with science. This is what we do. Um, we, we, we wait for them to be standing in line to do something, and we walk up to them, and we don't steal anything. So I guess maybe we're the anti-muggers. Um, Violent language. <laughs> I'm a galactic astronomer. Okay. I studied galaxies that did ram pressure stripping for my dissertation. That's what you said. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so galaxy harassment was a phrase used in my dissertation. Um, but, but anyways, so, so with, with our citizen science guerrilla work, we we go out and we look for people who are standing around not doing anything other than waiting. And we ask them if they want a hit of science. And then we start engaging them in exploring our solar system. Um, and, and one of the things that I've discovered going to, to a lot of these science fiction conventions and other public events is there's families. And one of the things that I've been working to encourage is getting parents and little kids to sit down and mark craters together, to get the kids to point at things on the screen and the parents who have more manual dexterity to mark them and explain what's going on and to work together to get families doing science together. And this is simply something I want to do. This is something that Jake is already doing. And one of the things that as I post more and more of our long-term goals for CosmoQuest on our website, which I'm going to be working to post, one or two new things a day, every day, along with a personal video throughout the 36 days that this fundraiser will continue. Um, this is a 36-hour kickoff event of insanity and fundraising. Um, and we're currently at $21,600, basically. Um, I was hoping to make 36000 That was probably just an insane wish. Um, people who want to see my hair blonde want us to hit $50,000. Um, but one of the things that we're hoping to do as we look for funding, as we get more successful, is we want to integrate more family science, more getting parents and children 
doing science together, contributing to the understanding of our universe, and giving children the realization, I can be a scientist. That's an amazingly empower, empowering thing. And it's something Jake is an expert in doing. And Jake is also a research evaluator for educational programs where he goes in and he evaluates the outcomes. Because when you're doing science education, you, you do evaluation at the end of it. And there's several different ways to do evaluations. You can do pre and post testing and see how much people learn. Um, this is kind of what the American educational system is currently based on, is you test the tar out of everything. Um, then there's the, you can do a, um, a evaluation that looks to see how much did people like what they were presented with. And people like me can fake evaluations like that simply by going in and, and, and enthusing and using our voices and hand gestures and, and dressing nicely and things like that. And even these amazing evaluations, but nobody learned anything. They simply felt entertained. And, and Jake is someone who works to try and make sure that educational programs are both inspiring so that people don't walk away feeling like they've simply been tested to death, and while being inspiring, are also getting learning to happen. Um, and this is something that Georgia Bracey, who's in our own program and who's been on the air a few times this weekend, she also works on this. And we want to get more of this evaluation going, more of this family engagement going. And we want to say yes to more people when they want to learn and do science. And so when you donate, you're allowing us to say yes to getting families learning and doing science and helping us continue to build a partnership with Jake. We work with currently on the AstroZone project um, at the American Astronomical Society meetings, and we want to work more with Jake. He's come down and joined us at Dragon Con. Um, and what's really awesome about his team is there's a lot of educational technologies that's just out of reach of a normal location. Science on a sphere. Some of you may have seen this in museums. You go in and there's this gorgeous, kind of looks like a glass ball, but it's not. It's all sorts of technology. And they project on the inside of this globe um, all sorts of different imagery. One of my favorite examples of using the science on the sphere is they were doing uh, real-time representations of Facebook networks, uh, showing all the interlinks between people. And it showed how the globe is truly interconnected. Well, those systems cost a lot of money. Don, do you know how much of science on the sphere costs, roughly? I'd say it was $48,000. So, so you're looking at basically forty dollars to $60,000 for a system, and that's out of the reach of most schools. That's like an entire year of a human being or one piece of technology that you're probably going to have to repair now and then. Now, what, what Jake's group has figured out is how to use your standard off-the-shelf projectors and a big blow up, it looks kind of like a weather balloon, but it fits into a suitcase, um, and a vacuum cleaner to blow it up. So normal items to make a science on the sphere that you're externally projecting onto and just need software to mutate the images to get them to correctly project. And finding low-cost low ways to replicate high-cost uh, teaching tools is, is just something I my hat that I don't ever wear, but if I wore a hat, my hat would be off to Jake right now. Um, so yeah, it's... In fact, some of you, if you came to Dragon Con, we had, uh, since I'm in the process of going through uh, the surveys that uh, evaluated our group at Dragon Con, a lot of you were attracted by the 3D Mars projection on the ceiling, which was uh, courtesy of, of Jake and his team, and so they just managed to wow people with amazing tech um, and, and a lot of tech that, that people have in their homes already, like the Kinect systems, um, video game systems. Um, kids will bring them in. They can they develop software that will do science with that, and kids can bring them into the classroom, and their teacher can teach a lesson plan using that video game console. And, and I'm going to point out a very sweet comment. Uh, you want to go ahead and read it? Falconio. Oh, read this comment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have that much money to donate for tiny interns art as I think it's hard. Aww. Aww. <laughs> She's like, oh, and made an adorable face. Yeah, she did pouty face. She went, oh, 
<laughs> but when she does it, it's far cuter than when I do it. Um, so, so we are currently sitting at twenty-one thousand six hundred and seventy-eight dollars in donations. Um, so, what we normally spend our Sunday night doing? Well, I usually spend my Sunday night frantically trying to catch up on work that didn't get done during the work week. But what Nicole normally spends her Sunday night evenings doing is marking craters and watching Cosmos. Right. Do you want to share the, the Cosmos Sunday night science sharing? Sure. So what I do, um, yeah, so when Cosmos is on for our central time zone, uh, one of the uh, things that we got recently, thanks to, to my boyfriend's job at Best Buy, was a <laughs> TV antenna, so I can actually watch real TV again, which I haven't done in years. Um, so we watch uh, Cosmos on Sunday nights, um, tweet about it while the show is on, uh, and then on the commercials, uh, map CosmoQuest creators. Because uh, again, I, yeah. I'm used to Netflix. I'm not used to. Um, I'm used to Netflix. I'm totally not used to watching commercials. So it's like, oh, I'll do the creators instead. And so I s share the screenshots of the crater marking as I'm doing them. <laughs> I share the, the crater screenshots. And and one of those Sundays was when I came across the Apollo 15 landing site and went, squee, and it was all good times. Uh, so I've gotten a couple people hooked on to CosmoQuest uh, through doing that using the Cosmos hashtag. So uh, I know we will be overlapping with Cosmos. Some of you have already said that you will stay screwed and watch tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. It's Keep watching on Hulu. Hulu live. So thank you. Yes, it'll be available on Hulu for those of you in the countries. And and then some of you pointed out you are in countries that aren't getting Cosmos now anyway. So you're going to keep sticking with us. So thank you. Um, but do continue. Um, Feel free to feel free to use the Cosmos hashtag to talk about our awesome stuff too, because we are all studying the Cosmos together. So that'll be pretty cool. Uh, so you want me to get set up? <laughs> it's like hiding <laughs> <of> squirrels <laughs> in front of the monitor now. <laughs> we were totally planning to use this tag, and it turned into honey and squirrels. <laughs> but uh, do you want me to? Put the screen on. Um, so, so I was wondering, do you actually want to screen share? So, so what we're thinking that we're going to do is, I, I am not Carl Sagan, I am not Neil deGrasse Tyson, I am Pamela Gay. I actually got to meet Carl Sagan's son last week, and that was a really oh, interesting I experience. Yeah, so I got to meet Carl Sagan's son while I was at the uh, Olamat Film Festival in the Czech Republic last week, and. One of the really interesting things he said when he introduced the, the Cosmo series of the films that I was part of and got to introduce one of the TV shows I've been on during, um, one of the things that he said is while his father was alive, he refused to sell the rights to Cosmos to any commercial entity. He did not want it to ever be a commercial program. And, and it was really interesting to hear him talking about how different it is from what his father wanted it to be and I think with what we do with our media, I'm not Carl Sagan, I'm not Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I think we're trying to be respectful of the poetry that Carl Sagan put into space while giggle, giggling a bit more maniacally than Carl Sagan ever giggled while doing science. So our goal, while we, we respect Neil greatly, our goal is to, to keep that poetry in space and to keep that idea of storytelling and narrative in our communications, and we're just adding maniacal giggling. I was going to say, she's more the poetry, I'm more the maniacal giggling. And we're a partnership. <laughs> we have different styles, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tree Lobster just wrote, I would totally watch Cosmos hosted by yes. Pamela. Cosmos hosted by Pamela would be amazing. I'm more of the Mythbusters type. <laughs> yes, yes, I would watch Mythbusters. Well, I already watched yes. Mythbusters. I would happily continue to watch Mythbusters if Nicole was on it. Um, so, so what? Back back to plan. Would get in a way too much trouble. I know. Oh yeah, you and Tori would destroy <laughs> the universe. That was my backup plan when I thought I wouldn't get into grad school. Was like to move to San Francisco and beg them to be an intern. And Bill, I told that to Phil, he's like, yeah, that's everyone's dream. I'm like, no, I was really going to do it. <laughs> I might still do it. I might still, now that I actually have a little bit of technical skill from grad school, I think I'd be more qualified. <laughs> so so on on this night of Cosmos oh, airing. Eventually, um, a few hours from now. Yeah, a few hours from now. I, I We're love the Cosmos pre-show. We are not on Fox, sadly. I mean, having science on mainstream network TV is amazing. So that that is just kudos to the Cosmos team for that. That is amazing. Uh, will be your pre-show. 
Open your Cosmos pre-show. So do you want me to screen? Sh you want me to do it on one of those screens? Or, or I was thinking. I know you absolutely hate my trackpad. I have sort of figured it out. Okay. So, so I was thinking. Do you want to screen care so it's in high res? You guys want to say in high res while she reads? I'm going to read construction paper moon once I go back and find where I put the link. That's what's going to happen. She's going to read to you again. Lovely sci-fi story. Uh, and then instead of just watching her read. Which was fine. You're going to watch me, uh, Mark Crater. So if you've never gotten around to looking at the tutorial video, uh, you can kind of see how it works um, as I go through the crater marking. And you can play along at home. You can go to cosmoquest.org and click do science and uh, pick Moon, Mercury, or Vesta. Uh, I I'm going to start at I don't know. I think I'll start at Mercury because uh, I like Mercury. It's, it, the images are really super cool. Um, and you guys can watch that, listen to Pamela's amazing voice, uh, and continue to donate. Uh, we've still we've got you know whoever's commented uh, for heart tiny intern will get the tiny intern art. We I don't know if we've gotten to the end of the free Wi-Fi and Mars and Sigler books yet. Not quite yet. Not quite yet. Okay. Because we have because because my my boyfriend showed up with uh, I think what will be a lovely gift. Um, we can do after we're done with the. Uh, the so boss. I'm also going to look to see where are we in our time. Okay, so we're we're doing good right now. Um, let's plan at the 6 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. We are going to switch to to the Khaleesi hours. Apparently, what I'm going to be calling that. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's 40 minutes from now. We will switch to that. We will introduce that. Uh, but you can still get the Sigma books. <laughs> Tim is giggling over there. Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so those of you who know us know what's coming. But the rest of you, it'll be pretty cool. Uh, um, so, so we are going to share um, the art of doing craters and one of my one of Force. my. There is the pizza. Force. There is pizza. Oh my god, did you guys get Dewey's? Yes. Oh. Nancy got Dewey's for you. Who did? Nancy. Nancy? Nancy. 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 That's Nancy. Nancy. You got us pizza? <laughs> Thank <What>? you! <laughs> Oh my god! So, so the, the complete look of confusion on my face. Like, Nancy's in Jersey. How did she get us pizza? Well, so there? There, there was multiple <laughs> levels of confusion because. There, there's Nancy Atkinson who lives relatively nearby and said she couldn't participate this weekend but has been retweeting. There's Nancy Graziano who does not live here and is wonderful. And then there's my friend Nancy out at Fancy Farms. Oh, and right. Fancy there's Farms is, is one of the small businesses that's supporting um, our hangout. And so I was like, Nancy from Fancy Farms? She doesn't. She's, she's a Mexican. If it was a chimichanga. So I was having this this reality broke because the word Nancy wasn't followed by the word chimichanga. Um, so Nancy Graziano, you are now forever going to be associated with the awesomeness of pizza. <laughs> I'm going to stop now. <laughs> you, just, you just keep thinking, Pamela. <laughs> All right. Uh, I got to remember my password because this isn't my computer. Uh, you want to use my password? Yeah. <laughs> Spell it out online. Well, no. I'm going to take back my keyboard. Yeah, it should autocomplete if you press tab. Yep. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. I don't have my uh, log me in. It's browsing. Oh, apparently it's wrong. What? Um, try, no, so that screen maybe will work. It, it gets confused with the blog password. No. No. Okay. <laughs> yep. Wee. Passwords! Yay! Oh my gosh, I got hit. Thank you. Aha! I apparently changed my password at a point in time I forgot. Awesome. Probably with the heart no, you did not have to change your Cosmo Quest password. Yeah, Heartbleed Cosmo, Quest, Cosmo was Quest was not password. affected by Heartbleed. Yay. Well, at least nothing that you guys see. Our back end, our Twitters, and all the things. Oh, anyway. <laughs> things and stuff. We're going to do some And I'm going to go back to using the good mic if, if 
Uh, Nicole can switch mics. And wow, my laptop is getting hot at this point in the day. What's the mic called? Yeti? Yeah. Yeti stereo. Hello, Internet. Are you guys flirting with each other? No. <laughs> we, we are suddenly bracketed by our significant others. And, and they're waving at each other across the set. And, and I, I have to point out that her significant other, I, I'm tetral promal, and which balances out with my husband, who is colorblind. <laughs> Between the two of us, we can either not see color or see too many of them. Um, but but her, her significant other is wearing a shirt that is disturbingly like four shades diagonal across the color grid. So it doesn't quite match the wall in a very dissonant kind of way. Okay. And and Dawn is agreeing. <laughs> so her, her, her significant other is creating color dissonance with the wall. My significant other is wearing blue and does not clash with anything. I'm going to start screen sharing. <laughs> <laughs> because silly. All right. So, so I'm going to read. Um, I'm hoping that we have good audio oh, coming right off of the mic. I don't I'm need going to see to my own tutorial. <laughs> I'm going to stop yelling into the mic. My levels look a little bit better now. Um, tweet at us, uh, or um, actually, can you see the Q and A up on your laptop to monitor if no. someone's okay? If the sound levels are bad, Joe, tweet at us. Um, and we'll adjust the sound levels. I'm trying to use a good mic to read. Um, this is a short story. I have to admit, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't read this short story in a good long time. Um, so please forgive me if I make some mistakes while reading it. Um, it's a Creative Commons available story, Construction, pa construction Paper Moon. It's part of the Homeless Moon chapbook series, available at thehomelessmoon.com. And it's just a very sweet story. Um, sweet isn't the right word. It's a story that, that simply touched me, and I enjoy reading it. And so I'm going to share it with you while Nicole marks craters. Maybe. And I know we've hit the point in the hangout a -thon where a whole lot of you have donated everything you have to give, and I'm so deeply grateful for that. When you're done giving, know that, and, and by done giving, I can mean you looked at your bank account and said, I can't give. I get that. I respect that. Um, when we designed CosmoQuest, I hoped to never, ever have to ask the people in our community for money other than from the forums to play for the forum servers, because the forum servers are really expensive. Um, but other than that, I was hoping we could just do science and teach science for free. The government didn't exactly allow us to do that. Um, but, you know, we exist to generate science. So if you can join along with Nicole and mark craters with Nicole, that would make me and all of our science teams, and we're bringing on Stuart Robbins in the next hour to talk science, it would make all of our science teams stupidly happy. And there is an absolutely amazing, Amazing crater on the screen right now. Without, <laughs> without further babbling, I'm going to read Construction Paper Moon by Michael J. DeLuca. James squatted at the top of the folding ladder that led down from the attic, his ears wrapped in a pair of stereo headphones, the soundtrack to the stars implosion crashing through his head. Sifting through the ancient shoebox cradled in his lap, he found the remote, pressed it, and the paper stars inside began to glow. He wondered if she'd understand, or if he was just wasting his time. Petra sat hunched over her desk, studying for the academy entrance exam, her reader lying open to an animated fill-in-the-blanks map of the inner solar system. The asteroids were killing her. She entered the word Vesta into a blank next to the largest of them, then deleted it and wrote Ceres. She knew the names. She knew them. She just couldn't pull them up out of the murk. Her brain was fried as only six hours of cramming could fry it. Fifteen minutes to lights out, said her dad. Petra ground her teeth and gazed beseechingly at the framed poster of her favorite astronaut, 
Ophelia Matamoros that hung above her desk. She couldn't concentrate. For two hours, Dad had been puttering around her bedroom with an old shoebox tucked under one arm, gluing LEP paper stars to the ceiling and walls, referring to a cracked and tattered star chart unrolled across her bed. Worse, he kept humming. You're doing it again, Dad, she growled. He stopped for maybe half a minute. He didn't seem conscious of it. She knew the tune Dark Star from his antique psychedelic rock collection. She ought to. He played it to death. The words kept popping up in her head in place of the ones she was looking for. They were all about to change. Love in transition. Stars like diamonds. It didn't even make sense. Constellations didn't change. Just your position among them. Petra stared blearily at her dad's reflection in the glass of Ophelia's portrait, which was now surrounded by the off-kilter stars of the constellation Ophiuchus. Dad looked even thinner than usual, paler. This whole idea, a handmade star chart, only reminded her how old and out of touch he was compared to the dads of all the other girls applying to the academy. He could have gotten her the halo globe that she'd shown him, the one that cataloged every celestial event for 10,000 years into the past or future. It would have cost money. She could forgive him that. But there was also the nostalgia factor. Granddad had used these same stars when Dad was a kid. She, posed, she supposed it would be cute if it wasn't so embarrassingly inaccurate. Fifteen minutes later, when his internal dad clock went off and he announced, Bedtime! She hadn't done a single thing to the map except replace the word series with Vesta again. Petra bit back her usual remarks about the meaningless tyranny of bedtime. The exam was tomorrow. She was tired of arguing. Instead, she closed the reader silently and took her pajamas into the bathroom to change. She could tell by his shocked face as she passed him that he'd been expecting a fight. She stood in the hallway, brushing her teeth while he doused the room lights and fiddled with the dated hand remote that kindled the stars. What's the big one supposed to be? She asked around a mouthful of toothpaste. One star stood out glaringly from the rest, ten times the size of anything else, a vast pale orb hovering between the constellation Cetus and a watercolor of the Mars ERV engine Petra had painted when she was six. Washed in its eerily, eerie luminescence, the familiar shapes of her bedroom suddenly resembled the bottom of the sea. Her dad was an indistinct outline in the dimness as he rolled up the crinkled star chart and slid it into its case. That's the moon. Which moon? Phobos? Demas? Io? Ganymede? Callisto? Europa? Amethelia? Themista? Petra smiled fiercely as the words rolled off her foam-covered tongue and she knew she could have gone on listing moons forever. She was ready. It's our moon, her dad cut in. Earth's moon. She went back to the bathroom and spat. Earth doesn't have a moon, Dad, she told the mirror, mortified. Luna's classified as an erratic dwarf planet. I, I thought this was supposed to help me study. If I put that on the test, they'd send me back to primary school. He was waiting by the bed for a hug when she returned. She grabbed the reader off the desk in a vain attempt to ward off the gravitational pull of his arms. He wrapped them around her from behind, looking over her shoulder. His beard tickled her neck. Squirming, she called up a different portion of the solar system map. See? Luna rocketed lopsidedly through the void, surrounded by a haze of post-impact debris congealing into a pale ring. The speck of an unnamed Kuiper Belt object winked from two million kilometers distance, the only thing anywhere nearby. 
Nothing's wrong with learning a little historical astronomy, Dad said quietly. Your particular night sky just happens to be that of August 5th, 2012 at 10 p.m. He let her go. She put the reader to sleep on the nightstand and climbed into bed. He kissed her goodnight. Petra lay there exhausted. It was the kind of exhaustion that left you jittery and shaking too tired to sleep. Her head buzzed with equations of Keplerian orbital mechanics and major features of extraterrestrial geography. Not good. Once you studied too much, things got worse, not better. Think of something else. The scrub pine outside tapped its limbs against the window. She stared up at the fake stars and the fake moon. They were too bright. She was too old for night lights. She covered her eyes with her arm. The moon made the night too bright to sleep. And yet she knew people had endured it for thousands of years. Of, of course it wasn't there all the time. She understood about occlusion and orbital cycles. The moon waxed and waned like a relationship between people. You could think you understood a person, but even knowing them all your life, you might only see part of them, just a sliver. Someday when you met them head on, you might discover they weren't who you thought, and you'd have to come to terms with it, because by then, you'd know they were never going away, even though you'd only seen their light side. What must it have been like to see Luna hanging in the night, to be able to walk outside, look up with nothing but the naked eye, and actually see it, a whole other world? The thought made her tingle with excitement, yet there was an uncanniness to it, a twinge of fear. She had always wanted to be an astronaut, but there were nightmares she remembered from her childhood of herself as the Earth falling endlessly through the black void infinity. Go to sleep. Test tomorrow. It was no use. Petra, cook, Petra kicked off the cover. She opened her eyes and stared up gloomily. Even standing on the chair, she knew she wouldn't be tall enough to pull down the moon. She got up sat at the desk and opened the shoebox the fake stars had come from. Inside were more stars and several thick sheets made from the same rough paper, bluish white, green white, and pale, pale red. The sheets had holes in them, cut out with scissors in all sorts of shapes. There was a crescent moon, another waxing gibbous. This, this one was obviously Saturn, though woefully disproportionate in size. No sign of the remote. Her dad must have taken it. She, she could hear him still moving around outside the door. Petra flopped down on the bed. She waited, quietly counting her breaths, going over the names of the stars and constellations she recognized from their demented approximations. She'd be able to rest just as soon as that moon went away. At last, the yellow glow faded from the crack under the door, and the muffled sounds of her father's movement ceased, leaving only the old bungalow's familiar creaks and rattles in the night breeze off the Atlantic. Petra crept out into the darkened hallway. Her dad liked to listen to music in bed. Lamplight spilling from his open bedroom door lit imperfectly the frames of plaques and photos on the opposite wall. Her dad's medals, his diplomas, pictures of Petra as a baby, as a little girl in a blue dress at her seventh grade commencement. She stepped past them silently, dodging the light. The remote wasn't among the jumble of beard trimmers, toothpaste, barrettes, and combs in the basket by the bathroom sink. It wasn't on the shelf by the front door under the rusty harpoon where her dad kept his keys and ID badge from Otis Air Base. Nor was it one of the miscellaneous handhelds surrounding the empty storm lantern on the kitchen table, which meant he must which meant it must be in his room. Petra leaned against the wall by his open bedroom door and looked up at the photo of herself 
wishing not for the first time that the collection of memories her dad reminded himself of every morning could include just one face that wasn't hers. This is ridiculous, she thought. She peeked around the door jam. He sat on the edge of the bed, facing away from her, his posture rod straight, a faint trickle of electric guitar emanating from the black headphones engulfing his ears. He held an object in his hands she couldn't see. Something felt weird, wrong. This wasn't how her dad listened to music. He danced like his bones had turned to jelly. She'd explained how utterly traumatized she'd been if she ever caught him doing that in public, but the effort had no effect whatsoever. Even when he listened, sitting down or lying in bed, some part of him was always wiggling along. Now he was still. She inched further into the light. The object in his hands was a newspaper, an actual physical newspaper, practically flaking apart. He was holding it with gloves on. The Barnstable Patriot. The headline read, Cape Wind Timeline Unaffected. Petra realized he wasn't even looking at it. He was staring out the window toward the sea, though she couldn't see anything in the glass, but the room's reflection in the black branches of the scrub pine outside rocking the wind. She took a half step into the room, craning her neck to make out the date on the paper. August 7, 2012. There were red circles under his eyes. His beard was wet. Her first thought, which she hated but couldn't take back, was, why now, when she had her own troubles to deal with? She went back to her room. She sat on the edge of her bed, staring up into the false moon's eerie glow. Her fingertips found the reader on the nightstand, and she pulled it into her lap, August 7th. What had happened that day? Not the collision. The date that Luna broke Earth orbit was July 19th, 2012. It was, it was branded forever in the head of every school-age kid, especially Petra. July, not August. A door slammed, penetrating his isolation. James pulled off the headphones to the creaking silence of the house and knew in his stomach that Petra was gone. The curtains of her bedroom window swelled and shifted ghost-like in the bluish light cast by the construction paper moon. The window was open, the breeze rushing through, it damp and salty. The door must have blown shut. Petra's bed was empty. He searched the bungalow to satisfy the hope he might be wrong. It was a small place, just a single floor, five rooms he'd shared with her so long that he knew she wasn't there without even needing to turn on a light. James flung a windbreaker across his shoulders and stepped out the front door. Fog rolled over the small yard in billows, mottling the stars. Bare footprints led from Petra's window across the dewy lawn, then faded into the sand at the head of the path through the dunes. He went down the dune path, razors of grass licking his shins. At the top of the sandy cliff, the fog pulled back. The Atlantic spread away like glass beneath a moonless sky made emptier by the sheer number of the stars. He looked over the edge of the drop at the beach below. Had she come down this way? It was the way she always went when he wasn't there to tell her no. James stepped, James stepped off the cliff into the mist, the, the hook from Dark Star still running through his head. His heels hit the sand at the steep angle, and he slid 10 or 12 feet at an uncontrollable speed before the beach leveled off, halting his descent abruptly. He pitched forward hard onto his knees, out of practice from too many years spent trying to set an example. Cool sand bit into his palms. Petra appeared out of the fog, seated at the edge of the water, arms wrapped around her legs, the ocean lapping at her toes. As always, for an instant, he was frightened for her, 
instincts still warning of the surf's pounding ferocity, the danger of the undertow. The reflex was primal and irrational. With, without the moon to pull the tides, the Atlantic was eternally calm, placid as a lake. These terrors resulted from something psychologists called the Acteron effect, a generational affectation. Petra would never suffer from it. She was angry. He could see it in her posture, the hunch of her shoulders, despite the foggy, moonless night. What are you doing down here? He asked, the safest question he could muster. And even that felt like walking on glass. I couldn't sleep. She bit off the words. He sat beside her in the sand, made himself hold still as the water spilled between his toes. What's the matter? Your moon was too bright. James followed her gaze towards the stars and thought of the moon as he had seen it that night and then again for endless nights afterward repeated on the news and everywhere else anyone looked. Horned, immense, and alien. He remembered the feeling of impact like a tidal wave slamming into his chest. This was the feeling that in 12 years as a single father he'd failed to convey. His wife Gina had been first mate on the trawler Petra Cabrera out of Woods Hole. On the night of July 19, 2012, the night of the collision, she went missing. The storms that followed destroyed ships all along the world's coasts. With no way to get news, nothing else to do but work, James threw himself into double shifts at Otis, sleeping at his desk, trying to anticipate the after-effects of the massive comet collision that had destabilized the moon's orbit and driven everyone half insane. He forgot about Petra, left her with a nursing service, and forgot her utterly. Afterwards, they gave him medals. Nineteen days later, the wreck of the Petra Cabrera washed ashore. Gina had taken her ship and set sail. The ocean killed her. The scientists who stood up to be honored with James speculated that she couldn't help it. A woman and a sailor, a life so dependent on the moon and its cycle. They told him not to think of it as suicide. He remembered the image from Petra's reader. The moon rocketing alone through the void, not Earth's anymore or anyone else's. Its impact wounds already being healed by gravity. It was that image which had made him retreat into his room, pull the paper in its plastic from under the mattress, and bury himself in the music of the dead. That and the thought that Luna didn't need us anymore. Petra jumped up and splashed away from his silence into the shallows. Dad, would you come out of your little world for one minute? My entrance exams are tomorrow. Doesn't that mean anything to you? He reached into his memory, seeking some similar monumental change, some loss he might have endured without a thought while his parents bowed under its weight and finally cracked like trees in a hurricane. He'd been an unfathomable man, young man once, drowning out his parents with the dead, doing drugs, staying up all night, reading Camus, but that had been later. When he was Petra's age, he, he had never been Petra. I looked up that night in the Atlas, she said, her tone accusing. August 7th. The moon wasn't even in that spot at 10 p.m. It was down on the horizon. You screwed it up. James closed his mouth into a firm line. His reflex was to snap at her. I put the moon right where I wanted it, he said, where it should have been if that night had never happened. I don't believe this. Petra wrapped her arms around herself, shivering up to, shivering up to her calves in the sea. First you wouldn't let me study. Now I find out you're trying to trick me. Do you want me to fail? Come out of the water, he said. You'll catch cold. He'd had to broach the subject somehow. 
I could board at the academy, you know. If I get a scholarship, you'd pay for me to live there. You'd, you ever think of that? I'm, I'm not some genius prodigy, but I could do it. I work hard enough. No thanks to you. I know, said James. She'd grow up and fulfill all her dreams, be an astronaut, go away somewhere up there and never return. What did you think this was about? So you tried to make me fail the test. You tried to sabotage me just to keep me here? No, of course not. I'm your father. I want you to succeed. Petra gave an exasperated shriek. She kicked at the pebbles, spattering salt spray across his clothes. Then what the hell is going on? I saw you crying, Dad. I saw you. What happened that night, August 7th, 2012? What happened? The warning red light of the offshore wind farms gleamed briefly on the southeast horizon, then were swallowed. The black Atlantic rippled under the fog and the stars. Would anything change if he told her? Would the truth devastate her, transform her, destroy her ambitions? Would it do anything at all to prevent, to prevent her from becoming her mother? No. He stood up, hands in the pockets of his windbreaker, toes curling into the sand. The strangest thing to him about the absent moon, at least insofar as the dictates of his instincts, his residual memory of what the ocean had been like when life first crawled from it at the dawn of time, had always been the sound. There was no more crashing, epic, thunderous, cataclysmic surf just the lonely breeze across the calm ocean and serenity. In its place, a piercing, revelatory, long-dead guitar line rocked in his head, and James tried again to steel himself to lose his daughter the same way he had lost his wife, and he realized again that he'd never be ready. He never thought she'd really be an astronaut. He thought it was just one of those dreams kids had. Petra had made it happen all on her own. It, he had been trying to hold her back, consciously or not, he had done it. He didn't want to be that kind of father. James swallowed the lump in his throat. It doesn't matter. He mustered at last. I've, I've been meaning to tell you about that night, about me and your mom, for what seems like forever. But you're right. I was selfish. You made it this far without knowing. There's no reason I should spring it on you now. I just thought if you knew, it might keep you here. But it doesn't have to happen tonight. He stepped into the cold water. His heels sank into the slippery sand. The placid ocean laughed at his ankles, soaking the cuffs of his pajamas. He unzipped the windbreaker, pulled it off, and held it out. I'm sorry, he said. Petra studied her dad in the darkness. She hadn't thought about mom in a long time, though once, as a little girl, she wouldn't have let a day go by without bringing it up, but dad wasn't ready then, and after a while, it didn't seem to matter anymore. It obviously mattered to him now. He looked so forlorn, standing there so gray and thin without a coat, like the wind could tip him over. She stepped forward, put one arm through the sleeve of the windbreaker, then the other, he let it go. I don't have to move away, Dad. The Academy's only in Tur Toronto. I, I could commute. You could practically drop me off there on your way to work. Dad shook his head, held up his open hands. Plenty of time to worry about that later. We can talk about it tomorrow. Dad? I do kind of want to know about mom. Maybe not now, but whenever you're ready. As they headed up the beach, he was humming again, quietly. She sang some of the words. The end. Hey. Okay, so 
I I love reading stories. I love doing voice work, and I love getting to share these stories from authors who inspire me to think about a solar system other than our own, to try and imagine um, ways to destroy the solar system and how it would affect humans. P.G. Holyfield, who's um, an author that Nicole and I both truly adore, who's often at Balticon. He is someone who's been trying to find a way to destroy the solar system in inter interesting ways for the past several years, and we've got to brainstorm with him. And I love getting to do this. And one of my things that I do a lot is I listen to audiobooks. I, I listen to the voice of people like Scott Sigler and P.G. Holyfield and Mer Lafferty. I was actually listening to Mer earlier while I drifted off to sleep. Um, and these voices inspire me. And I, since we are missing a guest, um, wanted to encourage you to think, to dream, and to do science. So what all was happening while I was reading? Oh, so I went through, I started with Mercury, and then since uh, the character was studying the asteroids, I moved on to Vesta, and then since the moon, of course, we the star, I moved on to the moon, so you guys, uh, I, was, <laughs> I had my face right in front of the screen, so I was glad that, you know, we were screen sharing and not on the webcam. Um, so I hope you guys, uh, you know, it may have been a little hypnotic if you were just watching and listening, uh, but I hope you guys, uh, if you're already marking craters with us, um, that you, uh, you know, got a little bit out of that, or if you haven't seen it before, you actually see a little bit of what goes on when you're marking craters and uh, uh, the other surface features, which I took a lot of time doing on Mercury because there's a lot of crater changes. Uh, so I hope that... Uh, if Stuart was watching, I did I did Mercury and the Moon justice, and if the uh, Georgia Tech people are watching, it, that I did Vesta justice, if you were watching. Um, so that's uh, logged in from Pamela's account. Um, so that's some of what uh, you can do if you're sitting and listening to an audiobook, uh, listening to a story. You can listen to the story and, and work through that, or you know do it some other time. Do it during commercial breaks of whatever you're watching on TV. Uh, so I'm. Uh, <laughs> that was a little tricky with an unfamiliar trackpad and and sleep deprivation, but I, I hope I did a good job for you guys. Um, there's a little live demonstration of uh, of the Cosmo Quest Citizen Science. And and I think I broke everyone who's up here with that story. I should yeah. have had disclaimers that that is a heartbreaking story. I truly love it because it is one that has beautiful science, has beautiful consequences and talks about the consequences of scientists go too far sometimes. It gets the personality of the scientists correct. And it gets the personalities of the children who grow up to be scientists correct. When I listen to that girl, I hear some of the things I shouted at my parents oh my growing gosh, up. Yeah. And, and I didn't go on to be an astronaut, but I sure ran away to college. And, and this is what some of us do. And I'm sorry to anyone who I may have broken. I, I think Tim was crying, or your eyes are very bloodshot for other yeah, reasons. Oh, they usually are. OK, that was <laughs> uh, disturbing. Um, so, so Hannah, uh, uh, who was in the last segment, writes, after my segment, I was totally ready to go do homework. But this is so much more fun. Yay. Um, we, we are le losing Tatiana Vasilevska. Yes. I, it, the the, 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 the screen is just at the edge of my ability to, to focus. Yeah. Um, she writes, OK, good night, everyone. It was fun weekend. Sending CosmoQuest love to all. I am away to sleep. Heart. Thank you, Tatiana. Thanks, Pamela and Nicole, for hosting this great event. And well done. Thank you so much. And thank you for um, inspiring the Khaleesi Blonde that we are nowhere near. So, so one of my sadnesses is, while there may have been donations on the wrong channel, I need to go check that, because occasionally I'm seeing donations go in our normal donation pathway instead of the Hangout. Which is awesome and fine. And, and we're good with that. I just have to move them. But on the Hangout-a-thon, there were no donations while I read. Yep. OK, Dawn is saying everyone was mesmerized. OK, so I will make the promise of reading at least one short story a week, except when I'm traveling. Um, how long am I willing to hold this promise for? <laughs> Through the end of the summer, because I know my travel isn't that bad. 
up, up until August 15th, which if you're an academic is when summer ends. If uh, we can hit by the end of the next hour, we are currently at 21,678. If we can make it to 23,000, I will release for free a story every week between now and August 15th, unless I'm out of the country for the entirety of the week. Which is what the next comment is asking for. So, so we have um, from uh, uh, Falconio. Falconio. <laughs> we have, you need to start a science bedtime story podcast. I just need motivated, which means I need to spend less time fundraising. Help me spend less time fundraising. And I will read you more stories. Um, and, and then Jeff Seltzer writes, I really want Pamela to just read all the books. I'd like to read all the books. I just need to spend less time writing grants and begging for money on air. If I can spend more time not writing grants and not begging for money on air, I will do more science, do more research, and read more stories because I love reading stories. So please help liberate me to do more science and more reading of stories and less begging on air by donating money, please. Please? Please, why did none of you donate while I read Make Up For It Now, please? And if you've already donated, I get that. Go mark craters and hit other people up to donate. Um, <laughs> and Michael Jobin writes, I'm having noodle pizza, a.k.a. spaghetti. I, that it's is Italian, it breaks me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Guido... Uh, writes, this story was mesmerizing, absolutely beautiful. The name of the story was Construction Paper Moon, and it can be found on thehomelessmoon.com. Um, again, it's a DRM-free story, released under Creative Commons. Um, please go spend the $2 to get the hardcover version. Um, it's, it's worth it to the authors. Um, thank you. Um, okay, I'm... Yes, yes, about <laughs> Neo. These are stellar uh, leggings. This is actually a Hubble Space image, uh, Hubble Space Telescope image. I wasn't quite sure which one it was until I wore it to the American Astronomical Society meeting back in January. And um, I think it was Shinevia, one of my friends from grad school, points and goes, "My advisor took that picture." So this came from one of his, <laughs> one of his, uh, one of Bob O'Connell's science projects at UVA. So now I have to go back to University of Virginia and wear it around the department. So <laughs> got to get back to Charlottesville. So, so joining us shortly is going to be Stuart Robbins, who's coming in yet again. He's ready. Yeah. yeah, he is the lead scientist for both Mercury Mappers and Moon Mappers, and he'll be one of the team scientists on Mars Mappers, which is a project that will be coming up shortly. Its head scientist is Edward Keat, Kite. I'm not sure of the pronunciation. Stuart will correct me. Um, uh, a Princeton researcher, and we are going to be launching that probably in the next couple of months. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of how long does it take us to reduce all of the high-rise images we're going to ingest. Um, we're really looking forward to that. And here is Stuart. Stuart, welcome back to the 36-hour uh, hangout of thon and, and you are one of the people who has truly been with CosmoQuest to the begin from the beginning. I, and, and when I say this, I mean this quite literally because you and I uh, were working with folks at Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter who said, we will pay you money to do a, a moon mappers project. It wasn't called moon mappers, but they said a project to map the moon. And so we called it moon mappers because of simplicity in design. This was before Fraser and I had figured anything out. And you and I had been planning to start this new citizen science moon project that became the seed of, of CosmoQuest. So can you talk about the, the um, science that you dreamed of doing as we put together and all of the design decisions? Because you were one of the people that said no um, to many of our design ideas that helped us do the good design that we have today. I don't quite recall saying no so much to your design ideas, but more to the first project that we were working on because I mean, there, there was a lot of, um, I mean, there's, there's so many ways to design a citizen science portal. I mean, especially with something like craters. And to those who heard me waxing poetic yesterday, 
there's there's so much that you can do with craters, and you think that they're so simple. I mean, they're 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 a simple circle. I mean, how hard can it be to trace out a circle or to design a tool to trace out a circle? And yet, it turns out it's really hard to build something that's intuitive, that's simple, and yet we actually that that's actually useful. So, I mean, you and I, Pamela, were both working on a project where the interface was such that it started with a, a cookie cutter. So the tool was sort of like what I'm forming, you know, my index finger and my thumb, and you would click with that cookie cutter, and a lot of people didn't understand you were supposed to click and then drag it out to actually trace a circle. They thought you were just identifying the craters. And that was something that we pulled from these other projects and were like, okay, when we're designing CosmoQuest, when designing these interfaces for the, the Mappers projects, we need to make it simple, but we also have to force people to do a little bit more work. So that's why, for example, for any of you who have used these uh, the crater marking projects, uh, actually all of them are craters now, so any of the projects, that's why you don't get presented with a circle. You're presented with something that just point and click and you have to drag it out in order to make that circle. Another thing was this minimum size where if we design the minimum size to be too small there are too many craters on any given image and you're going to get tired and bored and say why am I doing this? Meanwhile if it's too big then it's you're doing one crater and then clicking with the next one and so there has to be this this happy medium of and we chose about 18 pixels to design this as the minimum size. And when it's 18 pixels, you get somewhere around 20 to 30 craters per image, but it varies considerably. So there were a lot of things that went into this design that you wouldn't think of until you work with an interface that doesn't actually get what you need to be what you need in order to get the data that you want to use in order to do the science. And so going into CosmoQuest, there was a lot of design stuff that we went through. And then there was the question of, what are we going to use this for? And really, the first project was a proving project, because yeah. no one had really done this to this extent before. There was a NASA ClickWorkers project, which tried to identify craters with crowdsourcing early on. I think, actually, ClickWorkers dates back to the late 90s. I thought it was the early aughts, but apparently it was the late 90s, where the interface was completely different. It was, you don't have any circle tool, you don't have any cookie cutter tool. It was, click a few points, maybe three points along the rim of a crater, and then you're done marking that crater. And the idea was, with a gajillion volunteers presented with the same image, you're going to get a lot of clicks on that rim, and from that kind of point cloud type thing, you're going to be able to fit a circle or an ellipse or something. So, People had worked with click workers, but it had sort of fallen by the wayside because people weren't getting useful data, and the people involved with it went on to do other things. And then there's the uh, the Zooniverse stuff has some crater stuff, uh, but they hadn't really published much on how good the crater markings were relative to what an expert in the field does, because a lot of stuff that we were hearing from feedback uh, when Pamela and I were both working with Zooniverse, and then when we were doing CosmoQuest was how am I doing? Because I don't want to spend time doing this if my markings aren't any good. Why can't I go back and change this? Why can't I fix what I'm doing? Why can't I go back and see how well I did compared with any given expert? And part of our answer to the last one was, well, the reason that you can't compare with an expert is because an expert hasn't done this yet. I mean, that's sort of the whole point of crowdsourcing the data gathering process so that the, the professional researchers can focus more on the science side while we... I hate to say pawn out, but uh, that's not quite, you know, distribute out the work to a lot of willing people. You know, I, the line that I like to give is there's, you know, at least in America, the average person watches several hours of television a week. For every hour of television, there's 15 minutes of commercials or so, and, well, that means that you can spend 15 minutes while watching television doing craters. I mean, that's 15 minutes times everyone in America. That's a lot of time that we can use to gather data. That's, you know, in, in one week, if every American were to do that, that would be more time than a single graduate student's career, probably. I haven't quite done the math, but the order of magnitude sounds about right. And in that time, we could get 600,000 markings or something like that. 
and get a lot of these data. But then, of course, we get back to that question of, is the data any good? And, and, it's, and I want to point out, we are the first, as near as I can tell, planetary science project to successfully be able to prove that our crater markings are uh, reputable to use, statistically valid to use, when compared side by side with professionals. And you're going to explain this. I just wanted to get the punchline up front. Yes. And the paper that we did was submitted a year and three months after we launched Moon Mappers. So it was a very quick turnaround. It just took a long time to get it through the referee process. So, so we have published showing that our design decisions led to science. And yeah. as near as I know, we are still the only project to successfully um, publish craters. Uh, so that, that is the punchline of my very lengthy story. I figured I'd come on late because you guys would be tired and just want someone else to talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> I so pizza from Nancy. So, <laughs> so I, I just messaged you in, the, in our chat the, uh, the link to the poster because LPSC lets us put the poster online. Uh, so if you want to send that out, uh, people can look at it. And this is actually uh, the, the science results the, of our work, the first paper to come out of this, showing that yes indeed, in in factual actuality, you guys can produce science that reaches the same level of accuracy as the experts to do. And so this question of, okay, how good are the volunteers relative to the experts? That is a question that we had to ask, and that's because you know it's not worth wasting your time, our time, server time, money, etc., if the data aren't any good. So we needed to know if the data were any good. Then the question was, okay, well, let's look at a bunch of experts, because while well, I've done craters, I've studied craters for a few years, my crater markings might be completely different from someone else's. And so what we did was look through the literature, and really the no one has really studied how well different crater researchers compare with each other for well, it's expensive and that, oh, that's yeah. the thing to put in yeah I mean no one's really done this for 40 years because it takes time and time means money in the research world because it's salary and then there's university or institute overhead so it's expensive and it takes time and we asked, so what, because no one had really studied this for 40 years and no one had looked at how different people compare in doing their craters when um, in doing in using different kinds of interfaces because the CosmoQuest interface is very simple. Professional researchers use a lot of different interfaces that go from very simple to very complicated. And no one had studied how we all did with this. So back must have been just a few months after we officially launched, Irene and Tenenko, the other co-lead and I came up with, or the science co-lead and I, came up with this idea of let's ask a dozen or so professional crater researchers to identify craters in the same little tiny patch of the lunar surface and see how we compare. And we asked about two dozen people, and besides myself and Irene, six agreed to do it. Uh, and two of those live uh, work in the same building as I, so I, ha I you know, basically roped them into doing it, and I kind of guilt-tripped them. So when Pamela says it's expensive, yeah, it's expensive, and it's hard to get people to do it because we're all so busy doing sci you know, other stuff or other projects. So what we did was we got eight people, me and Irene and then the six other researchers, to identify craters in one area of the moon near the Apollo 15 landing site, which is what CosmoQuest is using right now, the same image that actually everyone is calibrated to, so we have the most data on that area through CosmoQuest, and we had the experts do another region of the moon uh, that has craters of a different type, because if any of you have perused through not just one, but at least two or all three of the different mappers projects, you may have noticed that while craters, okay, again, they they're relatively a circle, but they look different. They, they still look different on each body and at different sizes. And so a crater isn't a crater isn't a crater. It, they're all, they all look different. So we looked at these two types of terrain. So we looked at these results, and basically um, I'm looking for visual aids around here. Um, 
Uh, do you want me to play one of your two videos? Um, sure. Okay. Let's which go one to. Do you want? It's going to take me a second to download, but which two of the two of them do you want? Um, let's do the short version because the short version goes through all of the uh, the, the 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 main basic results. So I just uh, posted that to you. Um, so the short. So what you're going to see is about a two and a half minute video uh, explaining this main result of our work, of this first paper. And I think the video explains it visually and perhaps audibly uh, better than I could do it on the fly at the moment without any visual aids around me. Uh, so a really well done video. Thank so you. I am going to have to play with my audio settings for a second in a way that is going to mean I cannot hear the video, but I've seen it several times, but I can he still hear you. Um, you won't be able to hear me. You have a choice of me or the video. And I'd rather you hear the video right now. So I'm going to go ahead. Right. Yeah, let's just play it from start to finish. Yeah, um, and I will do that as soon as I'm done switching my audio. Tech support. Okay, so while you're doing that, I'll just sort of... Ah, there we go. The moon is our nearest neighbor, and for over 400 years, ever since Galileo first turned his telescope upwards, we've been studying its features. One of the most numerous features are what we call impact craters, large holes formed when incoming objects smash into the surface. Over the years, many different people have cataloged craters on the moon, from early catalogs based on Earth-bound telescopes to more recent ones based on our latest lunar orbiting probes. One assumption in those catalogs is that any given researcher is going to identify the same craters, or at least do so with little variation from person to person. This was tested briefly in 1970 in a study tucked away inside of another paper, but the question was practically untouched until now. A new study is the first of its kind to examine how different, independent crater analysts will identify craters in a given region of the moon. This work had eight different expert analysts with five to over 50 years of experience, all studying the same region and looking for craters. What we found was that experts can vary in their numbers by up to a factor of about two. But what makes this study truly unique is that not only did we study how well professional researchers vary, but we also looked at minimally trained volunteers using CosmoQuest's Moon Mappers project. This project asks volunteers from around the world to identify craters and other features on the moon to help us do scientific research. This is the first paper to come out of this work, and what we found is that even though there is typically more variation from one volunteer to the next, the power of crowdsourcing means that the overall average of volunteers is within the range of experts. In fact, not only is it within the range of experts, but it's very close to the average of the eight professionals who also examined this region of the lunar surface. We've only just begun to tap the usefulness of crowdsourced feature markings through CosmoQuest's Moon Mappers, Asteroid Mappers, and Mercury Mappers portals. With this first study, we can now point to these projects and say that volunteers, as a group, mark these features just as well as professional researchers, meaning that we can use the power of the crowd to gather more data than we ever thought we could before. Okay, so can people hear me now? Maybe. Of course, I can't hear Pamela. Um, I will assume that people can hear me. So. What this video shows was basically our basic result with the idea being that we have to first classify how or we have to first show. Can people hear me? Yes, I can. I've heard you the entire time. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> so what this video shows was basically our basic result, this first result at we classified or we looked at how well the experts compared to each other. I'm going to interrupt for a moment because someone did maths. We now are sitting at exactly $22,000 in donations. Yay. Exactly. This is one of those things I screen capture. <laughs> okay. So thank you whoever did the maths to make us have a round number of donations. I will and 
keep donating. Yes. Um, you pay for <laughs> science when you do this. Yes. Okay. And that video was it, not sorry. paid for. That video was made by on a volunteer basis. <laughs> okay. So basically what the video was showing that experts, we had to first look at how well they compared. And that overall, you know, if I have my my sort of three experts represented by three colored markers, Sharpies, you know, when looking at the number of craters versus the size of craters, we all had sort of slightly different numbers and we had a range of values. But the average represented by this black pen of the experts was very close to the average of, let's use a different color, uh, eh, purple, uh, pink, was very close to the average of the volunteers, with the idea being that you have this envelope of values, on this range from the experts, and the average of the experts was very close to the average of the volunteers, and the average of the volunteers with, with, was within the range of the experts, meaning that any one of the eight of us who published or who did craters for this work could publish a paper with those crater counts or crater counts from another surface and nobody would question it. People would say, okay, well from this population of craters, this surface is this old or this means this. And what this work was showing was that varies by over a factor of two. And so there's this range for the experts but the volunteer data, you guys, the ensemble, when you, we use this power of the crowd with thousands of different people looking at these craters, that comes in within the range of the experts. And so that was the proving point for this project, that yes, yes indeed, you guys can actually reproduce the expert data. And as Pamela said, this is the first project to not only, or first crowdsourcing crater project, maybe even planetary science project, that not only produced a paper, but also really proved, really showed that volunteers can reproduce the expert data. And so that gets back to, I think, what either Nicole or Pamela or someone titled this section, like, am I, do, am I sciencing right or something like that? So because it gets back to this question from you guys that we see a lot on the forums and a lot in these other avenues of, well, how do I know if I'm getting the right answer? Is my data useful? Why am I doing this? And the answer is yes. Your data are useful. This is why we don't let you go back and fix it because it's you would spend too much time trying to make it perfect. And the whole point of crowdsourcing is that nobody is perfect. You're all, you all have your own individual biases and your own individual little differences, but that Overall, as an average, it produces useful science. And this is actually something that uh, when I presented this work at the Planetary Science Conference, uh, Lunar Planetary Science Conference in March of this year, a lot of people are coming up to the poster and say, sort of looking at it, and the people who were crater people were looking at it and be like, I agree, and that's why I'm not ever going to use this work, because it's it's disheartening for professional crater researchers who, as I said, can publish their crater counts and not think twice about it, it's disheartening for us to look at this and be like, oh, well, if I were to do crater counts one day and then do them a month later, I might get a different result by a factor of two, by 50%, by a third of a, you know, by 30%, by any amount, and that raises... Um, I don't want to say philosophical problems, but almost in a way it does raise philosophical problems. This is something that we discussed among the authors because yeah. there's this idea of you have a surface and almost certainly there is some sort of truth with a capital T. There are certain number, there's maybe a hundred craters on this surface, but they might be so overprinted, just craters forming on top of other craters as stuff strikes the surface, that I might see 70, Pamela might see 73, you might see 54, Irene might have seen 82, Clark Chapman, who's been in doing this since 1960s, might see 110, even though there are only 100. Uh, he, he found the most in this work, and we kind of be like, Clark, what's going on here? Uh, so. Making fun of him with love. 
Yeah, well, I mean, he actually he wants to have a meeting and go over <laughs> what that might have happened. So, but the the point is is that craters are treated in planetary science as a tool and not as much as a field of study. It's sort of like um, it's sort of like people using hammers. Yes, there are builders and there are carpenters who know exactly what kind of hammer you need for exactly this kind of application and exactly this kind of wood or this kind of metal or use this nail gun or whatever. And then there's the household person who is like, I get one hammer and I use that for everything. And it's it's the same with planetary science and craters where you have planetary scientists who are like the general homeowner or apartment renter or whatever who just get the one hammer and assume they know how to hammer in that nail, assume they know how to use craters. And then there are a very few of us who study the craters and really know it's not that simple. And then what we're also finding is not only that, but it's not even as as simple as we thought it was, it's it's even harder because there's this added uncertainty of from person to person, from person variation. And what we do a lot with craters, uh, for those who missed when I was on yesterday with Kelsey Singer, what we do a lot with craters is we study their populations. We get a bunch of craters, we have a crater population, and we use those to assign ages to a surface, where the, the basic idea is if you have a lot of craters, the surface has been around longer, so it's had time to accumulate those, whereas a surface that has a few craters was recently reset, recently reset, maybe it had a lava flow or something, and so it doesn't have a lot of craters. We can calibrate the number of craters given the radiometric ages from the Apollo sample returns and the Luna sample returns to get this chronology, and so we can say, well, if there are 10 craters this size and bigger, then it's 1 billion years old, and if there are 20 craters, then it's 3 billion years old, that kind of thing. So we use these crater populations to get ages a lot of the time and what we did in this work was we we sort of looked okay well if we were to use any of our crater counts to get ages using just the standard techniques to assign ages I'm, I'm slowly loading the results uh, from the region that uh, the experts did you could get an age from the person who got the fewest craters of 1.5 plus or minus 0.7 billion years and then from Clark Chapman, who found the most craters, he got an age of 3.2 plus or minus 0.8 billion years. And for those who are, you know, their ears glossed over hearing me say that, that's a difference of 1.7 billion years just based on the range, the variability of the experts. You know, again, any of us with 5 to over 50 years of experience would find this range and so it really raises significant questions when you hear someone say okay well this surface is this old and this surface is that old and this surface is that old this is why in science one of the cornerstones of science is repetition in order to whenever someone publishes something or gets a result another person has to go and repeat it and another person has to go and repeat it or replicate it and so while on Mars I mean Yay for the, the soon-to-be launch of Mars Mappers, which was announced yesterday when I was on. Um, on Mars, there are these valley networks that we think were these large outflow channels of when uh, water either raining down or seep, seeping in from the surrounding surface, uh, like you see in can canyonlands in Utah and the United States. So when water formed these, and you have one study that came out that says, yeah, these probably formed about 3.6 billion years ago, 3.6 to 3.8. And that that wouldn't actually mean anything in light of this latest work. But with those valley networks, because there are so many people who are interested in them, there are a dozen different papers that have used craters to date them, and they all come in at about the same age. And so then it's like, okay, we can trust this. This is more robust at this point. And so while this study raised important questions for a lone crater paper dating a single surface and that and those craters being you know the the answer what this also said isn't is not supposed to say is that you can't trust crater ages anymore because 
in a lot of cases, especially for key types of surfaces, important areas on various objects, there have been a lot of people studying these surfaces over and over again and redoing the crater counts. And from that, then it's actually probably a reasonably robust result at that point. But there's still this kind of variation, and that has to factor into the error bars. So even if we would like to say, and 50 people dated a surface to about 3.6 to 3.7 billion years, our error bars on that have to increase based on this work because people vary in their counts more than we thought they did. And, and, what and we what's, what's awesome about this, um, that was the most glorious, passionate, run-on series of awesome sentences of science glory. Um, it, the, the, the punchline to this is it starts to become this amazing ethical issue that I don't think we'd fully appreciated going into this. I, I think what we both kind of expected is there'd be some error between different individuals, but it wouldn't be huge. You could still have one person versus another person. And I think what both of us were hoping that we'd prove is if you get 15 random volunteers in CosmoQuest, their combined results would be as good as that single human. But now we're faced with this ethical dilemma of the combined results of the pros and the combined results of, of the amateurs are better than using just one pro. And we can't really afford to have multiple pros. And so citizen science is putting us in this uncomfortable reality of Ethically, it just might give us better science to rely on teams of volunteers than trying to write grants to afford teams of pros, and we need to stop writing single author, well, single crater counter papers without lots of caveats that haven't been written in the past. And the paper that, that the team wrote on this, I'm last author, um, my major contributions were helping to make things shorter. This is the single largest science paper I have ever been part of. It was it's only 20,000 words. It was how many thousands? 20,000 words. It's 20,000 words. So we're currently at $22,000 in donations. So when you factor in all of the captions and all of the on all of the referees, I, I suspect that we have a similar number of words in that paper as dollars donated. So you essentially donated $1 per word in the science article we wrote. And we all know authors who make a whole lot more than one dollar per word when they write. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, so I would like to take this point to Mark to point out we are still continuing to sit at twenty-two thousand dollars even in donations. Coming on in the next hour, we're going to have Chris and Caitlin from Planetary Resources, and we're going to continue our asteroid dialogue that has so far included uh, Jeff, Not Jeff Notkin yesterday, where we discussed meteorites impacting the planet Earth. Hello, world. Uh, rock meets planet, basically. Um, we had Hannah on earlier from OSIRIS-REx to talk about the data challenges of trying to understand just how to grab a sample and bring it back. And talking to the folks at Planetary Resources, we're going to go the next step further and start to talk about the technological challenges and the, the just general life as a business person challenges of trying to say, we're, we're going to an asteroid, and we're going to do more than just look around. Um, asteroids are awesome. The moon is the next thing we're likely to land on, um, I think. What's your take on that? Do you think it's going to be moon or asteroid for the next American manned landing? Uh, with people? I, yeah. you know, well, that's usually what men and women yeah. are when you talk <laughs> well, about the landing. I'm not even sure what the next mission is that we'll actually get a robot on. Um, it's really hard to say. I mean, the, the I think that the problem with the space exploration in general is that it takes longer than the lifetime of a congressional election cycle and even a presidential oh, yeah. administration to do it. And so each one has these interesting ideas that then get canceled by the next guy or gal and so I I choose not to speculate because I, I just figure I'll be disappointed <laughs> so, I, I don't know so, I think so I'm asking important. that same question of the folks from planetary resources that are coming in in the next segment 
Um, so so we're, we're looking forward to having Chris and Caitlin on. Um, that will, that we are currently in hour 33. Um, next hour is hour 34. During hour 35, I'm hoping that we will have a Corey back. Corey is our lead developer. He is the person who has rescued at least uh, one grad student and multiple postdocs in our battle against random data quandaries. Uh, the issues of where the heck is the sun supposed to be in this image. Um, he knows more about spherical geometry than I think all the rest of us combined, and it's awesome. But he's also our gaming expert. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to have Corey back, because in hour 35, we are going to be playing Kerbal Space live. I am so tired right now. <laughs> it's going to be hilarious. And neither of us have ever played Kerbal Space. Yes. So, so tweet the insanity if you want to come watch Pamela and Nicole play Kerbal Space live. Come back in hour 35, but get here early for hour 34 to talk about mining asteroids. Hour 36 is Cards Against Astronomy. I know this is what you've been working on in the background. So. Yeah, so you can actually go to cardsagainstastronomy.com, and that will redirect you to where we posted uh, the version of the game that uh, Nancy Graziano helped us last year with the formatting. All of you guys, we started it during the Hangout-a-thon, and we continued for a couple months later uh, collecting and, and crowdsourcing uh, entries for the game. Uh, uh, we did some play testing at Science Online recently, um, where there's also a Cards Against Science game. So go to cardsagainstscience.com to see their game, and they're the ones who inspired me to reformat it so you can put that on index cards. So we don't have that finished yet. I would love it if people would help me do that. If we each took one page of the existing PDF and converted it to the new format, we could get it done in a day easy. And not a full day, I mean like just a couple hours instead of me spending several days reformatting <laughs> this game. Uh, so uh, I look to that in the future. Uh, I will be asking for help reformatting the game so that you guys can print it on actual index cards and really play the game and not miss any people's squares. Uh, so we're going to play Cards Against Astronomy in the last hour, um, and so we'll have the game up. I, I know Corey will be here. Uh, some of the some of the the Bruce's want to join. Oh, hangout. that's cool. So some of the uh, people that you've seen throughout the hangout things. There's a group of us that informally chat offline about all the geeky things. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna send them that link, and uh, they can come and, and watch us while we play Cards Against Astronomy for the last hour. And uh, again, yeah, share it out. Uh, tell the Kerbal Space people that we're playing the game. So it's yeah, basically you either get to watch us fail at Kerbal, or you get, or if you're in our time zone, you can watch Cosmos. I think watching us fail at Kerbal live and then catching Cosmos on Hulu is, is the better choice personally, just because you can't miss live hilarity. <laughs> so that's what's coming up. Um, it's a, I, just, uh, I just fixed the schedule page. It said we were starting Space Games in the next hour, but we are pushing that back so that we can talk to people from planetary uh, resources to talk about asteroids. Um, so the Space Games will be in the last two hours. All the silliness will be unleashed. Uh, whatever little silliness I have left in my, in my tiny postdoc body. So. And then you get to go to sleep. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Um, there was a question by um, Mitchy Henning, mm -hmm. um, who uh, sorry if that's not the way to pronounce it. Um, do you have any problems with deliberately wrong markings in the crater stuff? And the actually, I think Nicole might be better able to answer that question than I am because she actually looks over people's shoulders sometimes while they mark craters. But from the data end, from my end, the thing is, is that. What we do is uh, we take all of the data that uh, you guys have marked, all the craters, all of these circles. Uh, we have a location and a diameter, and we overlay it all, and we just put it in a list. And then uh, one of Pamela's graduate students from, I think, a year or two ago wrote this code that clusters them. So we don't have to do it manually. And so that means that we can set these thresholds for how close the markings have to be not only near each other, like the location-wise, but also size-wise. And so if there's one person who's just going in for some reason wasting their time and drawing random circles, it's not going to matter because 
the whole point is that it's when at least half of you is what we set the threshold to be. So when at least uh, seven out of the 15 or so, seven or eight of the 15 have marked the same feature of roughly the same size, that's when it counts. And that's when we record it into our final catalog. Uh, but otherwise, Nicole, uh, you're sort of in that direction on my screen. So I'll, Nicole, uh, have you had any issues about that, seen any issues of that? Not too much. So, so like we talked about in our super secret special video premium content that you will get if you participate in our survey, <laughs> it'll be free, but you have to participate in our survey. Um, I do uh, get to watch a lot of people try CosmoQuest for the first time since we do the guerrilla science outreach at different events, and I have the laptop with me. I do it. Like I said I, I do it around. I do it locally as much as I can because that's free. I just show up at the event and do it, uh, but I also do it at all the events we travel to. So I do see a lot of people uh, start, and, and finding the craters, I don't think we have so much people marking things that aren't craters. I think that's probably, there's a much lower incidence of that. It's it's much less, um, what I ran into first starting is not seeing the faint craters, which you really helped me with, and which uh, the two yeah. chapters you wrote really helps helps with. Um, so it's not seeing the faint craters that is, is, is a stumbling block for a lot of people. Uh, but yeah, people will not miss, they will not mark random things that aren't craters so much, even when I don't give them much direction. Uh, it's really getting the size right that is the, the first the first barrier. Finding the craters they can do, it's getting the size of the circle just right, uh, especially depending on your trackpad or mouse that you're comfortable with. And, and we are now at $22,300. Oh. And I'm going to go try and find where we abandoned the Cards Against Astronomy game down in my living room somewhere. Somewhere. And I need to step away. Yeah, I need to step away from the fruit because I've been binge eating fruit the entire weekend in scary amounts. You know what's funny is I have not been tracking my food in my fitness pal like I usually do, but someone could probably do it for me if they. <laughs> well, I can do it. Fast forward and see what I ate. Anyway, uh, you can tell me what I ate. I don't really care. <laughs> so okay, so yes, yeah, so I hope that answers your question, Michi. Yes. Uh, doing things completely. Uh, completely off will not actually make Twitter effect. And Pamela just handed me this because I have been screen over this. So Tiny Intern has been has been making more art over there. I don't know if we're going to allow this to be a gift or if I'm just going <laughs> to buy it from her because <laughs> she made a Cosmo Quest My Little Pony. She just sat there and freaking painted this. What? Um, so you should I auction it off at the end of this. I don't, uh, yeah, so we've been doing uh, different things as gifts um, for different hours, uh, different segments. I, I don't know, I may, I may just <laughs> buy it from her because <laughs> I love ponies. And it's a Cosmo Quest pony, so, and I think I scared Stuart. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so uh, Nancy uh, Gra Graciano, is that how Pamela's pronouncing her last name? Nancy uh, Graciano! Yeah, she mentioned uh, she sees a copy of Carl Sagan's Cosmos on the bookshelf directly behind my head, yes. Cosmos. Yay. The late great Carl uh, if I can there we go. No late great Carl Sagan. Yay. Um, Actually there are several Carl so there are like five no, four Carl Sagan books up here, but one uh plus uh one duplicate. Do you have Demon Hunter World? No. Oh that's my I personal, should get it. That's my personal favorite. Demon Hunter World. Um so we so uh Pamela's looking for the cards Against astronomy, uh, I will do one more donation update. I think it's probably still at let's see, um, twenty-two thousand three hundred. We had another uh, possible gift. I'm looking at my boyfriend. You want to bring him over? <laughs> so we've been we've been making these references to Pamela dyeing her hair, and although this may not happen from the hangoutathon, we'll see where we get with the reach goals for the thirty-six days. Uh, but my uh, boyfriend makes crafty things sometimes, and get close to the camera. He made uh, some dragon eggs. There you go. Uh, Khaleesi's actual, uh, well, dragon eggs uh, that he made, and so they're actually the colors that are described in the book. Uh, it took him many, 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 many hours <laughs> to make these. Probably about a week of unemployment. Yes, this is, this is when he was, uh, he moved, okay, so... The story of the nomadic academic, um, 
I, I move out here for to work with CosmoQuest, and uh, Timothy comes out to join me and has to go through the job search. Uh, he has the uh, special, unfortunate privilege of dating an academic and, and having to be nomadic with me. Yeah. Uh, so he, there was some time of unemployment during which he made dragon eggs. That was like a good, a good straight week of work. Pretty much. I mean, a lot of it was waiting for the paint to dry <laughs> <laughs> and letting my hands stop cramping and putting in all the scales. <laughs> but. But they're amazing, and he's taken these to various cons, gotten various cosplay policies to take pictures with it. Uh, if we, if if we ever get Pamela to dye her hair blonde, she'll have to take a picture with these eggs. But you were going to offer these. Yes, as as a gift to a donator. I didn't know what amount. So what um, do you want the minimum amount to be? I don't know. <laughs> so do you think for a hundred dollar donation? Okay, more than that. Okay, more than that. I, I listen. I take my advice from Dawn. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. You're doing all three eggs. All three. He's gonna let go of all three eggs. I know. Same <laughs> person. Yeah. Two hundred. So for a minimum two hundred dollar donation, uh, the the next. How about the next one to do a minimum two hundred dollar donation? Uh, so we're at twenty-two thousand three hundred now. Um, put in a minimum two hundred dollar donation and say "dragon eggs" in the comments. Uh, you will get these beautiful handmade <laughs> mother. Of, I know, I know, I know. This is like for him. To, hair this is <laughs> no, he's done that. <laughs> I saw his quarter life crisis. We don't need to go there. <laughs> but, so yes, these 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 eggs which he's he's spent he he's the father of these dragon eggs and has spent time making them and nurturing them yeah. and has uh, very graciously decided to, to I will donate them. Donate them to the cause. For a good cause. The cause of, of making sure you I have a house <laughs> that we continue to pay rent and groceries. <laughs> so uh, so that's the, the current thing. So the minimum two hundred dollar donation, dragon <laughs> eggs, say that in the comments, or dragons just Dragons, something dragons. Um, that'll uh, that'll be it. So we're gonna we should put those on display back here and and keep remove running. the honey. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. the squirrels would you know, mess with them. Yeah, they would probably eat them. Yeah, they would eat them. So there's the dragon eggs. Um, and it's, and uh, actually on the Pinterest board we're doing uh, sciency art projects. I, I did include the picture of those when they were in development. Hopefully you'll write up some instructions. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe write up some instructions. Um, so that's totally dragon eggs are not necessarily science, um, but uh, this goes along with some of the art stuff we've done, we've showcased in this hangout of on um, the interesting, fun things that you can do with art and science and imagination. Uh, so there you go, you Game of Thrones fans. Uh, I know you, you can switch over to Game of Thrones tonight after. The hangout of fun. After donating two hundred dollars and getting a set of dragon eggs. Yes, so we will we will uh, Tim will be graciously donating those. I will be paying for the postage to make sure you get them. So uh, that's our, our, our gift from what? Okay. So that's our, that's 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 the gift from, from our apartment to you guys. Um, so yeah. Uh, we have uh, some more time left. Um, Stuart, is there more I I was kind of out of it a little while ago. It's just like, now there's science happening, I'm leaving. <laughs> uh, I, I thought I could talk maybe uh, briefly about what we're... So we have this one project done, sort of where we're headed with new yeah. mappers. Um, so... There's still a lot that can be done with moon mappers in terms of just studying how we mark craters and how we uh, how we can't mark craters. So some people who have been looking at the moon mappers images lately have been like, well, this area sucks. Like it's just it's hard to mark craters here. I can't see craters. It looks like there are no shadows here. And the reason for that is that, and, and this is uh, something that you might hear if you see a super secret special video uh, I was telling Nicole earlier, um, th this gets a little bit to we're trying to see how badly you mark craters. And that sounds bad, but let me explain. Um, we want to see how 
well you mark craters are under ideal circumstances. So I don't have a flashlight in here, so I can't do my, my great demos, but under ideal lighting additions, it's when the sun is maybe at a, equivalent to like the five o'clock position. Like it's the sun is kind of low on the horizon, and so you see nice shadows. And craters, because they're topographic features, really pop out at you. It's those shadows that you use in order to see them. The problem is, is that in a lot of cases, we don't have those ideal lighting conditions. At the Apollo landing sites, which is where you guys are looking, guys and gals and other are looking now, we have a ton of images. Well, not a ton, because there's no weight to them. We have a lot of images dozens of images of these sites at all sorts of sun angles all over the place. It's great. Other areas on the moon, not so much. And then you have things like just these flyby missions, like the Voyagers and the Pioneer missions to the outer solar system. They're just these flyby things except for Galileo and for uh, Cassini. But even in those cases of the moons of these outer solar system planets like uh, Ganymede, uh, Titan, Titan's a bad example, uh, Enceladus, Mimas, or Mimas, all of these moons, we don't have the kind of mapping missions that we have in orbit around the moon, in orbit around Mars, and now in orbit around Mercury. I mean, even just five years ago, we didn't have this kind of imagery for Mercury either. We were limited to sun angles from the sun at the horizon to the sun going straight down and getting no shadows whatsoever. And so what we are doing now, what we're studying now, and we might actually be able to start working on the paper later this year, is we're trying to see how well we identify craters under ideal circumstances and how poorly we identify craters under bad circumstances, bad sun angles, so that we can start to perhaps model what we're limited to in the outer solar system on these flyby missions when we don't have these kinds of ideal circumstances. Is it a case where if the sun is at 30 degrees from straight down that you can only see half of the craters? And maybe when it's 20 degrees you can only see 30% of the craters? Or is it that when it's at 40 degrees you're limited to you can only see 10% of the craters. This hasn't really been studied before that much. I mean, a few people have written a few papers here and there, but the reason that it hasn't been studied a lot is because it's sort of like with this paper. People are kind of nervous to say that their studies have been limited in the past, and it kind of requires a lot of craters and a lot of craters being done in the same area of the planetary body and it requires this kind of repeat imagery, which we really haven't had much before about maybe 15 years ago or so with Mars and the last 10 years with the Moon. And so what we're looking for now to study with uh, the Moon Mappers Project and CosmoQuest is to see how we vary with sun angle in order to see if we can start to model how much we're missing in the outer solar system or on other objects with these kinds of flyby missions. Um, on Mercury, so there's the Mercury Mappers portal up now too. We haven't talked about that science at all yet. Uh, that is much more of a mapping mission uh, or a mapping project on CosmoQuest. We're trying to map out the craters in various areas of the planet to study something that we talked about yesterday, secondary craters. Secondary craters form when you have this object striking a planet that's a primary crater, and then stuff spatters out. This ejecta spatters out, and it forms, it can form these, um, these secondary events, these secondary craters. And so what we're trying to do is study how these secondary craters form on Mercury, because all the data so far has shown well, you know, they're not that huge of an issue, perhaps, on uh, on the moon. They're not really maybe a big issue on Mars when you're talking about kilometer-scale craters or larger. They're an issue on Mercury. They might start to dominate at sizes of 10 kilometers, which is really big. And so when you look at the Mercury mappers' images, you might see that there's this big crater or part of a big crater, and then just radiating from it are just these troughs or these chains or these streamers of little teeny tiny other craters. Some of them might be big enough to mark that 18 pixels we talked about 40 minutes ago or so, but some of them, probably most of them aren't. And so that's why we're asking you to mark them as an interesting feature, as a crater chain. 
because that then identifies it in the database, identifies that area, and then we can use those to study those features uh, when we want to do the analysis for Mercury Mappers for this more of a mapping type project than rather than this specific targeted question of science for uh, for the moon stuff. So I mean, they're really you might think uh, again this gets back to you might think a crater is a crater is a crater. It's not. There's a lot of different things you can do with craters. A gajillion different kinds of studies you can do with craters. Some of them with different sizes of craters. You can do one kind of study with one size, another kind with another size. And that's why even though we have three projects up where we ask you to identify craters and soon to be a fourth for Mars, you're still doing completely different science with the same kinds of features on these bodies because there are different science questions that we're asking. So, so, so I have to interrupt the science. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's okay, I reached a stopping point. Yeah, I, I waited patiently. So the reason Nicole stood up was to go break it to her significant other that we got the $200, someone's getting the right thing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and I went over and thanked him because I know it was like difficult parting with them. Well, when I came up the stairs, he was like, if no one donates the $200, I get to keep my dragon eggs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they went. They're gone. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Aww. So, so <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> we are now we shipping somebody sitting at 22500 dollars in donations. Uh, with we are now coming up on 7 p.m. So with uh, three hours. And thank yes. you. You may have finally convinced him to start opening an Etsy store or something. <laughs> I've been trying to get him to do that for a long time. <laughs> oh, we need to get him, Joe, and Lindsay working together. I think they should start a joint it's a, yeah an Etsy store. So we have three hours to go left in the hangout of fun. I can see Planetary Resources is getting ready for for Chris L of the to, Planetary Resources. It has an overabundance of Chris's. Um, so Chris L, who is one of their founders and their, I believe their president or executive director, I'm having a moment of spacing on the, the title that they use for the top position. He and Caitlin are going to be coming on in just a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, then we're going to go into one hour of playing Kerbal Space while sleep deprived. Corey's coming back. Corey, our beloved Corey, who actually knows how to play games. Um, and then our final hour, I have two bottles of prosciutto, which is, in my opinion, better than champagne, in the refrigerator Sweet. to celebrate as we close in on our final hour while playing cards against astronomy. Now, in the process of walking down to my living room to find where we left cards against astronomy, I found two things of interest. One was I found a, I found a photo set that Tiny Intern made in my living room to do her prom pictures, because Tiny Intern yesterday was here working until the absolute last possible second on Hangout-a-thon stuff, and then got ready in, in my house to go to prom turned my living room into a photo studio, which is totally awesome. You put that back, I promise. <laughs> she just said, I'll put that back, I promise. Um, and, and I'm sure she will. I'm just highly amused because I wasn't... Ex prom picture. Okay, I'm being told I have to bring the prom oh. pictures back because <laughs> her prom picture rocked. Um, and so in addition to the prom picture, which I am about to share with all of you, um, so that you can see the awesome that is so Tiny Intern. Um, this is our awesome, she was in the Journalism State Finals for her high school team. She's a writer, she's a graphics person, we've shown you the paintings, and she rocked prom. Um, so, so Tiny Intern was here working on the hangout of fun until the 11th hour, and then she fled, and she promed, and she came back here, and she crashed for a little while. And now she is back, and she is doing art. And the second thing I found in my living room is while I found all of the filled out cards for Cards Against Astronomy, I discovered that we had one entire blank white sheet and one entire blank, one entire blank black sheet. Um, so if you have additional things that you think we should add to our deck of Cards Against Astronomy, 
tweet them at us? Uh, sure. So tweet them <laughs> at CosmoQuestX, hashtag cards against. Let's just leave it at that. Apologies, whoever's currently using humaning the Twitter feed for us. Yeah. Because <laughs> so, like, somebody's been tweeting and that's been me. <laughs> so at tweet CosmoQuestX, use like pound cards, something so that we know that the random statement that's part of your tweet, and you can do one of two, two of two, and get it all in there. Uh, tweet it at us, and we will add that into our deck with our one blank sheet of white and one blank sheet hashtag of cards. Hashtag yeah, hashtag, hashtag cards. cards. That way you can fit more of your statements. Um, can I say three things before I head out in two minutes? Yeah. Um, okay, so Michael Jobin, Jobin uh, mentioned, hey, I got it on another tab. As one is watching this marathon, one could be moon mapping now. Yay. I agree. <laughs> yes. Um, Large monitors. <laughs> and then there was another person, um, Felker. Uh, <laughs> <Falcon laughs> <Yale. Corona. laughs> Him. Um, yeah, he raised the same question I had. Um, is oh, it right, right, a kind right. of Italian ham? Oh, to me. <laughs> Prosciutto. Yeah. Oh. Prosciutto, not prosciutto. I thought you like said the, prosciutto. One is ham. The other is sparkling white wine. I was very confused. I'm like, are you gonna like put it in a blender? Prosecco. And... Prosecco. Okay. <laughs> prosciutto and prosecco should not probably be mixed. No. But prosciutto and melon is actually surprisingly good. Although I may have made it all. Like a year's supply of melon today. <laughs> uh, I want to. Uh, uh, there's also a comment from. There's also a comment from Guido Bibra. Uh, I was just marking craters too. He looked up at the big screen where the hangout is running when I was doing the marking and tried to mark a crater in the video. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see a picture of the moon, I stand there and I want to make a circle. So I get it. I totally get you. I see craters from going to sleep. Uh, yeah. There is also uh, Jim Meeker who wrote that he always wants to want uh, to. Whoops! Uh, just scrolled away. Uh, yeah. He always wants to mark craters that are smaller than the minimum size threshold. And I understand that issue. Uh, you know, I, I run across it as well. Uh, there's a reason why there's a minimum size threshold. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before. One reason is just if there were a smaller minimum size threshold or no minimum size threshold, there would just be too many craters in any one image. And another reason is that that, that minimum threshold, at least for the moon mappers, is 10 meters equivalent on the images that we're using. And anything smaller than that, you get to a point where it's just not that useful. And another issue is that anything smaller than roughly 15 to 20-ish pixels uh, on the screen, and then you run into an issue of you're just not going to be accurate enough. You're going to spend much longer on every crater in order to get the same kind of relative accuracy that you can get on a much larger crater. And so not only are there going to be more craters, but you're going to spend more time per crater in order to mark those. And we just decided it's not worth it. Uh, th those smaller craters can be done by us later on, or we may give you images where we've used uh, sophisticated software, aka Photoshop, to blow them up in size and give you parts of those and still limit you to 18 pixels, but it'll be 18 pixels on a larger image. And in fact, that's how we have the images in there now, is that we have them at native resolution, we have them at a reduction of a factor of three, and a reduction of another factor of three. So that means that even if you're marking on one image, something that's 18 pixels, on another image it might be, if I do quick math, six, uh, 54 pixels across. So even though, and, and I totally understand, but and experts keep going down farther and farther and we just, we lose accuracy and we take too much time and so that's why we have that limited size. Uh, and with that said, I'm guessing you guys have a, another guest coming in now that it's uh, 7.02. So, so we have Chris and Caitlin from Planetary Resources are in the process of getting ready. Um, so I have one final question for you before you disappear. Okay. One of the, the neat things that, that we've been looking at is inclination angle and, and how 
our ability to mark craters varies with sun angle. And one of the things we discussed, um, so there's two ways that you have to deal with sun angle. There's the sun angle as it approaches zenith, and then there's the sun angle as it casts shadows in your image. And there's this wonderful hill versus uh, crater illusion that you end up if you have the sun in the wrong place. Can you discuss the crater hill illusion just ever so briefly? Yeah, the human brain sucks, basically. <laughs> uh, I, it, it's great, but it sucks. Uh, you, you have this issue where you can have a perfectly round object, and depending on if you cast, if you're lighting it from the top or, or from up or from down or, or whatever on the screen, it can look like a hill or it can look like a cavity. And without any other information, it's really hard to tell what's going on. And this is why, and this actually um, gets to some uh, UFO related type stuff on other planets. Like there was this uh, thing on UFO sightings daily last summer where this guy thought he found a crashed alien spaceship. And you know it's like this this bulgy object, and it looked kind of weird. And fortunately, he did it from Google Mars, and so I was able to find the coordinates, look at it, and look at the craters around it, and be like, I know that those craters are negative relief features. I know they go into the ground. That means the sun is coming from over here. That means that this feature is also a negative relief feature. It is not a pos It is not a spaceship. It is not, you know, and that gets to the same thing. Like it's this whole context kind of stuff. And if you're looking at these things and it looks like a hill to you, uh, try to retrain your brain. Uh, otherwise, you can go into usually some sort of system settings on pretty much any operating system and invert the colors, and that will, that should fix it for you. you should, if it's a right hill before, it should now look like a crater. Our frequently asked questions uh, page off the main science pages tell you how to do that for various operating systems. So <laughs> you can always find it. <laughs> if you're, like I was actually, uh, when I was mapping before, things were inverting for me because I'm just so tired. <laughs> so it's definitely useful. Yeah, well, and it, I, I've used, uh, so my th I didn't mention it this hour. My thesis work was identifying about 650,000 craters on Mars, drawing, you know, tracing circles, and I used these global mosaics of the planet, and some of them switch sun angle. And I'm using um, LROC, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Mosaics for the Moon right now for other work, and there are some, air like, especially at plus or minus 90 degrees longitude, it switches sun angle on you. And so anything that was positive relief before is now negative, and that was negative relief before is now positive. And sometimes, like, I'm in the middle of a crater, and there is a stripe where the sun is from the opposite side. And I'm like, okay, on these edges, I know the crater goes down, but in the middle, it looks like it goes up. And it's... <sighs> ah. And this Lighting. is why we love Corey, because Corey can do things with three-dimensional geometry that the rest of us can't. Um, and he will be coming back, uh, not in the next hour, that's when we have planetary resources, folks, but in the hour after that, we're going to have Corey and we're going to play Kerbal Space, because his abilities at three-dimensional geometry um, extend to his abilities to play games, and he's just creative and awesome in so many different directions, and is at the end of the day the one who stares at all of the mission headers and eventually figures out how to make sense of them. Um, so, so I would like to share, unless the number has just updated, um, we're slowly creeping our way towards uh, 23,000, and we're inviting in our planetary resources people. Uh, so we're going to be joined by Chris Lewiski, who's president and chief engineer, as well as Caitlin, uh, who's from the marketing department. Um, I'm trying to type and speak simultaneously, and apparently I'm not <laughs> good at that. You are, just not when you're sleep deprived. <laughs> I'm actually feeling so much better than really? the time last year. Yes, that's true. <laughs> this, and and Dawn, who is melting in the corner, who's the business manager of the STEM center that we work in at Southern Illinois, uh, when I said that, she responded, you're welcome. She is the fruit supplier. If I gain five pounds this weekend, I am thankful to her and bitter simultaneously because there has been fruit left behind me the entirety of the weekend. And everyone who works with me at the STEM Center knows 
I'm not to be allowed near the fruit. I eat all fruit I am allowed near. So, so uh, I have eaten, I have, I have caused a devastating amount of fruit to be consumed this weekend. <laughs> Caitlin, you just came in at the most fabulous moment to pop in. I did. Then I was sure goodbye. <laughs> Nicole will be right back. Um, welcome. Hi, Pamela. <laughs> How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well as well. Um, welcome to our 36-hour hangoutathon that's kicking off our 3636 36 fundraiser for CosmoQuest. We have you here because one of the themes that we have woven through the entirety of the weekend is rocks in space, basically. All right. Are my favorite um, subject. <laughs> it's one of your favorite subjects, and, and CosmoQuest is all about the rocks in space. We are mapping the craters on the moon and Mercury. We announced yesterday that we are going to be working with a new team uh, led by Edwin Kite, or Kit, I'm not actually sure, mispronouncing names is my specialty, uh, who's a researcher at Princeton. Um, all these craters that we're mapping, a lot of the geological formations that we're mapping were created by asteroids, large and small, deciding to go, hello world, and then hitting the world with great amounts of energy. Uh, we had so Jeff it, it, It's the rocks or the uh, the effects caused by the rocks that it sounds like then? It's, it's kind of the energy imparted by the rock as it ceases to be a rock. It becomes a former rock. It is a rock no more. I can't put Monty Python at this point. <laughs> um, but, but it's that impact of the rocks that it's creates... <laughs> Sorry, tiny intern is making regolith jokes. Um, and, and then we had Jeff Notkin in who talked about meteorites here on Earth that are former asteroids that have passed through becoming shooting stars and then rains down on usually some farmer's field, some desert, some part of Antarctica. We had Hannah Tackery on who is part of OSIRIS-REx talking about the challenges of uh, asteroid Bennu which they're going to have to map rapidly to find um, a sample to bring back and talking to you guys seemed to be the natural conclusion because as we go from seeing the impacts and that was punnier than intended of asteroids on rocky bodies to seeing them here on earth to trying to use them for science you guys are taking it the next step and I'm going to let you guys tell your own punchline so, so Chris can you tell me what planetary resources is all about well, absolutely. So, uh, uh, congratulations on getting to I think it's the 34th hour in the 36 hour hangathon. Yes. Hangoutathon, and uh, I'm told you've slept some. We, <clears throat> Nicole and I have taken have taken turns. <laughs> uh, so, like a good marathon, then. So, yeah, uh, certainly all the subjects you talked about uh, from asteroids are near and dear uh, to our hearts. Uh, just uh, for everyone uh, who has been watching, uh, quick introductions, I guess. My name is uh, Chris Lewicki. I'm president and the chief asteroid miner uh, here at Planetary Resources. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer by training. I spent a little bit of time with NASA uh, building and running rovers to Mars and doing things like that. And now, as you mentioned, we're uh, going out and uh, would like to develop the resources of space, and particularly the asteroids. And I'm joined today by Caitlin O'Keefe, and uh, I'll let Caitlin give uh, her brief intro as a member of our team. Yeah, hi, I'm Caitlin O'Keefe, and I am the Director of Marketing and also the Community Foreman at Planetary Resources, and, and I am in charge of everything that has to do with marketing and also all of our crowd and community initiatives. So I joined the company in January, and for the past few months we've been focusing on um, uh, our Kickstarter, kind of the fallout from our Kickstarter program, um, and creating some new crowd initiatives that are coming down the pipeline this year. So it's going to be a really cool year for us at Planetary. I'm really excited. And yeah, so, go ahead, Pamela. And and you were someone to so Chris who's gone from uh, working on teams that built the rovers that refused to die on Mars. You worked still, on Mars. Yes, still. Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. Spirit uh, eventually didn't die because the rover broke. It just got stuck at an awkward angle in a sand dune, which is probably the most embarrassing way for a robot to die. <laughs> um, Opportunity is still working. You worked with, with Mars Phoenix, which did everything it was intended to do. Um, and now you guys are, are like us, turning to the public and saying, we want to do more. We want to go further than NASA funding and what Congress gives NASA currently allows us to do. 
you had a very successful Kickstarter. We are very envious at a public state university in Illinois. We can't quite use Kickstarter. Um, you guys are, are really kind of people that we look up to for what you're doing. Share. We want yeah, well, to yeah, well, thanks. So I'll, I think, you know, in the next hour, we'll probably hit on all sorts of subjects. Um, but for me, you know, being a, a lifelong space fanatic, I think the one that kind of ties it all together and, and uh, uh, maybe is a good bridge from my last mission with NASA, Mars Phoenix, where we were looking for the water uh, near the North Pole of Mars above the Arctic Circle. Um, that actually is the very same thing that we're focused on today at Planetary Resources. Um, our, our overarching mission and our, our vision really for the future of activity in space is really to open space up by turning it into an economic engine and an economic incentive. Everything that we've really done as a species, everything that we've gone into moving into the corners of this planet, really has been motivated at some time or another by someone either pursuing a resource uh, because they thought that it was worth a lot of money or it would uh, you know, improve their standard of living or enable their environment, uh, or in other ways because uh, those resources allowed them to live in those, those new environments and those new frontiers. And of course we have it a little bit easy here on Earth. We have the, the air around us most places that we can breathe. Uh, we find water most places and uh, we have the benefit of, uh, of uh, foliage and fauna and, and all those things to kind of keep us living. Space is a little bit more difficult, but uh, we're at a point in history now where technology actually allows us to, to overcome those things. And for the past 50 years, we've been sending robots and people out into the space environment, learning more and more about it. And those 50 years of space exploration really have paved the way to allow just pieces and, and portions of it to be something that uh, maybe private individuals, private entities, businesses, nonprofits actually can start to do for themselves. So what we're doing at Planetary Resources is uh, prospecting and exploring for resources on asteroids. And our near-term interest uh, in resources is really water. Uh, water in the form of ices and hydrated minerals on carbonaceous chondrites, uh, water that can be used, uh, of course, for everything that it uses to support life. Uh, but in space, of course, water takes on a few more dimensions than we might be used to here on Earth. We can use it for radiation shielding if we have a, of enough of it. Uh, and we also can use it for rocket fuel, one of the most important things uh, really in space uh, that we can have for really extending our presence is to be able to fuel up those empty spaceships and send them even farther uh, instead of just throwing them out when we're done, which is what we've been doing for 50 years. And, and this actually speaks to a common misconception. Most of the time when you talk to people about mining asteroids, they're like, oh, you're mining them for, for what I love is when people say you're mining them for steel, because you don't actually mine steel. It's a composite metal. Um, but you're, a lot of people are under the, the misnotion that when we talk about mining asteroids, people are going out and they're planning to dig up plutonium, gold, tin, all these different metals and build spacecraft out of the metals that are getting mined out of asteroids. And the reality is there's very little metal in the asteroid belt. And there's maybe, like, if we get lucky, one asteroid that's ferrous enough to make it worth shredding for its metal content. It's all these other things that starts to make them useful as things to go out, grab, and dig in. And how, how do you go about convincing people of the realities of the asteroid belt. Well, and it actually uh, kind of comes from a variety of sources. Um, there actually is a lot of metal out in space, uh, but it's not something we'd ever bring back here to Earth. And a lot of people are familiar, you know, Jeff probably showed you uh, his collection uh, of meteorites that he has. This is one very large, uh, it's actually, I don't know, I think this is about a, a four kilogram meteorite. It's pretty heavy. You could do curls with it. Uh, and if you slice these things open, I've got another one uh, that looks like this. Uh, this is what people are kind of used to seeing in museums. This is what you find when you go out with a metal detector looking for meteorites. Of course, these are the things that naturally make it through the atmosphere the easiest. And that's impressions that a lot of people have of objects in space and, and meteorites. Um, but the other ones, uh, the carbonaceous meteorites, now this one is a 
a little bit harder to see. Uh, this is from the, uh, put their logo right side up there, the Southwest Meteorite Lab, uh, Marvin and Kitty Kilgore in, um, in uh, southern Arizona. Uh, but this is essentially the star stuff that uh, really Carl Sagan talks about and now Neil deGrasse Tyson. This is a carbonaceous chondrite, and uh, its average composition is a lot like the average composition of the sun. Um, a lot of uh, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon. Uh, also, there's a bit of metal fraction in there and silicates and, and other things. Um, but when you think about what will be the thing that we'll be able to start with, what will be the thing that will be easiest to mine, so to speak, uh, it's really that thing that's going to enable us to continue to explore space, and those are the volatiles. Uh, whether it's uh, volatiles from asteroids for fuel depots, for human consumption, and for allowing us to survive in space, uh, or maybe like the Phoenix mission on the surface of Mars, uh, digging up volatiles in future places that we plan on visiting or settling, whether that's uh, the poles of the moon, Mercury, Enceladus, uh, the North Pole of Mars. Uh, we're really just finding water everywhere that we look in the solar system. And the when, Pamela, you talked about, um, you know, I guess, kind of educating and, and uh, making people realize the opportunity. The, we have water, of course, everywhere on this planet. Uh, most of it's salt water, and there's uh, a lot of it locked up in the glaciers and just a little bit of fresh water. But to take uh, a cubic meter, uh, one ton of water, and ship it to the International Space Station uh, is something that costs tens of millions of dollars. And to ship it on its way to Mars, for example, to deep space, is a $50 million a ton proposition. And the space station consumes four to six tons of water uh, every year, and that's only just for six astronauts. And, and that water comes in formats people don't often think about. And this is something I didn't even realize until I read Robert Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Water is what's in the plants. Water is what's in the foodstuffs. Water is in so many of the different things is just part of what makes up the stuff. And so when we start talking about sending food to space, we're sending water to space as part of that food. Yeah, even, um, the, de even the dehydrated food that they send still has a few percent water left in it. And, and so water is, is a, there's a whole lot of weight to water. Um, it, one of the, the sad realities is a lot of models will take pills to flush the water as much <laughs> as they can out of their systems so they look thinner and skinnier in photos. And this is because we are basically giant bags of water with a layer of material around us that keeps the water in. We're water balloons. We're human water balloons. Car Carbon-based water bags. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's actually, I haven't heard it put that way. I need to borrow that, but yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so, so we need to find ways to keep ourselves nice and ha happy and plump with water, not plump with all of the stuff I've been getting fed by all of my wonderful staff. I love them. I'm not to be trusted with fruit. <laughs> so, so you also talked about the radiation issues. So you're looking for water, and you're looking for ways to use that water in a variety of ways. And, and the, the radiation angle is actually one of the more interesting ones with asteroids. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the most challenging aspects, and of course, uh, whether it's NASA's mission, uh, SpaceX mission, uh, Robert Bigelow, or uh, uh, Richard Branson, or others who are, are leading businesses uh, or uh, activities heading into space, the biggest challenge with getting uh, away from our, our little bubble here on Earth and on our ways to Mars is to survive long-duration exposure in space. Uh, Few people probably realize that the International Space Station, even though it's just a couple hundred kilometers up, actually is still fairly well protected as far as radiation goes because it's inside Earth's Van Allen belts and Earth's magnetosphere, which keeps it fairly protected from uh, from solar radiation uh, and uh, the the solar radiation coming from solar flares and things like that. Uh, and it's it's a relatively safe environment. It actually wasn't uh, since Apollo 17 that we had any human beings that were out in a hazardous environment. Of course, and if there were a solar flare, there would have been nowhere for them to go to. And uh, so I think lucky with the Apollo astronauts, and this is something that doesn't get stressed enough. 
Yes. So when we go to Mars, really the, the biggest challenge is how to provide that radiation shielding. It's, uh, it's not as easy as just making a, a bigger wall thickness of metal or things like that, because then you get secondary effects of radiation where you actually can make the radiation worse because it interacts with something uh, depending on the energy level and then scatters further. Uh, so really one of the best ways to mimic our own magnetosphere and our own atmosphere is through about a meter um, cube of water on all sides of you. Uh, or I think it's, I, try, I, try, I heard a metric uh, just a couple weeks ago at the, the recent uh, Keck Institute for Space Studies uh, workshop and it was uh, one of those unitless kind of dimensions that was like one, one kilogram per meter squared something or other. But you can just essentially think of it, you need a fish tank on all sides of you uh, that's about a meter thick. And the challenge with that, of course, is to, to cover every side and leave a meter in the middle left for you, you need more than 30 cubic meters of water. And at $50 million a cubic meter to put it in space, that's a pretty big shipping bill uh, at the moment. Uh, but and that's there's another way to look at that cubic meter. It doesn't have to be a cubic meter of solid water, the other way to do it is to take a big old asteroid, tunnel into the center, and even if it's not pure water above you, if it's rock that is permeated with water, that can have a cumulative effect. So instead of just having one meter of protection, you can have several meters of rock containing water, and this is one of the awesome things about what you guys are going to do. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, certainly it's been written about in science fiction, but it actually uh, has some merit in, uh, in uh, scientific reality. Uh, so if you, if you can't have your cubic meter of water, you could have uh, just a couple more meters of what engineers often refer to as bulk mass. And what is bulk mass? You know, it's stuff, it's dirt, it's the, you know, maybe dirt minus the organics, which is what you have in your backyard. Um, but, you know, one of the concepts of uh, uh, either NASA's Future Exploration Roadmap uh, or our own, for that matter, uh, is to use asteroids and objects in space uh, in the method, just like you described, to use them as a radiation shield uh, or maybe even an orbiting uh, kind of base uh, on which we can cycle back and forth to Mars or other destinations. And, and what's awesome in the science fiction is there's so many stories, and, and my favorite is Mary Norris Russell's The Sparrow, which is a heartbreaking story that I remember like having to try really hard not to weep between London Heathrow. And, <laughs> can, and you, can you say the name again? I didn't quite catch it. It was The Sparrow by Mary, Mary Norris Russell. And one of the parts of this story is um, we, we detect, a human race detects a signal of a bounce, basically music radio station off of an alien world, and while most of the planet is trying to figure out what this means, the Jesuits who have more money than everyone else, uh, essentially while no one's looking, uh, launch a spacecraft made out of a mined asteroid out to explore that distant world, and so you have scientists, linguistical experts, and Jesuits, uh, and, and that sounds terrible, but it actually is a truly, truly amazing book that, that, and then all the interactions with the alien species led to me almost weeping on the London Underground. Um, but but well, it's I, a fabulous book. You know, I had mentioned resources were often a motivation for uh, settling frontiers, and I, I hope we're not at this, you know, state in the world today, but it's also been religious persecution, of course, has been another reason for people to, uh, to really go across uh, great boundaries and take great risks. Um, but, you know, apart from that, I think also it's just inspiration and exploration that has been driving that to people as well. And the thought that we actually not only have the technology, uh, but this technology is available to us uh, today in ways that it doesn't take an entire government to do it anymore. Um, this is really what we're excited about at our company. This is um, the realization that with everything that, you know, the Google Hangout that we're enjoying today, the ubiquitous bandwidth that we have, the fact that we can communicate with nearly ever, every other human on the planet anytime we want for relatively cheap, all these types of technologies really allow us to take on challenges like exploring space. 
a small team at our company, for example, can do the same thing that it, it once took an entire division of the Air Force or the better part of NASA to do in the 1960s. And, uh, of course, our ability to improve on that is itself increasing year on year. So um, while today we think that you know asteroid mining and asteroid prospecting and development is certainly a big challenge and, and audacious, uh, five years from now it'll be even easier, and ten years from now, you know, our, our intent, of course, is we'll be doing it and on to the next big thing. And, and what we're doing here at CosmoQuest is we're working to try and pave the way by engaging everyday people in mapping out the surfaces of nearby rocky bodies. Uh, we're working always to find new projects that will get us laying the groundwork for future explorers to go out and know where it's safe to land their spacecraft and where are the interesting scientific places to explore. And, and the analogy that I often use is we're currently at the barnstorming age, but we're getting ready with commercial space flight for the battles between tomorrow's TWA and Pan Am to break out. But what you're really representing as you press on to even more amazing frontiers is you're kind of uh, replicating what the West East Asian trading company, West East Indian trading company did, where you're trying to figure out we have all this great technology. We have this entire solar system at, well, at our fingertips, because it's not at our feet. It's above us. So <laughs> just at our fingertips. Just stand on your head. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and you guys are trying to figure out how we make it commercially viable for humans to, to get themselves off of this dinky little rock we're on and go out to even littler rocks, but explore them in new and interesting ways. Yeah, well, we certainly hope so, and and I think with everything um, that we develop, you know, as as um, as humans, as engineers, as scientists, and thinkers, and creators, um, it's in in some ways, you know, our, our Hollywood vision of the future and the ability of science fiction authors to kind of inspire our imaginations, in somewhat has actually done a dirt disservice on on how people think that this future will come at us. Um, you know, the, the internet took 30 to 40 years to develop, and it wasn't that we woke up one day and all of a sudden there was an internet. Uh, it was that people worked on little steps here and there, starting with protocols and communications methods and hooking a few computers together. And from a, taking a, a subject that's sci-fi like asteroid mining, uh, so we don't start today by building the asteroid mining machine and sending it out to the asteroid and and then uh, you know the next thing you know we've got a starship enterprise. It really starts how those prospectors started in the 1850s going out to the California gold rush uh, you know with nothing but the clothes on their back and and simple tools. Um, we're, we're in the 21st century equivalent of that where we're gonna go out with very simple exploration capability, what we're developing in the ARCID series of spacecraft, to be able to tell whether this particular carb carbonaceous asteroid that we're going to, whether it's Bennu or uh, whether it's uh, the Japanese target, 1999 JU-3, or any other carbonaceous target, actually has material that we can uh, extract and exploit. Um, it could be that we, you know, having not yet returned a sample yet from one of these asteroids, as we often find when we're exploring things, we might be surprised. Uh, so uh, our goal, of course, is to quickly go from uh, learning new things to adapting and exploiting those new things uh, and taking the next step. So what are all the little steps that we can take uh, that get us closer to doing that? And uh, for us, the exploration and the prospecting and really doing uh, the, the deep space exploration activity, not for a billion dollars, but, uh, you know, maybe just a few million is, is what we're looking at from a technology standpoint. And, and this, this reminds me to tell our audience, we're currently sitting at $22,625,000 raised during this hangout of fun. You are rescuing me. So, so one of the things that, that I agree to, Chris, you're welcome to mock me. I probably deserve it is one of our, our people suggested yesterday that should we hit a sufficiently large goal, I should dye my hair blonde. <laughs> which, to which I dropped the F-bomb on air, kind of stared at her with my mouth open all the way, and determined I was going to set a goal of $50,000 had to be reached by 10 p.m. tonight. And, and, and dear internet, you have 
let her down, let all of them down. You are going to make it harder for me to not have to spend every day for the next 30 days begging you for money, but I get to keep my hair unless a miracle happens. <laughs> um, uh, so currently $22,625,000. If you'd like to donate, go to CosmoQuest.org slash lowercase hangoutathon. Um, and, and so, one of the so things Emily, that you said... You, uh, you talked to us uh, you know, just late last week about coming on, and we were talking about giveaways. Yes. Um, and one of the things that I thought we could do was give away something like this. Oh, wow. Uh, we haven't, I was figuring out what we could do with it, but uh, we should set a goal in the next 30 minutes here uh, for raising something or for some individual who wants to make a generous contribution. Um, we would be more than happy to uh, maybe embellish this particular multi-billion year old piece of, uh, of uh, iron meteorite and uh, we'll stick our Planetary Resources logo on it, and we'll have members of our uh, our team put all their signatures on it and send it out to, to one lucky winner. That is a stunningly gorgeous piece of rock, and, and at this point in the day, I know that our audience is suffering from a great deal of donation fatigue, and since we are about to go into a 36-day, um, and, and so part of the reason my mouth dropped open is... I, I first asked Jeff Notkin, hey, do you want to do something like give away not a meteorite, little bags of things that... A meteor people... wrongs. Yeah, meteor wrongs. And I thought this was brilliantly silly. And he, he donated actual meteorite stuff. I then said the exact same thing to you guys. And you came back with, like, an even cooler piece of meteorite. Um, that piece is so cool that what I'm going to say is um, we're about to go into 36 days. Of, of long-term crowdsourcing and let's give that to the largest donor that is not a business or corporation and by the end of Monday all right well that gives us uh, 36 days then to uh, or maybe maybe 18 days or something to show you what you'll be getting then we'll we'll uh, we'll get yeah, something let's created do it for 18 days then that's a good idea so, so next 18 days at the halfway point of our 36 days, that is stunning. We will get photos posted up on the blog. That is, is me wishing that I could be on the other side of this hangout of fun. Not that I have any money. I'm an academic. But <laughs> that is truly me. I just want to, like, pet it because it's shiny and pretty. Um, and I've been awake way too many hours at this point. So um, one thing that uh, I, th I think uh, we certainly have in common is uh, a lot of ambitious and passionate people who support what we do and are following uh, our communities. And Caitlin actually came to Planetary Resources from that very community and uh, really is helping us connect with, um, uh, educate, uh, and engage with uh, everyone around the world who finds all this stuff so, so fascinating. Um, so, Caitlin, why don't you talk a little bit just about the different uh, projects that we have ongoing uh, that are involving, you know, whether it's our vanguards or uh, other members of the public and, and stuff that uh, we're planning for the upcoming year. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I guess just to go back to your comment about me being a community vanguard, I, I joined the Planetary Resources team unofficially <laughs> as a supporter of their Kickstarter campaign. Um, which raised 1.5 million dollars last June, which was amazing, um, and we are essentially building a telescope for public use. So it's a really cool project called Arcid for Everyone, um, and I was lucky to be chosen to be an advocate for that project. Oh, there it is, right there, our beautiful spacecraft, Sans solar panels. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're gonna put one of these, you know, 12 U. Uh, sats up up uh, into to low Earth orbit, and it's going to be able to be used by citizen science um, to explore the cosmos. So, what an awesome project! Um, so, I got totally invested in, in PRI's mission and through uh, the Kickstarter, and lucky enough to be uh, brought on to the team in January to manage some of our um, ongoing and new uh, crowd campaigns and initiatives. And right now, we're in the in the throes. I think we have about few days left of the first phase of the NASA and Planetary Resources Asteroid Data Hunters uh, Algorithm Challenge, where we're asking, where we're asking coders. Um, you're you're breaking up, Caitlin. What? what? I'm breaking what? up. I'm breaking up. Yeah. You're turning into a Dalek. No, yeah. it's, it's either the Dalek or the Cylons. I'm not quite sure. Which Cylons. Old Cylons. 
Can you hear me okay now? Yes, no. but he said the word Cylon. You're similar enough in, in age to me that I'm betting that you will recognize this. My, my oh, yes. 19, nine, born in 1994 intern, tiny intern, when asked to, to ransack my house for things to set up at the prop, found a copy of the DVD for Battlestar Galactica 1980, the worst science fiction TV series ever on network television. My, my, so my little child brain from kindergarten doesn't want to be polluted, so it remains in its plastic wrap, because I love Battlestar Galactica when I was this big. Anyways, I want Well, that was your gateway drug into, the, into being a, a space nerd, huh? <laughs> I've always been a space nerd. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so you sound less Cylon or Dalek-like. Go ahead, Caitlin. Okay, great. Let me know if I revert back. Um, so the NASA um, and Planetary Resources Asteroid Data Hunters Algorithm Challenge um, is so awesome. And basically what we're doing is um, we're hosting a series of algorithm challenges where people are creating algorithms that are going to help us detect asteroids from existing um, imaging data from the Catalina Sky Survey. Um, so people are creating an algorithm that's going to help us sift through this data uh, more efficiently, um, you know, and it's, it, it blows my mind. I mean, like, citizen science is going to be able to help us find asteroids. Um, so right now we're in the throes of the first phase of that competition, um, and there's there's cash rewards also for being a part of it. So anyone out there listening is is a uh, amazing coder should definitely check out uh, the competition. It's really it's really cool. Um, and also, with that same kind of imaging data, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, this before, where basically the way that we detect asteroids today is from telescopes on Earth is one of the methods. And if you were to look up into the night sky and kind of you know, look at like, a patch of sky about the size of your hand, and over the course of maybe a few hours take a picture of that same patch of sky, and then look at all of those images in sequence, the stars don't move in that image. But anything that does move across that screen can be determined to be an asteroid or some kind of near-Earth object. So this is one of the many ways in which we discover asteroids today. And, and so that our program's own Ray Sanders, who uh, was in the green room earlier as a volunteer who's taught many courses for us, is working at the Catalina Sky Survey, where he just narrowly missed discovering a comet the other day. Oh um, my and gosh. He, he's actually in the, the asteroid hunting business in part with the work he does with Catalina. And, and we will be teaching a course through our uh, Cosmo Academy program that we're affiliated with with CosmoQuest. Uh, Sandy Springman, who is someone who uses the Arecibo radio telescope to bounce radar off of asteroids to do radio work. Uh, so, so yeah, it, discovering asteroids is something near and dear to a lot of our community. Yeah, that's great. And I, you know, being pretty new to the space industry myself, um, you know, these initiatives that, that we have going on this year and what you guys are doing, um, it's just so cool. It's putting real, real data, uh, real discoveries into the hands of citizen science. And there's, you know, there's no better way to involve than, than working with real stuff. So. I mean, Chris even has a asteroid named after him. Uh, yes, 13609 Lewicki, which was discovered uh, by an Arizona survey, but it wasn't the Catalina survey because it wasn't quite active yet. Uh, but the uh, Space Watch survey actually found that particular asteroid out in the main belt, fairly uninteresting, uh, just kind of orbiting the sun every, uh, every three or so years. Uh, much more interesting uh, are the near-Earth asteroids, which are the ones that... Uh, end up as meteorites and are the ones who are interested in going out and mining eventually. I, I am nonetheless terribly, terribly jealous. I, I have to admit there is one night when I was out at a bar at the American Astronomical Society meeting and there was a whole bunch of us just gabbing social media, new media, science communication. And I was like, so everyone around me is getting into the whose asteroid number is lower than whose. <laughs> and, and so so there was a lot of asteroid Pamela. You're not going to name an asteroid gay. Um, 
So, so, so someday I'm really hoping there's an asteroid star strider. This is me looking sadly at the internet with total jealousy of all the people I love. I do the science. I, I just want an asteroid. Okay, anyways, whiny thing over. This is one of my sadnesses in life is I get to play with all the cool kids that have asteroids and I don't have one. Well, then our next initiative is perfect for you. We, uh, we have a challenge coming out that uh, you don't need to be a coder, which I love, called Asteroid Zoo. And Asteroid Zoo is essentially those the, that imagery from the Catalina Sky Survey. We're showing that visually and allowing people to sift through it uh, and find asteroids themselves. Uh, and that data gets passed to kind of the experts to verify if they've discovered a new object or if it's an asteroid or not. Um, so Pamela, your dream could come true um, I think asteroid zoom might be calling. <laughs> well, well, so so this is where uh, what this is one of those things where you're talking about a Zooniverse project, and I'm one of the co-founders of Zooniverse, and we oh, yeah. were free when we created CosmoQuest because we wanted to create something new and different with CosmoQuest. Where with CosmoQuest, we we aren't just about going out and clicking on things and finding them, which is awesome. We need to do the science when we build our moon mappers, when we build our asteroid mappers. When we build all these projects that are producing science, we're the first citizen science project to actually produce crater science. Um, what we're doing is we're actually providing the education, we're providing the media, we're providing a place where we invite our community to come in and have the full research center experience. And this is what makes us a little bit different and may be part of why I don't have an asteroid. We're so busy getting people looking at the results of the asteroids hitting things and looking at how smaller rocks hitting, hitting big things like the asteroid Vesta. Um, so yeah, we, we are channeled in a different direction over here and I wish you the best of luck, but I do have to say uh, that's our competitor's project. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry about that. I won't talk about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I'd actually like to, so earlier Chris said something that, that uh, made me laugh. You talked about how the, the early gold miners who uh, went out to California with the, the clothes on their back, uh, you guys are following those lines and there's so many small things that have to be discovered in order to go out and do your mining expedition. And one of the things that's currently being worked on is creating a long endurance apparel that the astronauts can wear for long periods of time without having to wash them. And so while the early miners went out with maybe one or two outfits of clothing and that was all they had is what they carried on their back or on the back of their donkey, um, the next generation of people going out for, for uh, asteroid mining may be going out with only one or two things of clothes on their back, but these are going to be amazingly high-tech clothing. The self-washing underwear, probably, something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's the creepiest so far. <laughs> so, so we have to solve problems of radiation. We have to solve problems of clothing. We have to solve problems of fuel sources. What are all the different problems that you guys are looking at at having to solve before you can go from using your, your uh, um, Arcade systems, I believe it's called? Uh, Arcade. To, yeah, ARCID systems to, to do all of the research to finally getting to break free of Earth orbit. Yeah, so uh, just a, a little bit on ARCID. You can go to our website and search the story on this. When uh, Before we had announced the company publicly, uh, we were operating in what uh, people often call a stealth mode in uber secret, not letting people know what we're up to. And we needed a code name for our company. So uh, we, we came up with ARCID Astronautics, A-R-K-Y-D, uh, as that code name, because it didn't, you know, search Google for it, nothing came up at the time. Uh, and, and we were inspired by uh, a company in the Star Wars universe called Arachid Industries. And Arachid Industries is the name of the company, uh, if you remember the opening scene in The Empire Strikes Back on the surface of the ice planet Hoth, the uh, Viper Model 101 probe droid was a product of Arakid Industries, uh, and uh, before they were weaponized by the um, um, by the Empire, uh, they actually made uh, resource droids that went out and scoured solar systems uh, looking for asteroids that they could mine. Uh, so that's uh, that's where Arakid came from. 
Uh, the other part, <laughs> in terms of uh, just your other question, uh, the things that we're working on to uh, kind of get us farther along in this, we of course need to know more about asteroids than we currently do. NASA has been doing fantastic work over the past 20 years at discovering more asteroids, learning about them, sending missions to them. The Japanese have sent and actually returned samples from the, the asteroid Itakawa, and uh, they're planning on doing that again on a, at another asteroid. But the problem is, is that you know one asteroid every decade is not really quite an inspiring pace, and is not something that uh, that we can we can use. And with uh, NASA's most recent mission, Osiris Rex, uh, being a New Horizons mission, uh, it's got a pretty big price tag too. It's you know including the launch vehicle and the science instruments and the mission and operating it for effectively ten years uh, is a billion dollar price tag. And there's going to be a lot of great science that'll be done by Osiris Rex. Uh, of course, a lot of detail in bringing that sample all the way back to Earth uh, is is expensive the way that NASA does it, because uh, the NASA mantra of you know failure is not an option. When failure is not an option, success gets really expensive, and we have had very successful robotic missions, and that's because we've invested a lot of money on them and we've really beaten out all the risk. But this is where, from a commercial standpoint, we've got kind of an opportunity to maybe take more risks maybe actually risk failure because in this case it's not taxpayer dollars that are on the line uh, it's investor dollars uh, although you know we want to keep our investors happy as well but what it allows us to do and and really uh, this is a, a long way of getting around to the main point is the first thing that we need to do and what we're working on today at planetary resource is to dramatically reduce the cost of exploring and learning more about asteroids we would like to take a mission like Osiris Rex at a billion dollars and maybe do 80 percent of what that mission does but do it for a hundredth the cost uh, and this involves thinking a little bit differently kind of doing things uh, with uh, a smaller group of people taking more risk uh, do, using uh, more more kind of recent uh, cutting-edge technology uh, and really just having the wherewithal to see it through and uh, we're starting this summer with our very first launch of a nanosatellite from the space station uh, called the ARCID-3, and that has on it all of the core technologies that we plan on uh, sending out into deep space uh, and uh, the things that we'll use to point the spacecraft, to figure out where it's pointed, the technology to communicate, the various ways of getting things done and talking between the various machines and devices, uh, is all being tested on this first prototype that we're launching this summer and following on with uh, the uh, Arcid Space Telescope that was the subject of our Kickstarter and our outreach program uh, we will then uh, do new work in optical communications and instrument uh, we'll then add in the propulsion systems and then ultimately uh, in three to four years uh, our goal is to be sending these out to the first asteroid uh, hopefully that we can give more data for the asteroids mapper team uh, to help us map these asteroids and develop better and newer technology for doing it. And and this all goes back to something that, that came up last night in the After 10 slot with Matt Art Lab. Uh, Surly Amy, Amy Davis Roth, she's an artist on Etsy. I'm wearing one of her necklaces right now. Um, she does amazing science-inspired jewelry. You can actually find her stuff in the gift shop at the very large array. And the necklace that she showed off last night was one that was inspired by a quote from uh, during the landing of Mars Curiosity rover. The quote was, we dare mighty things. And one of the things that, that we were talking about last night is the, the motto at NASA for so long was failure is not an option. And I remember one day of irony where I had my NASA water bottle that said failure is not an option and it was something that I used to live by as I wrote my grants and got this project going and I put it through the dishwasher and it failed mightily. Yes. And, and, and it was just this moment of irony and as we talked about this last night we realized it's better to say we dare mighty things because in order to do the extraordinary you have to fail and you often have to fail over and over and over. And Ira Glass uh, is, it has this great quote on creativity that I'm going to massively destroy while paraphrasing it. 
and, and it basically boils down to um, creative people will create things and hate them and you have to keep trying because what, what makes you hate what you're doing is you have taste and it's that taste that will eventually make you good and, and we, have to, we have to be risk takers, we have to try to do the extraordinary and we have to accept Sometimes we're going to fall on our faces. Sometimes we're going to blow up rockets. Sometimes, unfortunately, people will die. And with everyone signing up for Mars One, what we're seeing is people are willing to take those risks to see humanity advance. And you work at a company that has said, we dare mighty things. And this is one of the things I, I love about watching all of the commercial space flight people as you seek to to innovate, innovate tomorrow. And, and as you walk around your lab um, and move beyond the failure is not an option motto, what is the motto that you take to your personnel as, as you seek to drive them forward? Oh, I don't know that um, we, have, we have any particular driving motto. I probably need to create one. Um, I, I, the, in, uh, my personal motto is, you know, stop reading about it and start doing it. And, uh, you know, Peter Diamandis, one of our co-founders, his personal model is uh, uh, the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. And it's not so much, you know, a lot of times we dwell on failure and failure is this very unpleasant thing, but uh, in many ways, failure is the only way that we, uh, as human beings, actually learn. And if you're not trying hard enough, um, if you're not failing, you're actually probably not trying hard enough. There's other quotes, you know, smooth seas, uh, smooth seas never milled, ah, I'm going to butcher this one. Smooth seas never made a skillful sailor. Uh, you know, in that uh, some adversity every now and then really uh, helps you figure out what's important and move things forward. And for me, what, what I am most frustrated about, the way that we have really explored space in the past 30, 40 years since Apollo is that we just haven't done it often enough. In the 1960s there were some very, very inspirational and aggressive missions um, The when we first went to uh, explore the moon. You know, J JFK gave a speech at Rice University and you know said to do things not because they are easy but because they are hard and of course he made this speech about going to the moon when uh, the United States had spent 15 minutes in space and they had not a clue about what was in front of them. But what they did was they started a program to learn as fast as they possibly could. And while we were busy doing Mercury and Gemini and Apollo to figure out how to get the humans into space, how to get uh, uh, an architecture out to the moon and then down to the surface and back, there was a whole flotilla of robotic activity that a lot of people weren't aware of or forgotten about where we had a program called Ranger and we threw uh, six Ranger spacecraft at the moon before we had one that we could kind of call a success. I, I love the way you place that. We threw them at the moon and, and there was no soft landing involved. Oh no, no. It's like try to hit the broad side of the barn and five times we couldn't uh, because as it turns out when you've never done that before it's kind of challenging. And it was the best way of getting very high resolution pictures of the surface was to, you know, get that picture back right before it smacks in, just like Laddie did uh, last week or the way before, week before. But we turned those failures into successes and we kept trying and we kept trying. Then we started the Lunar Orbiter program and all four of those uh, lunar, lunar orbiters actually worked. And, uh, you know, there's another uh, project that's going on in uh, Mountain View to, to restore all that data. Uh, the um, the next thing the, w that we did was the surveyors and the surveyors we tried to land several of these soft landing on the moon and and uh, didn't of course succeed all the time at doing that um, but uh, what we really haven't had for quite some time is an exploration program we've had missions and the missions really have been all or nothing and our reaction to the mission failing isn't to try it again it's to just do something else entirely um, so what we're really building at Planetary Resources is an exploration program with the ARCID series of spacecraft. We know that we're going to need to build a lot of spacecraft and probably need to explore a lot of asteroids, and we're going to have some setbacks when we're doing that. But uh, if we don't plan for that, if we don't actually anticipate uh, the bad news, uh, you know, we won't know what to do when it arrives. So 
you know, it's a little bit of tempering expectations and also uh, planning for the successes alongside the learning opportunities, uh, but all the while just making a much more rapid progress than you would if you sat in a room and just worried all the time. Uh, and one of my, my collaborators, Fraser Kane, um, I, I once heard this fabulous quote describing him, and I, I think this is the same philosophy many of us have. Um, the, the quote used to describe him was, Fraser just did it. He saw an opportunity, he knew how to take advantage of it, and he just did it. He didn't listen to market research, he didn't, and there was this whole list of things he didn't do. And sometimes you, you can't take the time to pause and ask, well, <clears throat> all the different things that we stop and ask and it become absolutely immobilizing. Instead you have to simply say, what can I accomplish if I try? And what will I break if I fail? And quite often the answer of what will I break if I fail is my dignity and my bank account. And, and you know, if the things that you're going to hurt allow you to keep living tomorrow, keep allowing you to feed your family, and allow us to learn something new in the process. It's worth trying mighty things and sometimes failing. And, and with CosmoQuest, we're not trying anything too mighty. We're trying to enable the people doing the space exploration. We're trying to provide the maps that will allow people like you to know uh, where it's safe to land, where the best science options lie in your future. Uh, we love partnering with all of the teams and sending back the amazing imagery. We're very proud to have been funded by Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, by Messenger, by New Horizons, by uh, Dawn, by all of these different teams to work on building citizen science projects for them that has helped us systematically map out our solar system. And while we're busy mapping, you guys are figuring out how to get us there. And you are building a future that may not include jetpacks. I don't think we're going to get the jetpacks we were promised as children. No, we're, we'll have jetpacks for robots. You know, that's kind of awesome in and of itself. And, and um, yeah, and what I'm loving is what some of the Google Lunar X Prize people are doing for their robots. We're going to have a robotically awesome future that may be devoid of human jetpacks, and that's okay. <laughs> Um, so, so my team is systematically rearranging the room around me because we are about to spend one hour begging for money because that's what we do and playing Kerbal Space because uh, it's been determined that Nicole and I, because we both are afraid to let ourselves get distracted from our research, um, Nicole and I have not played Kerbal Space and we've been told we must play Kerbal Space. So we're going to play Kerbal Space live during the next hour of the 36-hour Hangout-a-thon. The next hour is hour 35. Um, wow. It has been <laughs> fabulous having you on, Chris. Have, have you seen this uh, XKCD yes. that came out recently? <laughs> That's partly what inspired it. Oh, I'm using the wrong mouse. Uh, <laughs> hold on, embiggening you. Yes, uh, so, so, yeah, this is the what I learned about orbital mechanics from Kerbal, Kerbal, Kerbal versus working at NASA. Um, so, so I have to be careful saying this because one of my dissertation advisors, until sadly he passed away, uh, was, was Victor Lebevetsky, they're destroying the set behind me, was Victor Zebehe, who is the individual who solved the one possible solution to the three-body problem. So I'm not allowed to say I learned more or orbital mechanics from her. <laughs> that becomes true. I, I think I, I actually his daughter, um, his daughter Julie, ever so kindly gave me his his doctoral robes um, because he and I were the same height. So I have oh, Victor. Yeah, yeah. So I have Victor Zebehe's doctoral robes, which have met Einstein. Um, I haven't met Einstein, but my doctoral robes have met Einstein. Um, <laughs> So anyways, you took me down a tangent, which is what happens when you're sleep deprived. Uh -huh. It has been fabulous having you on. We are going to be back in contact with you about that fabulous slice That's of meteorite. Right. That we'll go yeah, we will, we will get this all dolled up for uh, its new owner. And uh, I think the, the rules that you had set out was the the non-corporate, non-nonprofit individual who makes the largest contribution. Uh, the largest individual contribution 
So not from a company, not from a business, from an individual, the largest individual contribution in the next 18 days. Nice. Awesome. And right. thank you for coming on, and let's keep exploring our solar system. And thanks for telling us the final chapter in, in our interwoven asteroid meets Earth, asteroid meets world, spacecraft meets asteroid, humans plan to meet asteroid in person story that we're going to do Well, it's, it's not the final chapter. It's merely the next chapter. And yeah. uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, at Cosmo Quest and getting everyone involved and we look forward to working with you and projects in the future as well. It, it's been great and, and deepest respect for all the things that you're doing. So thank you so much. I'm now going to change my camera angle. I'm surrounded by squirrels and dragon eggs. Right, bye you guys. Wait till you see me. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to step out of camera and let Corey have my seat for a moment. Do you want to darken the screen again so they can see it the way you did with Morris? I don't know how you did that. <laughs> so they can Wait, actually which see screen me. am I going to, though? But, but there's Kerbal up there. Isn't that what we're doing? Right, but, but the way I darkened it was I did a 50% overlay in Photoshop. Oh, okay. Don't work. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> what? We want them to be able to see what I'm doing on the screen. Oh, so I just need to turn <laughs> down the... the oh, yeah, turn yeah. down the brightness. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Words are not happening. You yeah. asked me to do the way I did it earlier, earlier. and I couldn't. I understand. Future pro tip, if you ever need to darken something that's moving on the screen, open the terminal window, so if you promise it, you change the transparency to the terminal window. Don't tell her now. <laughs> <laughs> She'll never. Hello, oh, no, I'm, I phased that out as something I can't deal with right now. I can't even hear you. Oh, my God. So... Somehow I'm going to be playing Kerbal. I have no idea what's happening. I'm looking at the Kerbal <laughs> launch facility, apparently, on, on Corey's computer. Yeah, can you, uh, can you zoom in on the screen? Yeah, we'll do that. Anyway. No, wrong. Uh, return is curly button. Curly button. Curly button. There we go. <laughs> curly button. Curly button. Curly button. <laughs> okay, Corey, take my seat. <laughs> Everyone's yeah, like, yeah, it is. Yeah. Which is why I'm wearing the stupid ear things. Is, I don't know. So, so, so there, there's actually a scientific reason for why we have the ear things. I'm now going to be a disembodied voice. <laughs> um, so, so when we wrote our grant for our citizen science project, we wrote into the grant buying a emotive system um, to, to use to judge people's emotional reactions to doing citizen science. And the original idea in the grant was we'd stick the emotive on people at science fiction conventions and show their um, emotional response televised up on a big screen. And this ran into three big detail problems. One being uh, the, the ability to ship monitors is, is, is easy. The ability to buy a monitor stand was much harder than anticipated. Uh, so that was flaw one. Flaw two was we couldn't get the emotive to work consistently on anyone on our team, and we figured yeah, if we not impressed yeah if we took it to a science fiction convention, we'd only be able to show the emotions of bald-haired men, most of whom we know from experimental evidence have goatees. Phoenix, if you're in the audience, we're pretty sure it would work on you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was not impressed at the scientificness of the emotive at all. And, and the third, yeah, and the third problem was it became a giant time suck for our entire staff. And then I saw Lawrence Krauss wearing cat ears <laughs> at a party at a film festival and realized that the ears actually respond quite nicely. You can clearly see exactly how <laughs> <laughs> Nicole feels. And and I just provoked an emotional response in my postdoc. It's all good. It's all good. And, I'm now, but okay. and, and so after watching a very drunk individual wearing cat ears and responding emotionally to a variety of different things in a way that was useful and amusing from across the room, I bought our team two pairs of cat ears. So at least if it's not completely scientific, it's hilarious. So <laughs> it's scientific. I went to University of Virginia where we have the academical village. <laughs> so, <laughs> shut <laughs> All right, what am I doing? Let's go. That 
like the school of technology is right to here. So that, way, so that way I can see the screen. All right, I have no idea what's like. happening. Okay, so I am going to now play Kerbal Space for the first time. I have indeed avoided this game as much as highly recommended as it comes by Fraser and by all of you. I don't want to get addicted. Um, so, okay. you know. <laughs> yeah. So you're looking at uh, the Kerbal Space Station here. Uh, okay. This is on the planet Kerbin. Kerbals are all the little alien people that you're dealing with. They are quite cute. This is basically Earth, but a tenth of its size. Okay. So um, let's start by building a rocket. So click in the the big building there. This one. That one right there. Yep. Okay, <laughs> and that's going to bring up the rocket screen. And for those of you playing along at home, we are $22,675. My hair is currently safe from being dyed blonde. Well, there's 36 days in the summer, so there may be tattoo in the future. And, and the Kerbal Space Program is, is tweeting along with us. I have um, no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Let me clear out this rocket for you. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. You don't. You don't want a functional rocket. <laughs> um, okay. So first, you have I to build radio telescopes, not rockets. <laughs> first, you have to pick a command module. So let's start with just a simple one-person one, and then we'll let you. Is that it? Uh, Is that? Uh, well, that three. one's a three-person. I think oh, of this oh. one here. Oh, oh, that one will work. Okay, Let's go so that. the tiny, skinny one. Yep. What do I do? Okay, so now you have your command module here. Oh. Um, just click somewhere. Escape. Click over here. Okay. Get rid of it. Okay. Okay, um, okay now what, el what else do you need in your rocket? I need fuel tanks. Okay. Fuel tanks are going to be propulsion. Propulsion? Right there. Engine cluster. Um, let's see. There's a tank. a tank. Okay. Uh, let's see how big that tank is. So click on it. Yeah. And move it over, and we'll see how big it is. Okay, that's pretty massive for uh -huh. your ship there. Okay. So, so uh, you overkill. can probably get. If you understand a little bit of physics, I'll have this one. Right. Okay, we're looking at the huge ones. So <laughs> let's. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, click on this arrow. Oh, there's more pages! Through. Oh, yeah, there's, okay. like, there's like a thousand parts that you can mess with. Yeah, try that one there. Yay, oh, okay. Now do I, like, make the... Ah! Oh. Yay! Yay! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I get the little booster bits now? Yeah. Okay. Um... There's a couple different kinds of engines you can have here. These are all liquid engines. Um, you can add solid, but that's probably a poor choice. Okay. But, uh, yeah, try that one. Okay. It's also and in the floor. You, uh, you can click on the command module there and move it up. Oops. There we go. <laughs> there we go. And we broke physics. Okay. Okay. Um, that's probably good enough to start with. So sure, that's you all it can, takes to build a rocket. You can uh, click there on that. There you go. That'll put you on the launch pad. <laughs> this is free advertising for Gerbil. <laughs> they will probably be getting my money after this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you... All right, here's here's all the controls you need to worry about right now. Okay. W, A, S, and D can control, kind of move your rocket about. Tim should have been doing this. Shift and control. No, 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 no. You need to I'll be just the one doing that. I'll just turn the throttle up all the way so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and now I'm going to press space bar, this and then you get to go. smart. Wait, what do these do? Oh, okay. All right, so this is your heading down yeah. here on the bottom here. And I don't want to go straight up because I have seen some launches. Well, right? <laughs> do, you, do you even know which direction you want to go? Space! <laughs> <laughs> well, you're heading there. Uh, no! <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> oh, hey, look, he's having fun! Jebediah is having a lot of fun. <laughs> That's the Jebediah they were tweeting about. Okay. Am Wait, I going to run out of fuel? Um, there's weird screen effects here that are causing Jebediah to be like, 
terrible levels of darkness. <laughs> and it looks very creepy. But <laughs> it's happy. Are you sure? Yeah, you're still going up, so that's good. <laughs> you're not going to be going up for long, though. There's your fuel. Oh, crap! <laughs> Your ears. <laughs> the right one did the, the, oh. the right ear did the cat has water in the ear thing, and it was funny. <laughs> Press the buttons harder. Maybe something will happen. <laughs> See your path here. You're heading right Is into the ocean. into not space. Yeah, right over here. <laughs> so I mean, you started out well. Uh, that's exciting. <laughs> so going and seeing shuttle launches does not prepare you. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we can speed it up here, so we can we can make this happen a bit quicker. Aww. <laughs> do we do we just oh, want to yeah. skip ahead? No, I want to see Jebediah. <laughs> <laughs> Jebediah is like boogie. He's freaking out. He's like, yeah, look at this. <laughs> Purples actually have a stupidity meter, and he probably has a pretty high one. Oh, wait, I think I'm coming back down. <laughs> You're currently getting dizzy. You're getting dizzy. He has a puke. Does Jebediah have a puke? Um, they can get pretty distraught. Okay. I don't think they ever actually puke. Oh, oh now he's starting to look worried. Oh, shoot. <laughs> no, there's actually a bit of a smile left. <laughs> oh. This is where the stupidity meter comes into play. Yeah, totally smiling. Wow. And I think I can't <laughs> Okay, so I think a good goal would be for you to get in the orbit. All right. What do I do? Okay. Um, probably. Okay. You can go back to the Start Space to Center. Oh, go back to the Space Center. Okay, go back to the, um, uh, the building. Yeah. Okay, so what do you think you did wrong? I didn't. I don't, I don't have enough fuel. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true, yeah. Okay, so you can add more fuel. If you stack um, fuel tanks on top of each other, yeah. then they'll just funnel to each other. You can also add solid boosters. Um, oh, okay. They can't really be controlled, but there are ways of controlling them. It gets a bit more complicated. That's a massive solid booster. You can stick that on the side of it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a Kerbal walking around the engine. Yeah, there's lots of... Uh... What was the one that I used? I wanted to... Oh. Oh. Um, that, no, not that one. Right next. So we are at cur we are currently at twenty two thousand seven hundred and thirty dollars donated. Um, we are now watching um, just, science uh, <laughs> fail. Yeah. This is science education here. through inquiry. This is actually all scientific research shows. Wow. The way Nicole is currently learning about robotics, ro this is about rocketry, more or less how building radio telescopes went for me the first year of grad school. Oh dear God! <laughs> With less explosions. <laughs> <laughs> there was plenty of fail. Less drowned kerbals. Less drowned kerbals. And and Corey, who I did tell the bear story though. Corey, who's who's uh, mentoring her through this, is our lead programmer, senior developer, one of the people who helped us completely design CosmoQuest from the ground up. And I think he's fixed Joe and I's code more than once. No, I, I did tell the story of how we screwed up the most basic things when starting to build a radio telescope. So it's it's not that far off. Mm -hmm. Now we have Bill Kerman. All right, Bill. Okay, so you can. Uh, you already know. Well, you sort of know that those do things. <laughs> but you can, you can uh, increase and decrease the throttle with shift. Up and down, okay. And then you can go through stages. You only have one stage, which is to right. turn on with space. Well, what, I wanted to... Oh, oh. <laughs> it's okay. 
sorry. <laughs> no countdown. No countdown. Nothing. You just go. Well, we could do a countdown. We're we're mission control. It is our fail that there was no countdown. Bill looks a lot more worried. Than Bill looks I very, am. very he terrified. Saw, he saw but, what happened in the last program. Well, and he's space. he's trying to pull in a lot of G's during takeoff. You're you're accelerating. You you you're already at 140,000 meters per second. 100. Oh, sorry, 140. Yeah. I can't read that far. That's Chris and 16 G's. Deal with it, Bill. 170 <laughs> meters per second. Yeah. Um, now you. It seems like you know about the gravity turn of like yeah. turning the rocket a bit. You want to go toward this way, toward the 90, 90 degrees. Um, you wanna, oh, yeah. it's rotating, yeah. The, that's the way the planet's going, so gotcha. it helps you a little bit. Gotcha. That, like, <laughs> that looks yeah. really worried. It's kind of freaking me out. <laughs> and also, the rocket has a little bit of control on its own. If you ever want to, like, stay at an angle, you can yeah. press T, and then it'll, it'll stick to that angle. Okay, that, that helps a lot, actually. <laughs> <laughs> <So> like, <laughs> Where's my feet? <laughs> so, so what, what was learning Kerbal like for you, Corey? Um, it was very difficult because I didn't have anyone to show me how to do that. Uh, <laughs> it took me about twenty hours to get to the moon, so that that can give you a fair idea of how long it took to. Uh, Dang. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I should say, um, landing on the moon and getting back. Getting to the moon is very easy. Um, getting back is hard. Is getting to the moon and not dying on arrival a challenge? Um, no. The most difficult part of landing on the moon is uh, keeping the lander upright when you land. It <laughs> is very, very easy to tip I'm over. I'm sure Neil Armstrong would agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, and, and what's kind of awesome is with working with some of the Google Lunar X Prize teams, um, I think it was part-time scientists, I may have the wrong team, they, they posted a video of a new rover that they have that looks like a little ball and it, it lands and it rolls itself around until it opens up four little basically orange wedges and starts walking on the little orange wedges. So it can land in any orientation and then right itself. So so apparently the Google Lunar X Prize people have figured out landing is hard. Nice. You I'm gonna hit on the other side of the planet now. Yeah, you're you probably maybe had enough fuel. You mm -hmm. just didn't angle yourself enough to actually Oh, I thought it was under angling. Okay. Actually orbit it. Gotcha. Yeah. No, usually um, <clears throat> let's see, I think at about 10,000 meters in the air, you want to be at a 45 degree angle, okay. and then you go at that for a while. I don't know exactly. I think it's around 40 or 50 you're supposed to go horizontal. Because, again, I'm just picturing the launches I've seen uh, in Florida, mm -hmm. and it just looks like it, it's just going <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> And I'm like, that doesn't seem right, because then all the fuel goes the wrong way. Yes. So, all right. Do we want to wait for my slow descent to no, death? No, no, you can press <laughs> escape to right. Also, one thing you might want to consider is, um, let's see, try, um, I just go space on I think we're vertical. You are throttled up. Game cannot be, that's okay, I'm going to die. <laughs> nice. Um, also, uh, a parachute may be something. <laughs> Now it tells me. <laughs> you are evil. <laughs> There's a lot of steps. I want to take it slow. Gonna, I thought I was going to orbit. A few lives may be sacrificed in the process. So it's, it's important to take things slow. Control, structural, aerodynamic. Uh, you want a utility thingy. It's probably those gears. Action groups. That's not it at all. Uh, <laughs> why'd, you, why'd you click on that? Uh, <laughs> group action. No, what? Huh? Okay, but I'm thin. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, you gotta move your mouse onto it. Oh, I see. I was um, putting the edge on it. Let's see. That adds one. Yeah. 
You can uh, click on it again. Oh, okay. Click on this uh, this button here. Symmetry mode. And now go back to it. That's better. It'll add one on each side. Ah, all right. Okay. Uh, it looks like because of the monitor, the resolution isn't actually high enough. Like the game isn't really made for this, so. Uh, Oh, for that you, you can't actually, yeah, you can't actually see all of the tools, oh, so we okay. won't be able to get to the parachute. But everything else, you know, it's it's we're not gonna yeah. get that um, far. Let's try. <laughs> how long? Oh my god. Let's try. Um, let's see, how can we get you in the air faster? Let's <laughs> no, try. I, I want to learn by failing, because you know what? That's something you have to do with science. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go for it. Yay! Clear. Just uh, clear it. There you go. Make it go away. There's corpses and pieces <laughs> on the on the landing pad. Oh, sorry, pieces and corpses. Pieces. Oh, I thought I heard pieces. There's and yeah, the you can see the explosions and things, so you kind of have to clean off things. <laughs> oh, I didn't do it. I didn't wait for countdown again. <laughs> <laughs> you are such awesome fails. So we are at twenty-two thousand seven hundred thirty thousand dollars. Bob and holding. Bob looks a bit worried. I think I think instead of donations, y'all should be taking bets. <laughs> <laughs> so so John Victor is is asking uh, in the Q and A app, is it possible for sites like CosmoQuest to use a site like Patreon to get recurring donations? Um, and and where we run into difficulties is we're at a state of Illinois state institution. And, and this means that uh, we are facing near astronomical amounts of bureaucracy because five of our state's last seven governors are in jail. And so the state has instituted vast amounts of accountability. Um, and, and I get it, and it makes sense, but this means that everything we do, somebody actually reads the terms of service. <laughs> and and um, the thing that we've run into with Patreon, and I want to sit down and talk to them, but I haven't had a chance to do this yet, is in their terms of service, um, they say something about how any legal issues that ever arise have to be tried in the state of California, and because we're in the state of Illinois, um, that became a no-go for us for Patreon, um, just because we're at a state institution. So what we do instead is we beg on the internet, not on Patreon, but here in this hangout in which we are blowing up Kerbals. Um, so we are currently at uh, <laughs> $22,730. Come on, people. I'm entertain I know I'm entertaining you. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I want to see something. Um, Over the top of your art. So Nancy Graziano oh. is asking, okay. is Fraser joining for KSP? No, he's not. I'm sure he's currently <laughs> laughing his butt at, off at us <laughs> at a distance. <laughs> Shoot! Wait, I can squeeze them on my phone. Oh, that's down. Don't go 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 down. Damn it. <laughs> Watch the ears, because at the moment of complete frustration, the right ear twitches violently. Um, I'm loving the ears. So, so Jim, Jim, Jim Meeker says, uh, there are a ton of tutorial videos on YouTube to help you out with starting KSP. We chose not to watch any of them, because this is so much more I amusing. did not ever play this ever. It's do not watch anything. Fun. Yeah, there, there's something to be said for learning with trial and error. Look, Bob's clapping. <laughs> <laughs> there's something to be said for learning with, with trial and error, uh, as long as you know, the kerbals aren't real things. Um, yes. <laughs> I said, I, I've, I, you know, I've never done rocket things. I did ground-based telescopes. We screwed up a lot of things, uh, but we screwed it up in West Virginia. It was a two-hour drive to fix it before we went to South Africa, and it was a 17-hour plane ride. Oh, here, here's a question I wish I'd seen earlier, and I bet if you tweet at them, you, you can get the answer. The question is, can we buy Planetary Resources t-shirts? I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there's a way to get one. Um, um, 
I want to see where I die. Or Bob dies. I die. I think, I think it's more. Like, you're not allowed to die. We need you to do research. Okay. We are at 22,730 and holding. Is there a way to fast forward? Mm -hmm. Animals. Animals. Oh, yeah, they're probably. <laughs> 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 Camels? Ignore it. <laughs> okay. Someone should have told me about the Reavers before we started. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I haven't encountered any Reavers in Kerbal, but I wouldn't be surprised. I'm, I'm pretty new to you, Firefly. That's why. So, is there a way to fast forward to my doom? Um, yeah. Uh, up here. Okay. Warp! Fast forward thing? Yeah, warp. Yeah. Yeah. Cannot warp well. Oh, uh, you have to uh, get out of get out of him. Uh, so turn your throttle off. So Dusty cool. Wishwine, who's taken, uh, first of all, one of my most okay. favorite yeah. Avatar pictures, um, and he's taken, I think, pretty much all of the classes we've offered through Cosmo Academy. He is offering the advice. The aerodynamics in Kerbal Space Program are weird, so people tend to start turning the rockets on later than in real life. Maybe I just um, float down falling. Yeah, you're falling really quick. It's just a planet, so. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. I think I think wow. I think the fins helps me point down for my fiery death. They did. You had much less spirally doom and much more fiery that I did doom learn from from playing with smaller rockets. <laughs> so, so Sylvan Westby offers, I believe that they angle away from the launch pad in reality as fast as they can in case the rocket comes down again in a huge fireball like That's the proton mean. rocket last year. So it's a measure to protect structures and people. It, it's actually a combination of both. They're, they're trying to take advantage of the rotation rate of the planet Earth um, and they are also trying not to kill humans. And one other thing to think about is when we were launching the space shuttle, they are trying to make sure that if they needed to abort, uh, they could abort to a landing site in Spain. So you wanted to be over Spain at a certain point in your takeoff. And Sylvan goes on to say, So what, Pamela, do you want to try? No. <laughs> Sylvan goes on to say, Corey's angle of attack is okay, 45 degrees are just fine. Then turn off your engine as soon as your uh, apoapsis reaches your desired height, uh, yeah, circa 100 yeah, kilometers that, that in map mode. Then plan your uh, circulating burn at apoapsis and execute at the right time. I don't know what she's, she's making faces. Okay. Did we... Did we okay, hit 25,000? So one thing you can do. <laughs> what? Hi. <Okay. laughs> so one way to solve the problem would be um, to put a bigger rocket on the bottom of your rocket. Oh, you mean the, the, this engine? Yeah, you can like put a bigger rocket below that engine. No, 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 no. Keep the engine there. <laughs> okay. Lift the whole thing up. Like uh, click on the. Damn it. <laughs> Click on the Physics control. not working. There you go. Click on that. That's very now scroll up a bunch. <laughs> Just click on it once. Don't drag it. Click. Now scroll the wheel. It's not acting like a crater. There no. we go. No, it is not a crater. <laughs> it might make a crater. You'll have to go up a ways. Because we're going to put a big rocket. Uh -oh. Okay, that's good. Okay. Okay, now go for propulsion again. Um, let's find, look for, uh, like an orange one. Oh. It's not little. <laughs> <laughs> Holy <laughs> expletive, Batman. So right away. Uh, scroll, scroll down. Yeah. There? Yeah. That doesn't make any there. sense. Hold on, first put that there, okay. Oh, will it? So what you can do is the next one over, I think, or let's see which one. No. Control. No, no, no. Is that a solid rocket engine? There you go. Yes. No. Wow. I want all the things. <laughs> she made a pretty. I love it. 
<laughs> this one is just drowning out the art, like no tomorrow. I think yeah. I think Surly Amy's gonna like adopt you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Steal you from us. What am I doing now? Um, go right because I don't see any. I just yeah, want like the uh, nebula uh, and stars yeah. oh, actually, to frame and hang in my office. office. So uh, set that somewhere. Yeah, you want to put it in between those two. Oh, so okay. you can set it somewhere. Drop this down. Okay, what? Set it, set it over here. Set it on the side. Yes. Okay. Hold this down. There you go. Bill Hinsicker got my hopes up. He posted twenty five thousand dollars exclamation mark smiley face. And I, I didn't have the context because the blessing of the things makes them go yeah, up. And and he was actually suggesting that's how much someone should donate to the giant slab of slab of awesome meteoriteness. Um, I thought that it meant we've hit twenty five thousand dollars. No, we are at twenty two thousand seven hundred and thirty dollars. And holding, which is where I remind myself that we have two bottles of prosecco, not prosciutto, prosecco. <laughs> Two bottles of Prosecco down in the refrigerator. Uh, we are at 8.33 p.m. We are at one hour and 27 minutes left in our Hangout-a-thon. If you have things to suggest for our Cards Against Humanity, not Cards Against Humanity, I would not play that live on the internet. For our game of Cards Against Astronomy, um, tweet them to us now, and we will work on turning some of our blank cards into your suggestions for cards against um, astronomy. So, so Eric Robertson is asking, how, where do I get a copy of Kerbal Space? Corey? The internet. Um, yeah, if you just look up Kerbal Space, they have a copy on um, Steam, on Valve Steam. Thing, whatever you call it, Steam service. The same um, home as port. Why am I overheating? Yeah. What does that mean? Um, just pull down a little bit. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're good. Oh, I can pull ah. now. No. There's too many things happening. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> what? What? I'm gonna set the other stage. Make the thing. Stop and things. <laughs> okay, so 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 you can ger you can get a copy of Kerbal Space in Steam. Um, um, you can also find it on their website. You can buy a, a copy that you can just download your. So. Uh, and since it's on Steam, that means you can get it for Mac and Linux too. Yes, um, I I think it works for Linux, but I do know that it works for Mac. It does. Yeah, it does. I was just on the site. Yeah. Okay. Certain certain Linux. All right, yeah. that was a fail. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Um, Did you crash already? Oh yes. my god! <laughs> she, yeah, wow. she she just went right into the planet. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I agreed to the core. Okay, so so um, Twitter is advising us. Um, yeah. O cloud burst zero is suggesting you want to start your gravity turn at about ten thousand to fifteen thousand. Okay. Um, press uh, T again, so that'll give it like the direction you want it to go, so you don't have to worry about controlling it. Okay. Um, so the engine is a little bit too powerful. Try putting it like. Oh yeah, try like. That's, that's probably good. What the shit balls are they doing? <laughs> I don't know, but they were suddenly singing the lyrics of Rent. Oh, okay. I'm okay. That, that makes sense to me. <laughs> So, so this is where I feel the need. As this might get a little not safe for work. The language from yeah. this point on in the show. <laughs> so, so this is where I have to say that there have been more than one point in time where I have sent home members of my staff and basically said, God damn it, I need you to get something done. Stop laughing and go home. <laughs> I think Don may be at that point. Oh, I'm totally at that point right now. <laughs> but, but, but we are happy, and I need to make sure that Don. Well, I, have, I do have my own office now. You do. So you I do. just hide in there. And but Corey, when we were in the other office, I had to go home. <laughs> and and Corey, Corey and I take turns fleeing home to yes. get work done. Yes. And he just bought a house. I don't do it so. I don't work so well. Enough. So donate money for Corey's house. <laughs> there you and go. Happy birthday, Corey. Yes, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday, Corey. Yes. So donate oh, yes, money for yes. Corey's birthday. Yes. 
Yes. Well, you were my birthday yesterday. house. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And that's awesome. You did get a birthday house, didn't you? Yeah. That's, that was yeah, yeah, get sort of birthday my house. birthday present for me. Yay, Yay. for Dad. <laughs> I got a bridle for my horse. You so totally win. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what now? For my 16th birthday, I got a ladder. A ladder. What I want. All right, then. Okay, so... What's I got to do the other thing! <laughs> and stuff! Go! Uh. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Are we just skipping for good match? Okay, so... What, it, what they were saying earlier is, um, press yeah. M. She showed up the Kevlar Club. What? <laughs> okay, so oh, so in. I can actually like control things now. Not yeah. kind of so you can see your apoapsis there, yeah. uh, the AP. We want that to be a lot higher. You want it to be no, no, no. You want it to be mass over the apoapsis there. That should be about a hundred thousand. Ninety-six, ninety-six. Okay, now you can turn off your engine, and that'll get you high enough to. Uh, how do I do? How do I do that? Oh, uh, press. Okay, right. There's a button, but I don't remember what it is. What do I press? Control. Control. Oh, right. Yeah, it'll be a throttle, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I thought there was an off button. <laughs> Rockets don't have an off button. No, they <laughs> throttle down. And they throttle back to I, avoid vibrations at a certain I point during launch. I am so the worst space Hey, Kerbal ever. does have an off button. If you want to use it, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. okay, so whenever you get to the top. Yeah. So, then, so Keeper uh, of the Cards Against Humanity, we have oh, received a request to add a Kerbal to the cards. Okay, that's <laughs> the first one I've seen. So. Okay, so we are now going to create a Cards Against Astronomy card that says a Kerbal. Just a Kerbal or a Kerbal that knows it's about to die of fire? Yes. <laughs> Let's do both. Let's do both. Yes. I think the fiery death card is understood. <laughs> So, so while we are laughing our, our everything off, um, and continuing, my oh, we're now up to $22,755. Okay, you can totally do better than that. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't Somebody snap tell at me how to spell Kerbal. K-E-R-B-A-L. Okay, so like, uh, yes. So, so this, this really is an off, awesome opportunity to show how people should learn. This is a gamifi gamified case of teaching orbital mechanics using inquiry-based learning that is actually built on like all of the most awesome. But like a lot of inquiry-based learning, it needs some direction, or else somebody might get fed up if they're not as yeah, so there, directed there, as yeah. There is guided inquiry yeah, going and on. And there is a tutorial. Uh, <laughs> So Joe, who went home for a little while because he has a raiding party tonight, um, I love my staff. <laughs> so Joe, who went home so he wouldn't miss a raid tonight, um, just added, um, holy moly, how many times has she crashed and burned? A lot, a lot. You have T press right now? Unpress T. Don's dying <laughs> No, that would be tiny oh. intern oh. squeaky. Oh, okay. I thought that was Don dying. <laughs> no. <laughs> Everyone is squeaky. Okay, now you can throw up. Uh, so, yes. Jim Meeker has added staging achievement unlocked. And. Thank you. Nobody is leaving me. What? The way you said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, there you go. And uh, zoom out a bit because it looks like you've almost got it. Oh my god, no. <laughs> That's the plan still. <laughs> Close enough. Oh, I see. It's moving. You, you are falling while missing the planet Earth. This that, is that, called that, flying. That's, mm -hmm. that's orbit. Well, I'm not missing yet. I'm, I'm getting to the missing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are getting vines of this, right? I don't know how to vine, so no. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> it looks like you will. I, I apologize in advance for the variable audio quality and audio volume that is about to come oh, yeah, from my nice. staff. 
What? <laughs> I'm a space goddess. <laughs> we are T minus eight. <laughs> we have a space goddess crutch. Is look at it go. <laughs> we, we are T minus eighteen minutes and counting to the uncorking of the prosciutto. No. No. Yeah, prosciutto. The champagne. Okay. The white. No, not for shoot. <laughs> Look, I'm in orbit. Yep. I'm in orbit. We we are T minus <laughs> 18 minutes and counting Wait, to the uncorking of the sparkling know. white wine so from we Italy. That orbit? Is that why that's, that's there? That's okay. Oh my God, that's very elliptical. Stop. <laughs> um. M? M? Okay. Hold control. Am I going to the sun? No, you're probably going to the moon. Okay, <laughs> okay uh, let's, really uh, zoom out. let's zoom out and see where you're at. Okay, that's not the moon yet. There's, There's the moon. There's the moon. moon. I'm tired. You guys are moon? moon? Seriously? <laughs> Spelling is awesome. All right, so. Um, actually, if you. Go, 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 can you go back to that? Uh, yes. <laughs> you can probably actually run into the moon. Sure, why not? Okay. Um, this is going to be really complicated. Uh, I just fudge it. <laughs> so you probably want to go a little bit slower than that. Oh, okay. Um, a lot slower, actually. Okay. I'm like, do it! Okay. Uh, now, now let's see where we're going. Oh, no! <laughs> down. Da no, got to be there. Down. Down. Off. Backwards. Oh. <laughs> Um, you can turn the rocket around and slow down. That's focused. I keep going for the arrows. Yep. You have, uh, you have two crosses, so it's going to fight on us. No! So, 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 artificial gravity! Woo! <laughs> Hi. So, so Tiny Intern is, is currently drawing a cow going to the moon because the cow jumped over the moon. In Cyberland, yes, it's true. <laughs> oh, that's why! Okay, I get it. Slow down, slow down. I don't oh, know oh, you how got it. Yeah, you had a better idea of just pressing T. That that's what I tried to do, and then I must have pressed it again. Yeah. Over the moon! Um, right, so do it again. That's, that's the wrong one. I know, I know. That's why I'm just testing. Okay. <laughs> I swear, I was just testing. Tease for testing. You were making sure that I knew. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> Bill's clapping. Did I kill Bill? Stop it. Stop it. Okay. Yeah, if you make it really tiny, there's a way that you can. Here, uh. Turn off throttle. Press on. Click on that. You might just be able to. No, never mind. I know there's a way that you can control it while you're looking at the map, but I don't know. Um, Someone's yeah, probably so going to tweet it out. Yeah, right just, now. just no, fudge it. Looking at Twitter. There you go. Yeah, check that out. <laughs> um, stop right about now. You're good. Okay. I'm gonna turn right. Yeah, you're, oh, you're yeah, good. it really doesn't matter. It's space. You're on a collision course. Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah. I get the Kerbal X Prize. <laughs> <laughs> the Kerbal Lunar X Prize. Sweet. Okay. Um, now should I fast forward? Yeah, you can speed up time. Um, not the most arrows, but somewhere. somewhere. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! <sighs> It's probably the prosciutto. <laughs> the prosciutto. Right? She said prosciutto, right? Right? Okay, thank you. That's what the Bruce said, too. <laughs> the Bruce's are always right. 
Turn next to Aaron for a couple of seconds. Get a human. One time. There you One. go. Okay, now I Do you can't press really. M to go back? I want to see the final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. You're probably not going to see it until you collide with it. Awesome! <laughs> I'm going to make a new career. <laughs> Here, go back to regular time. Because you probably. Oh, yeah. You might have actually passed it. I don't really know. Um, try. Okay, double click on the moon. Okay. I think. Where the moon's going to be? Where the moon is now. Uh, or click on it once. Set as target. Okay, now double click back on you. I think it did something weird. Okay, now go back into regular view. Somewhere around here, there's going to be a thing. Okay. I think it might be purple. The pink, yeah, the magenta thing. Yeah, and that's going to point at the moon. So. So you want if you angle your your rocket at the moon, you can sort of tell where it's at. See the moon coming. Yeah. Sugar. Sugar. Since really, really <laughs> need more. That really a good idea. Okay, I was watching Corey, not you. <laughs> <laughs> now try to get the camera We're looking that way. Long. Now it's either going to be facing the moon or the exact opposite direction. It's either be 180 or it's probably wrong. I'm probably ass end. Yeah, I'm ass end. There's the moon. moon. Okay, well that's good because you're gonna have to slow down. I thought it was just gonna crush. Maybe. Uh, Maybe it's we'll we'll see how close you get to it. Right. So speed yeah, up. speed up a bit. You can probably speed it up like four or five arrows. So you get your free part. Good God, man. Careful. <laughs> you should tweet that. It'll go nicely with the jacket. Oh, I see it. <laughs> oh, I see it. No, that didn't do it. I don't. Oh, you're fast forwarding. You can't. You can't do anything. I can't change things on fast forward yes. in time. <laughs> she will successfully crash into the moon. Sweet. We will we'll, we'll make sure. <laughs> for you folks. Yes. Just for you folks. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Oh, you're trying to point directly at the moon? Yes! Sorry, that was out. <laughs> 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 Damn it. <laughs> What's it happening? Oh, why am I crusting? I didn't mean to do that. Oh, just uh, let yourself go. It looks like you're. Oh, you're heading toward it. There you go. Oh. You're going right for it. So I got a T at the thing. Yeah, yeah. T now? Now? Close enough. Ish. Yeah. Close enough for sure Kerbal. Close, yeah. close yeah. enough for Kerbal work. Now going straight at it isn't really going to make you alive. Well, it might because the man's moving. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, see. Press M again. We'll see if we're on a collision course. Looks like it. Yeah, just let it go. Can you speed up time now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> ah, crap. There goes the moon. Nah, wah wah. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I explain how to crash into the moon, but it would be it would take a while. It would be complicated. Yeah. <sighs> Are they still? Oh yeah, they can still go to sleep. This is yeah. the blackness. Yeah. Oh, you want me to want me to make you crash into the moon? You want me to explain how? Yeah. Why are you crashing to the moon for for the nice people? Should I? Yes. Okay. Crash to the moon for the nice people. Okay, All right. We we are at T. <laughs> your anger it feeds me, Joe Moore. Um, <laughs> Somebody said something about a slab of awesomeness. Oh, that would be the meteorite chunk from the last hour. Oh, that slab, yeah. So so Bill Hinsicker writes. 
I have to go now. I regret that I can only afford ten dollars a month. You all deserve so much more. But you know, seriously, we we just want your love and support, and you've been here all weekend, and we want your brains. We want you to do science. We want you to help us mark craters, help us mark wrinkle ridges, help us identify all the crazy linear and non-linear features that decorate all the rocky worlds we're trying to explore. We wish we didn't have to beg for money, but we have to. But I'd much rather beg that you participate in science, and that's that luckily is free. So then we have from Dusty. Um, things I learned from the Kirtle Space Program. Words like apoapsis and periapsis. It's true. It's true. All right, I'm just going to thrust straight toward the moon just to give me a better idea of what I'm doing. And we are T minus seven minutes and counting to cards against astronomy and opening the sparkling white wine from Italy. And I have ginger beer for the youngins. Non-alcoholic <laughs> ginger beer, as opposed to the alcoholic ginger beer that I discovered they have in New Zealand. Thing, yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't switch from beer to ginger beer in New Zealand and think it's going to help you not get drunk. Oh. And Tiny in turn is dying of giggles in the corner. Yes, <laughs> can can we share your cow on the internet? <laughs> Show Nebula Woman on the internet? No. So this is the cow that jumped over the moon. No. No? Okay. Jumped over the moon. <laughs> if you don't understand the references, shame on you. I love the fact that this cow is giving the baby rocket a very dubious look. <laughs> that is just truly, truly awesome. Cow. It's, it's a cow giving the rocket a very dubious look. It's a suspicious cow. Does somebody want to bring Nebula Girl over? So, so this is what Tiny was working on in the background. Um, it's it's a woman inspired by a nebula, or vice versa. I'm not sure, but I do know I want to own the dress. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, and the hair. The hair, the hair was only going to happen if we hit the the Khaleesi blonde number, which we're not going to hit. No, no, I was. Yeah. See, Khaleesi blonde is the precursor to that color of purple. Can you send me the private hangout link? Yeah. I'm going to forward it to the Bruce's. So thanks. Is that possible? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see red everywhere? We're on a collision course with the moon. Oh, I can see it. I love the Oh, I see it! That was very Thanks, loud. That was, that was just for the VSP people. <laughs> Did you just try the whole moon? I think so. Oh my gosh, it's not much of a moon, is it? No, it's just <laughs> weird. I think I went through the moon a little bit. <laughs> the time was going too fast. It did not know what to do. <laughs> you can see parts of the moon there. Just, uh, yeah. the surface there. And worse, space Oh, don't say that around the place. Oh, so, so I was so that tiny that that was good science when I saw it, but I was like three. Not say that around the place. We're just enough different in age that to me it was just people bouncing around in space. Where the moon was ripped away from the Earth. Yeah, I have no memory of that part. I just remember people with a very elongated spaceship that bounced a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's the moon traveled throughout the galaxy. Oh. Randomly. That's a bit problematic. With a shapeshifter. Yeah, it was, uh, it okay, was but 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 Deep Space Nine had a shapeshifter, an wormhole. Yes, but she was the only alien. And oh. Some big hairy, hairy, right, hairy, are you sending me the thing? Some yeah. Which way? Oh, okay. I just want to know what to open. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I closed everything in case we needed Kerbal. Oh oh, I have an announcement. Uh, as of. 
uh, an hour ago. I am now, um, so if you follow Astro Tweets on Twitter, if you follow Astro Tweets on Twitter, uh, every week you get a new astronomer who uh, takes over the Twitter feed, talks to you about the work that they're doing, uh, and as of an hour ago, I have been put in charge of the Astro Tweets account for this week. So follow Astro Tweets. It's just a, a, a running gaggle of amazing astronomers of our friend Bill Keel has done a week. Uh, this started, I think, at the last uh, astronomy conference. So uh, follow Astro Tweets. Uh, I will be this week's astronomer, and there will be more awesome astronomers to follow. So check that out. We, we are now at $22,805. Oh, come on, 23. So, so if we can hit, so the miracle goal I'm now going to reach for is let's see if we can hit 25,000 by 10 p.m. I, that's kind of impossible. I think we've only made over 1,000 in our very first hour. But my driving goal, I'm going to be happy no matter what. You guys out there have given so much. You have laughed with us. You have moved with, been moved with us emotionally. You have talked about exploration. You have I marked craters. I actually had tears, you guys. So that happens. Happy tears. <laughs> we, we are happy no matter what. But if we, by some awesome miracle of wonder we could hit 25,000 by the end of tonight, that would make me pretty darn happy. Um, I'm so, pretty sure there'd be lots of happy dancing. This kills the intern. What are you doing? Do not intern. suffocate the intern. <laughs> Twenty-five thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan will suffocate the intern. <laughs> what is happening? They're, those two are like the siblings they ever had. <laughs> and and Joe is like the big brother yes. to them. Yes. So so. so cute. <laughs> oh. All right. So. What I've done is I've added 12 solid boosters onto the side of it. I think I need to add another six though, just in case. Just for shits and giggles. <laughs> Alright, I just found a piece of Oreo filling in my carpeting. <laughs> this has been... I'm terrified now. Alright, Bruce's. Oreo cookie filling in my carpeting. <laughs> All right, so I'm I'm so I keep giving chat to the Bruce's. That's the uh, group me back channel of my life. Uh, there are Matt Art Lab people there. There are uh, puppet people there. There are uh, amazing science communicators there of all kinds. Um, so. I'm asking them to, to come try the hang out and, and uh, play with us. So, uh, we had Steve the group on earlier. He may or may not be in bed, I'm not sure. Uh, we have Liz, Tiny Shark. Shark Shark! Shark Shark! Tiny Shark Shark! You might come in. Shark Shark, the movie about an animal that has a shark for a body and a shark. For a head. I still can't believe that somebody made a tumbler of that after Tim had months What is he doing? Are you just burning the planet? The, um, no, the rocket was accelerating so quickly that it's caught on fire. It is 9 one <laughs> and we should get uh, Christian Bruce in here too. I don't think we've ever heard from him. So Joe, Joe just messaged me. Oh, I need that intern. <laughs> and yeah, think, Amy can't have the intern. Oh, I did say that intern. Amy was going to steal you away. <laughs> hey, Matthew. You, you can. I, I really, honestly think that if you, Amy, and Joe worked together. In your and grumpy, so. surly, bouncy combination of ways, you could take over the internet. <laughs> now we're gonna have a Joe, Tiny, Tim, Etsy store. Who needs to crumb? Yeah, I can see that being a thing. <laughs> oh, sure. I don't know. Are you blowing stuff up? So. I don't know. I put that under the night. And then we were gonna do cards and stuff. It's so cute. He thinks there's still a schedule. Oh, Your shirt is so cute! Yeah, You're hugging! <laughs> <laughs> That's not astrophysical. Like, oh my god. So, Stand in front of the camera. <laughs> Corey owns the most amazing collection of 
t-shirts of our entire team. And I think one of the most frequently uttered statements of the past, we've been working together since 2008, so of the past too many years for me to actually mention online. Uh, in all of these years that we've been working together, I believe the most often stated non-programming related sentence uh, was, oh my god, I love your shirt. Um, me to Corey. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've heard that probably about 50 times from people that I work with. I've heard it about 50 times from me alone. Yeah, I've heard it for two years. You definitely have heard it more than 50 times from me because you own that. more shirts than that. And We and, say it every yeah. time we see the same shirt. And your <laughs> Cookie Monster shirt gets it pretty much every time, and your Hulu shirt that you were wearing yesterday gets it just about every time. Yeah. I should point out that I am wearing a, uh, I'm wearing a shirt as well that is appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I like that shirt. What is it wearing? I don't know. It's behind caster. our camera. Oh, awesome. The uh, solar. I think it's a solar system from the what do you call it? Heliocentric. Yes. The the the, the universe is getting better. Like cosmology getting better with age. No, no. Which one are you? You're not wearing an astronomy cast. That's not one of ours. Is it? No, no, no. This is keeps the controversy. <laughs> oh, teach the controversy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's the geocentric teach the controversy shirt. Ah, nice. uh, okay. So, so the problem that we're dealing with is we have the monitor set up so that we can make eye contact. It's a list! And you're completely occulting your shirt with your camera. Um, and that's okay. Liz Burns is joining. Liz is a teacher and a uh, tiny, also a tiny person. We had tiny fun uh, in Boston <laughs> when I was in Boston for Don Astronomy. Hello. Hello. It's my shark! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wear my shark hat. I love it. Welcome, welcome to the Hangoutathon. I know you, I've see, I've been seeing you guys in the group meet now and again. Uh, Do you want to put on your llama shirt and join us, Tiny? Um, it, it, it has, okay. Yeah, that's what I meant. It, it, inter, it, the, interpret nouns is needed at this point in the, the hangout. Why am I not there? Because I'm joining you or just because I'm... Because, because, because people are like, where's Tiny intern? They miss you. Whoa, there's lots of things <laughs> opening. It's yeah, <laughs> we've, we've gone, like, out of Wait. orbit. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's it's going around the sun now. I was trying to get the And almost colliding on the planet. I was, I was really trying close. to get right there. That works. Close that enough. works. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to knock over the camera this time. What is it would have Wait, what's on your head? There. Okay. She has a little, what is I it? have an alpaca hat. <laughs> It's got cupcakes on the side. It's essentially the greatest thing ever. <laughs> so, Tiny Liz, meet Tiny Intern. Hi! <laughs> Hi! So, she uh, has a shark hat. Her hat she can does. eat my hat. I'm going to stay over here. <laughs> <laughs> we did mention uh, the, the Singular podcast uh, back in the day at Dragon Con, Liz, where... Uh, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> you heard that part? Okay, yeah. And, and Pavel goes, who gave that 12-year-old? Yes, it is. Who gave that 12-year-old a bottle of wine? And we're like, no, she's in her 20s. Yeah, no, <laughs> she's, she's a school teacher. Well, that was after the very first time I met Pamela, uh, I believe you asked me what grade I'm in. <laughs> yeah, so, so worse than that, I asked if you were the teen skeptic. Oh, right. <laughs> I, I thought you were the new head of Team Skeptic that, that Rebecca had been talking about, and no. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm an adult. <laughs> well, that would have made sense. Well, I think calling Rebecca, someone an adult is an insult. It's true. In Rebecca case. introduced us, so. So we are now at $22,830, and I believe it is time for us to... Pull out the cards against astronomy, which somebody who's not back here should do. Jordan, <laughs> you're touching I want those cards. Come here. <laughs> Why am I not holding alcohol? I thought um, this segment had alcohol. Yeah, this segment is about to have alcohol. I'm going to ask Tim to be the bearer Thank of the you. alcohol. We have non-alcoholic like ginger beer for the 19-year-olds uh, in the room. Hurt me. And, and, the old yeah, and Jordan. Jordan. And Jordan. And the old woman. With mine. Uh, and and, and okay, and, then, um, yes, we did bring up enough ginger beer for that. Okay. Right. right here. Okay. Anybody else have yeah. Tim Minchin stuck in their head now? Have what, what song? What happened, Tim? That ginger beer, and now I have a Tim Minchin song stuck in my head. <laughs> <laughs> we want a Tim Minchin song. 
Um, Only a ginger can call a ginger ginger. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that song. So, so this is our new tradition. This is two years in a row that we have done this to ourselves and to the internet. We have the sounds of sparkling Italian white wine. This sounds suspiciously like Italian ham when I pronounce the word. No, uh, you actually said prosciutto. I did. We've all decided. I totally it. said prosciutto. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> like the person who said it. I had to say prosecco. <laughs> hey, you're back with us. Hey, DeGroove. Hey. You're not wearing a funny I'm just hat. I'm going to warn you right now. I don't know what like, half of these mean, so I'm going to ask dumb questions the entire time we're playing. Oh, that's okay. Joe, not, I Joe, is, Joe is the same way, and you Only can still come up with funny answers. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to make this. Visit idiots. What? There are no stupid <laughs> questions. Just oh, what that? What, what, what? I'm just moving things. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think we really. Need Who's responsible for that? I mean, we could no, leave it running I, and I, just have a good screen. Yeah. yeah, no, that can, that's fine. Yeah, I just can, wanted to. Can we very carefully set it on top of your laptop? Or just do that and make that it no longer a screensaver? Never oh. mind. That's weird. <laughs> oh, I guess it's just here. Yeah, clown shit, shell mode. Doesn't work here. Alright. Right. <laughs> that ever happens. Oh, wow, it actually turned it off. Is that a questionable content shirt, Nicole? I think it is, yes. <laughs> okay, I thought so. I was trying to remember. I, I knew I'd seen that one before, but I couldn't remember the origin. Oh, I have a pair of horse is not working. I permanently made Matthew the primary focus. Which is fine. We love you, but we don't want to put you on the spot. Okay, now we'll Well, I can... Yeah! Who's <laughs> <laughs> alcohol? I'm not giving her alcohol. <laughs> I got to sing a song. What the power? Did you manage to get this <laughs> onto the ground somewhere where this cable doesn't destroy the world? You have the world's most amazing HDMI cable if your cable cable is capable of destroying the world. Um, I can't just talk about somebody's <laughs> HDMI cable like that. <laughs> oh man! So this is the last hour of our 36 <laughs> hour straight hangout a thon. This is the beginning of 36 more days of us working to crowdsource um, our future. We, we are trying to make it so that we can survive in this day where mission funding is getting slashed, where the grant programs that we'd like to renew no longer exist, where we're finding out from the National Science Foundation that senior people like me are only supposed to ask for two months' salary per grant, and we only have a 15% chance of getting any one grant, which means we basically have zero chance of paying all of our salary off of grants anymore. We asked for your help, and you responded with, so far we're at uh, refreshing the page. We are at $22,830, for which I cannot say thank you enough. I sang for my supper all week, all weekend, <laughs> and gave the 19-year-old orange, orange cream soda, apparently, <laughs> instead of... of ginger beer. Um, <laughs> and I would like to offer a toast to the internet because people is good. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for helping us. Thank, Thank you, you. internet. Oh, I you. will toast with my thumb. Bring bring own drink. Drink. Uh, I'm drinking wine in bed. This is awesome. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers internet. To Thank you. people with good of the internet. To science! Science! Science. science! Neil Tyson was drinking wine on Cosmos, and I was I was thinking that that was, that was a moment that we should have all shared in. Well, I was too busy crashing into the moon. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, so one of the things that I was really loving is in the past hour, I've, I've seen a whole bunch of people tweeting, let me see if I can find one of them, uh, basically that they're going to be watching um, uh, uh, Cosmos later, and they actually had their own hashtag for this. Um, yeah, so Jeff Seltzer Setzer is one of the people he, he tweeted at Cosmos on TV. Uh, hashtag watching Cosmos later because Cosmo Quest X hang out of fun to raise money for you to do science. Join. Thank you. And and so there were a whole bunch of people tweeting that they're catching Cosmos later because they hung out with us. Yay. And I don't know about that, but I tweeted on the Hashtag Cosmos that people should come here. So thank you, Liz. Some Twitter nerds saw that maybe. <laughs> you, you know, if if we had the money they have for one episode of Cosmos just to do all of their video production, CGI, everything else. Yeah, just think on that one. Also, uh, Brian Brian George from Mad Art Lab, who you saw earlier, if you love. Uh, because Mad Art Live has been watching Cosmos every week as well with their own hashtag, MalCosmos. Uh, if you love astronomy and science, you should throw a couple bucks to Cosmo Quest X during the fundraiser right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Brian. Ooh, blingy. And, and Jeff just tweeted a picture of food that I have to read because it looks weird. Orange and red jambalaya. That's why I don't recognize it. Jambalaya is ready. Uh, that will be my toast to you. Thank you for introducing me to what that looks like, because I would have never understood what that picture was. It merely confused me. I'm a northerner. I'm still learning about these things. My my people around me learned I've never had fried Ooh. okra, and apparently this needs to get fixed. Yeah, it looks it's really tasty, tasty Jeff. <laughs> um, yeah, you guys have been with us all day. What do we have yeah. coming in on oh, the... Drink. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe Moore added to the Q&A app just the word clink. Joe... We know you have a rating party. Man's <laughs> gotta have priorities. Here's to you. <laughs> so, so Joe is our HTML5 ninja who's been working with us since the very beginning of Cosmo Quest and has been here. And he was here all night feeding the two of us through our late night shift. So yeah. thank you, yeah. Joe. That thank was awesome. you, Joe. And one of the truly awesome things, uh, I, I still remember. We launched CosmoQuest at, mid well, we missed midnight. We, we ended up launching CosmoQuest at, I think, 9 a.m. January 1st, 2012? 2013. No, you came in year two of the project. You're right, 2012. <laughs> yeah, so, so we launched it at uh, 9 a.m. January 1, 2012, and Corey, Joe, and I program through the entire night. I think Corey and I have permanently damaged our ability to transform short-term memory to long-term memory because of the number of all-nighters that we've pulled in the past two years. It's actually true. <laughs> it, has, it has damaged my short-term memory. <laughs> it, has, it has damaged mine as well. Um, I, I learned from Llewellyn Falco last week that better programming through more sleep is a philosophy we need to adopt. Yes. And this is something that we're working to do. But that particular night, we had not yet learned it. We were young. We thought we were um, unharmable. We were wrong. We programmed through the night. And at midnight, people started shooting off fireworks and having the audacity to celebrate New Year's. And the three of us just sat on the internet and grumbled at each other because our train of thought was getting broken. Um, and it's nice to sit here a couple years later having our first science paper out. Um, our funding situation has gotten scarier and scarier, but we're one of the survivors. We've made it through sequestration. We've made it through funding cuts. And I'm hoping we'll keep making it through, and that's up to you guys. Um, we've come a long way, and now we're going to celebrate it by admitting just how awful a set of people we are by playing hard <laughs> against astronomy. Um, I don't think we have any more donations. Yeah, we want to see 23K. Yeah, we're still at 22,880. I think you definitely need to get to 23 tonight. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
retweeted. So I want to see all the retweets. I want to see the hashtag hangoutathon trend. I know that's way too much to ask for. But for now, you have cards. I'm taking cards. I don't know cards. how many people there will be, so I just made five miles. Okay. <laughs> Put a pile on top. Well, I definitely don't have any cards, so I, I cannot know. do... Yeah, we, we can't really game easily, game. like, show you mm. these. Yeah. Things. Can we make them take turns judging us? That's what I was going to say. You can okay. read them to... You read your combinations <laughs> or submissions to us, and we can pick the best. Okay. Let's do that. Tim, do you want to be the designated reader, and then they will pick? Come on, they were boy. Any <laughs> <laughs> disembodied voice off? You get to be the disembodied voice on the internet. Here, I'll give you the yeah. file. Yeah. <laughs> I got your bird pink Yay, get her boy. Silly hat. Step for me. There's a pair. Oh, thanks. Uh, what do you need a silly hat for? Because reasons. <laughs> I get to keep my hair. A bit sad we don't have $50,000 in donations, but I get to keep my hair. hair. <laughs> that was scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready? I don't Who's know, there's still 40 round? minutes left. Liz? <laughs> what? <laughs> Liz Bruce, do you want to judge I'm this I'm tweeting round? for you, okay? I'm tweeting. Thank you. <laughs> well, what's, what's going on? Are you, do you want to judge this round? Sure. You're on the left, you start. <laughs> okay. Due to budget cuts, the space agency has been forced to cancel the blank program. <laughs> Oh boy, <laughs> this will not end wow. well. All of these could work. <laughs> yes, on the touchpad. Let's do that. <laughs> I I have no good ones. This is mine randomly like this. Like sounds this. dirty, and she won't know what it actually means. <laughs> How do you know? So no one in this circle is judging, right? No. Okay, Liz. so I can ask you what things are, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wait, but I can hear you. <laughs> No. <laughs> ask her quietly. <laughs> yeah, ask her quietly. I'm just going to show her. Due to budget cuts, the space agency has been forced to cancel the first porno filmed in space program. <laughs> forced to cancel the Neil deGrasse Tyson's mustache program. <laughs> has been forced to cancel the Bailey's Beads program. <laughs> Dirty to think about it, right? Has been forced to cancel the Chris Hadfield Space Oddity video. <laughs> oh! And due to budget cuts, the space agency has been forced to cancel the Drawing a Penis on Mars program. <laughs> that happened. That's a thing. Mars on rover driver accident. is partially responsible. Liz. Oh, wait. wait, that's a real thing? Yeah. 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 I'm going to find Ooh. the Liz, I'm going to have to go with the Mars penis. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Up until then, it was DeGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson's mustache, oh, but I think the, the space penis. <laughs> <laughs> I want all my kids to be happy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Who had space penis? That was me. Jordan had space penis. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> oh, corrupting the youngins. Okay. <laughs> Who's next? Matthew? I guess so. I'm, I'm judging. I want balloon genitalia. <laughs> you take my money, I want balloon genitalia. Okay, that we've explained for people just tuning no, in. No, it Wait. doesn't. So you <laughs> have to go back and watch the segment. That's true, you need to go back and watch the segment on which we had Mad Art Lab. Does the winner of Spa uh, Cards Against Astronomy get um, balloon genitalia? I think that should be it. That Somebody be tell Ryan. <laughs> 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 you get two. You get two. You can have oh, the. Can have have double. You can have a set. <laughs> <laughs> One for each wrist. <laughs> <laughs> Walking around it. <laughs> yeah, it's Bible Belt beware. <laughs> nope, there it is. Okay, so we are about to screen share, and Mars rover driver, who is now long, no longer a driver of the Mars rovers, um, is one of the people inadvertently responsible for this getting <laughs> created on the surface of Mars, where it shall remain until a sandstorm washes it away. I approve. They claim it was this an accident. This needs more fun <laughs> 
Yeah. Right, it was a carefully programmed accident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think... I, I, I hate to... I hate to... To, to pour cold water, but that's just the shape you make when you have a six-wheeled vehicle trying to make a turn on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> but we can still celebrate the human brain's ability to find patterns in any... Characteristics. <laughs> this is okay. why CosmoQuest works. Because you're all really dirty people. <laughs> Something. That's not why it works. That's why we do recognize that the crack in the universe is on the surface yes. of yes. Vesta? Pareidolia. Yes, Vesta. The, the crack in the universe was on Vesta. Okay, what is our next black card, sir? We were blown away to find that the universe had evolved from blank. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, cosmologist. <laughs> we were blown away to find out that the universe had evolved from Vladimir Putin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> we were blown away to find out the universe had evolved from a triple fried egg and chutney sandwich. We are at $22,900. I still have a secret wish in my, whole, in my heart to hit 25000 If we can hit 23000 I'll still do a very tiny happy dance. <laughs> we were blown away to find out the universe had evolved from Nazis on the moon. <laughs> I, I don't have... Oh, that's in my handwriting. That's in my handwriting. <laughs> I mean, that means this came out at uh, Science Online. <laughs> We I think I was in the room when that one up. came out. What? I was in the room when that one came out. Oh, you were? I was going to say yeah. like this. <laughs> we were blown away to find out the universe evolved from hot space sex. Like you do. <laughs> As one does. It is the Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> Bethany needs well more done. alcohol. Or less sleep. Well done, sir. <laughs> We were, and finally, we were blown away to find that the universe had evolved from Richard Branson terraforming the universe. That's awesome. <laughs> I gotta go with the hot space sex. Woo! Yeah. As one does. <laughs> I'll take that. Who won? Who was it? Corey. 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 You guys gotta be so, so far. But for what you do not yet know, is Corey is capable, Corey, there are two people I know capable of winning anything, Corey Lehan and Laura Burns, and if the two of them are ever brought together, we did that. We didn't play enough games. <laughs> oh, okay, so was, okay. Laura had a migraine. Yeah, right. we played Flux. Yeah, yeah, we played Flux a lot. Oh, was that I the game it. that didn't freaking yeah. end? Yes. Oh, four. <laughs> that could have been it, yeah. See? Four there was reference. one particular round that never ended. Four I played Zombie the game. Flux last weekend, and it was amazing. Yes. For those playing the game, for reference, the winners so far have been a penis on Mars and hot space sex. <laughs> so if there's a trend there, we'll see. Where's Astro Pixie? Yeah, I was about I to know. say. She and I have the same dissertation advisor. All right, Steve. Yes, ma'am. You are judging. Okay. <laughs> Go, Mr. Legauer. I cannot believe that star is cataloged with the name blank. <laughs> Are you ready, Steve? Oh, yeah. Can you use your judgment? Working on it. <laughs> have to remember them. This is going to be a big challenge for you. <laughs> Everybody in. Try to keep all the answers in my brain. <laughs> I can't believe that Star is cataloged with the name Buzz Aldrin. Yeah. I can't. I can't believe that Star is cataloged with the name Duck Dodgers of the 24th and a half century. <laughs> $22,920. Oh, my God. I can't believe that Star is cataloged with the name The Milky Way. Yeah, that was pretty bad. I can't believe that hey. star is cataloged with the name Awkwardly Getting Close to Orion's Belt. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't believe that star is cataloged with the name Chris Hadfield's Mustache. 
I sense an obsession with facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> this was this this game was crowdsourced by you. <laughs> Came from you people. Okay, okay. If we if we hit twenty five thousand before this is over, I will shave my beard. <gasps> Gasp. 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 <laughs> <laughs> We are at 22,805, and the gauntlet has been laid down. If we hit 24,000, Dr. Mr. Francis, I think he said the person who runs... Uh, we'll make it 24,000. Okay. Yeah. okay, all right, the, the person who runs our Cosmo Academy oh, program shit. will shave his beard of awesome. <laughs> Awesome. This, the, the, the challenge has been laid out. But first we have to figure out who wins this round of Cards Against Astronomy. Steve's being pensive. Well, I think the obvious answer is awkwardly close to Orion's belt. Poor oh, sword! Good job, Drew. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Corey's <laughs> correct. Yeah. Corey always wins. If it is called, Corey wins. <laughs> <laughs> Also, those are all asteroids getting dangerously close to Earth. All the question marks. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You are on the first Virgin Galactic flight. What is your first task? <laughs> getting John Berman to leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's a challenge. Uh, okay, Liz, this is you. Yeah. Okay. Read it again. You are on the first Virgin Galactic flight. What is your first task? <laughs> that would have been funny too. <laughs> well, that doesn't matter. Yeah, that's true. All right. <laughs> well, why did I get it now? <laughs> you are on the first Gal Virgin Galactic flight. What is your first task? Huffing rocket fuel. <laughs> Glor glory, honor, and cash. <laughs> That's already occurred. Ridiculous internet memes. <laughs> Sneaking liquor onto the space shuttle. <laughs> Being hunted by Orion. Okay. Getting awkwardly close to, to his job. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh! What was the one that I liked? Oh, I think internet memes would be very important in a situation like that. Yeah, they're like brand new memes that you know. The tiny no one wins. Such space, very well. Good job, tiny intern. <laughs> <laughs> we have a tiny intern and a tiny shark. Yes. Oh yeah, that's tiny interns. Do you? Yeah, <laughs> I noticed. Hello. <laughs> okay, I tweeted the challenge. Maybe we'll see if any of my followers hate my beard enough to donate money. Yeah. <laughs> or love humili humiliating you enough. Anyway. Well, they almost certainly do that. Okay. Sorry for Mr. Francis. All right, ready for Matthew to judge? Is it my turn? Okay. On the space station, astronauts use blank to keep busy. Because <laughs> I've already tipped my uh, hand on what kind of topic I, I like in this. I'm sorry, did you say to keep busy or to get busy? <laughs> uh, keep. Keep busy. <laughs> oh, okay. as you will. <laughs> On the space station, astronauts use ejecta blanket to keep busy. <laughs> Ooh. Practicing safe cratering. <laughs> On the space station, astronauts. Cover your scarf before you. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go ahead. Astronauts use farting in a spacesuit to keep busy. <laughs> On the space station, astronauts use hyperdimensional beings bent on harvesting brains to keep busy. Okay. Like you do. <laughs> on the space station, astronauts use your towel to keep busy. <laughs> <laughs> on the space station, astronauts use dash cams to keep busy. <laughs> Oh, Matthew, 
Is that, is that it? Those were the choices. Okay. Hmm. Let's see. I'm gonna go with your towel, just because it has the dirtiest, the dirtiest possible interpretation of the of the law. <laughs> Those of you who don't know, she's actually secretly a sick mofo. <laughs> she sounds all innocent. I felt the "your" had to be emphasized. Yes, that was true. That's, oh. Wait, was that tiny again? No, no that, that was Pamela. Oh, <laughs> I thought that was all me. <laughs> Who's it? Steve's up? Yep. All right. What do astronauts think about just before launch? <laughs> this fits with what we were talking about regarding Corey earlier today. Everybody in? <laughs> What do astronauts think about just before launch? Sending a proctologist to Uranus. You could tell he dates an astronomer. <laughs> he didn't say Uranus. That's the joke. <laughs> Sending a proctologist to Uranus. Seven minutes of terror. Yeah. yeah. Orion's sword. <laughs> How many of those do we have? <laughs> a naked singularity. <laughs> Spherical coordinate system. I gotta go with the naked singularity. <laughs> we we are twenty three thousand two hundred and five dollars with twenty six minutes remaining. We're seven hundred and ninety five dollars away from removal of beard. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. The the beard the beard fans have asked that I keep it, so I said if we hit twenty five thousand, I'll grow it out like James Clerk Maxwell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so people who want to keep the beard, if we hit twenty four thousand, you have to keep it going. <laughs> Steve, I think. No, Steve no, just no, did just that one. Liz. 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 Oh yay! <laughs> What is humanity's greatest accomplishment? <laughs> or or Chris Hadfield's mustache, apparently. <laughs> I just picked one up at random. All right. Angry Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Steve wins. Oh, that's one of the blank ones for um, suggestions. You could pick another one. Uh, are, you are we missing anybody? I can't see because Nicole's feet. Chuck. Oh, no, you're, no, you're missing me. My bad. <laughs> right. You didn't get a free one. <laughs> Chuck. $23,205 and counting. Uh oh. <laughs> What is humanity's greatest accomplishment? Finding Waldo. <laughs> Self-sealing stem bolts. <laughs> nerds. Woo! <laughs> trademark Wonka candy. <laughs> what? No, that one doesn't no. have a trademark. I tried to put trademark where it was necessary. I really did. <laughs> Sarcastic Rover. Yes. Yes. <laughs> a comet's tail. Yeah. Oh, we should have totally gotten the sarcastic rover on the hangout a thon. I think I need I, some I astronomy know how here to like judge this. What's the sarcastic rover? Tell oh. me things. The Twitter account. Come on. Yes. <laughs> it is legit a Twitter account of a sarcastic rover on Mars. It's yes. fabulous. It is a Twitter account of someone for He's really funny. The rover on that Mars does sound good. Yeah. Yes. So, wait, what was the first one again? Finding Waldo. Oh, that one's also good. Oh. Um, in honor of my Waldo obsessed student, I will have to go with Waldo. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Good yeah. job, Pamela. 
I apparently don't know my Bruce's very well. <laughs> so Nicole, what did you say? Oh. I said I don't know my Bruce's very well. I no, haven't what, what card did you put? Oh, self sealing stem bolts. I asked him it was like is, is she a DS9 fan? We couldn't remember. Oh I am, but I haven't seen it in like a million years. <laughs> and I have a really bad memory <laughs> for things right, that I've on five we all kind of watched recently. Yeah. Okay. She's getting up the sarcastic rover Twitter account. Yeah, I just oh, yeah, to... I do want to hear this. Let's this does sound good. Want to do the next question? Yeah. Sure. Uh, we got Matthew as the next judge. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm the judge next. So, you, so uh, Liz, Liz can can uh, educate herself on the sarcastic rover <laughs> while... Uh... Ah. Back to Twitter. Everyone says that the Cold War was the reason. Really, we went to the moon for blank. That was fast. That was fast. Something that was Orion, probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I could draw another uh -oh. one if I forgot to. I needed that. <laughs> oh, oh I, I, are there any blank cards left? Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, remember Calvin and Hobbes? Yes. Okay. Scientific progress. One of, one, of his, one, of his, one of his fake movies that Calvin's trying to get his mom to let him watch is something like, you know, Venusian vampire vixens or something like that. We need to make a card with that on it. Tweet, tweet at me or at CosmoQuest with that. Okay. With a hashtag card. Now. Oh, he's right it. Never mind. Okay, well that's that's what I'm saying. We we could write it. We could do it right now. Venusian vixens. Venusian Venusian vampire vixens. Vampire I think vixens. Is the name of the movie. Apparently, it needs like a thing. But we will so, look up the we'll have things like cannibal stewardess vixens unchained and things like that. But one of them was Venusian vampire vixens or something like that. So, so, so to to share sarcastic rover, get some tape. Oh, this yeah. is one of the more recent tweets. Yeah, tweet. I just saw that one. It's funny. One square inch down. Uh, <laughs> change five. Oh crap! How many zeros? Uh, trillion. Millions, trillions, trillions. Yeah, I was going to trillion, read that one. And 71 million square inches left. Fourth world problems is the hashtag. That's the <laughs> I, like that. I was going to read that one aloud, and then I was like, no, I don't know how. <laughs> Too hard. <laughs> I actually interviewed him for a story, and unfortunately the story didn't... Uh... The story didn't run, so I've interviewed oh. him, and I didn't get to use the interview. Woo. So, so here's another one he has. This is a, the real reason why no one's allowed to go into the forbidden zone. It's boring. <laughs> <laughs> I like the uh, hope the Earth-like planet that at NASA Kepler found has some horrible deserted wasteland of a rock nearby for robots to explore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, then he goes on to say, I would be very easy to follow, I think. <laughs> so, so we love Sarcastic Rover. We love us some Sarcastic Rover. We want more Sarcastic Rover. But for now, we're going to simply play Cards Against Humanity. Astronomy. Astronomy. Damn it. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to refresh my screen. We are at $24,005. Oh, my God. Here it goes. <laughs> oh, my God. So if you want... Ladder Dr. Up, yeah. Mr. Francis to keep his beard. We have to get to 25. <laughs> we have to get to 25 in the next That's 19 minutes. That's another, what, 995 dollars? <laughs> so we need to bring in 995 dollars to keep the beardy goodness on Dr. Oh, actually, no, he's not just going to keep it. He's going to grow it like longer. Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be like, you know. <laughs> you know. Okay. <laughs> Go totally 19th century. What? Um, question? Yes. Oh. Have the, is oh, yeah, we, we have to, let's repeat the question. Oh, the, yeah. Everyone says the Cold War was the reason. The real reason we went to the moon was for socially awkward astronomers. <laughs> <laughs> Look at how well adjusted we are. <laughs> really, really, we went to the moon for pangalactic gargle blasters. <laughs> A s giant bowl of spicy guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> that would be worth it, yeah. But I had to include that because you guys are hilarious. <laughs> Man needs squat. Panspermia. 
<laughs> Matthew knows what that is. <laughs> I was just hoping I said it correctly. Oh, yes, you did, sweetie. You did. Quark gluon plasma. <laughs> Explain. <laughs> Matthew? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you could go to the moon. If, if, I, I, think, I seem to recall there was a proposal of, of the, <laughs> that you could have quark gluon plasma on the moon. It's it's uh, <laughs> if you if you have uh, if you have high enough energy, you can actually make uh, uh, particles like protons kind of melt, and they make a fluid called the quark gluon plasma. What does that have to do with the moon? Well, the idea is that cosmic rays are high enough energy. People people had a proposal a while back that you, that you could actually make quark gluon plasma in the upper atmosphere. Oh, that's um, nice. <laughs> but I think uh, I think that one was pretty much ruled out. So we couldn't okay, go to the okay. moon. I think, for it, neutri- but, uh, I think neutrino detection. Uh, okay. Anyway, okay, it's it science, out. but is it funny? <laughs> Pick a funny. Hey, quark gluon plasma is a funny phrase, so we can we can make it work. What is that? What is that your decision? Nope. <laughs> is it plasma? It's got to be. It's got to be the pangalactic gargle blaster. Nice. Oh. What was that? Pamela. Pamela. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I hitchhikers <laughs> guide. I picked two hitchhikers guide ones in a row here. Awesome. So I, I am tweeting a picture of Maxwell Clark for those of you who do not understand the glory that was this man's beard. Um, and and so if you follow Cosmic Quest X or at Star Strider, I'm going to retweet. Um, if we hit 25,000, Dr. Mr. Francis, Matthew Francis, is going to grow his beard out. If we stay between 24,000 and 25,000, he's going to shave it off, and the Save Matthew's Beard people will be sad. Save Matthew's Beard! <laughs> You totally screwed yourself, dude. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you, isn't, isn't this all about stunts? Isn't this totally I, about I, stunts? I give away dragon eggs. Matthew gives away his beard, you know. We give away our sanity. I somehow think giving away his beard hurts more. Well, they grow back. <laughs> Yeah, I, gr- I can't grow another dragon egg. Dra- <laughs> when was the last time there was a dragon around? Where are they going to find more eggs? We need a new black card. He's employed now. <laughs> we need that was really you- nice of Tim. He was hurting in the, the soul today. So I know you guys saw him on the <laughs> All right, Steve. Here's the question they will be answering for you. What would you take on a one-way trip to Mars? Oh, of course. I already used the block. <laughs> Dr. Mr. Francis's beard is what I would take. <laughs> do, do we have a do we have a card that we could use to put Maxwell Clark's beard on? Uh, I'm sure we can. Oh yeah, that. there should be. There, yeah, there's probably one that. <laughs> The entire sheet. It goes along with Neil Tyson's mustache and Chris Hadfield's mustache. Yep, yep. Um, All right. Am I ready? Sorry. What would you take on a one way trip to Mars? A red shirt. The ghost of Frank Poole. Merka. Carbonaceous chondrite meteorites that look like poop. That. <laughs> All of Jupiter's moons. <laughs> Gotta be the red shirt. Red shirt. Yeah, red shirt. yeah I was gonna say that. That was a gimme. <laughs> that was a gimme. So if you have not read John Scalzi's red shirts. It is read that book. absolutely hilarious, and there's actually a science paper out on why stormtroopers always mess and the rebels always hit the stormtroopers. <laughs> it's science, people. What? We will find that paper for you, honey. So that do you know the summary of that paper? You should read Red Shirt. I'll okay. read just the summary if that's fine. You should fine. read Red Shirt. No, oh. he wants me to read and explain it. Okay. <laughs> on. Is there a box of pita chips hiding over near my yes. desk somewhere? May I 
have it? No. Thank we you. have 13 minutes left to save Dr. Matthew Francis's beard. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Mr. Francis. I'm trying to... All right. Liz is up next. I am. Okay. The next destination for the spaceship of the imagination is... <laughs> Guacamole is already gone. Feel the grass Tyson's mustache. That would have been a perfect car. <laughs> so true. Oh yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell, right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, read the, the black card again. I was the next destination for the spaceship of the imagination is blank. Yeah, the mustache card would have been perfect. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> Liz Bot, Liz Shark. <laughs> I go by many names. Liz Bot, Liz Shark, Tiny Liz, Tiny Bot. <laughs> I picked one at random, and it's Con. Con. <laughs> the next destination for the spaceship of the imagination is Venusian clouds. Pooping into a tube. <laughs> Wensleydale, <laughs> a wormhole. You say Wensley. Yeah, we didn't like that one. Area fifty-two. <laughs> For those who are off by one. <laughs> oh God, I don't know. Um, uh, read the beginning ones again. <laughs> the Museum clouds, pooping into a tube. <laughs> Wensleydale. A wormhole, an area fifty-two. I I don't know, so I'm gonna go with pooping into a tube <laughs> because that's pooping what you do when you don't know. You just go with pooping. Go with the Why does it not surprise you that that's my girlfriend? Why did Maltz poop? Because because Monty. <laughs> As long as it's not because full Monty. No, <laughs> that's the story you don't want to hear. <laughs> we are at twenty four thousand five dollars and holding with eleven minutes remaining to save. My the beard is going. <laughs> Enjoy it while you have it. I need to get my computer cord. I'll be right back. All right. Next question. When 006 fell off the line feed at Arecibo Observatory, he screamed blank. <laughs> Wait, whose turn is it now? Yours. Is it mine? Okay. I was going to say, I thought, it was, I thought I was up next. Nobody has the con card, I take it. <laughs> <laughs> so you know you're a judge is the usual rule in these games, right? I don't know if we actually have a card for that. When 006 fell off the line feed at Arecibo Observatory, he screamed, screamed, core collapse supernova. <laughs> he screamed, warp drive. He screamed, quantum foam with a touch of racism. <laughs> I don't even know what that one means. <laughs> He, sh he screamed, sound in space, and he screamed, con! Somebody, Somebody had the con! <laughs> yes, yeah, someone had con. Well, that, it, it has to be con. There, there, there is, that, that is the trump card. That is the... That's why I saved it for last, because... <laughs> No, the, I mean, the, 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 there are certain cards that are trump cards that you, yeah. you, you cannot not pick con. With a touch of racism is, is probably a card from the original Cards Against Humanity game. Yeah, I'm pretty probably. sure that is. That was you, okay, yeah. Steve. Steve. Falling into a black hole sucks. But it's a good thing you have your trusty blank. I don't know if I'm using oh. Makes it funnier. Yeah, it makes it funnier. Yeah, it does. <laughs> oh! I have to use this card before we finish. We are at T minus eight minutes and counting. Falling into a black hole sucks, 
But it's a good thing you have your trusty space chimp. That you have your trusty Bruce Willis's space drill. <laughs> you have your trusty model of a solar system. You have your trusty conservation of angular momentum. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they're making they're making a vacation longer. They're 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 making a uh, they're making a, uh, a a TV series out of uh, Gateway. I don't know what that is. Could Never mind. Means... And the <laughs> last one is it's a good thing you have your trusty new law of physics. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like the comic by Jim Meeker about the Arecibo one. Sandy, don't touch that! <laughs> Liz is trying to whisper to me across the internet. That Yeah. <laughs> so, Nancy Graziano is saying, get that razor out, Matthew. Hope you're going to be on Weekly Space Hangout this week. Oh, and she put Matthew's challenge on Facebook as well. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> and, and then, you know, Dusty has your back. Dusty's like, there, I just made Matthew shave his beard. Unless someone donates $1,000. Yes, or... we love you, Dusty. Oh, Dusty, <laughs> Dusty was the one who donated the money to put us over. Uh, oh, dear. Nice. We love you, Dusty. Uh, that's fantastic. Du Dusty is one of Dusty is has taken I think almost all of the Cosmo Academy classes. So Dusty is been... Dusty is a <laughs> and and has helped out at a bunch of our booths. He's he's helped out at a bunch of our booths, and he has by far my favorite uh, profile pic of, Every time of I look all away, it's full. The, the students, <laughs> and and we are being enabled. Um, okay, one of us has to drive home, Don. <laughs> no, you can both spend the night. Oh, that's true. <laughs> All right, we have the youngins to drive us. Yeah, that's true. This is what nineteen-year-olds are for. Um, okay. <laughs> I have to make a decision, don't I? Uh, Moving on. I'm gonna go with Bruce Willis's space drill. Bruce, <laughs> Bruce Power. <laughs> Alright. Because, you know, the space world is magic. Oh, yes. Good point. Good time to, uh, while we're at a breaking point, um, my Black Holes class is coming back in June. I just put the five minutes to save my beard. <laughs> not today. Bruce Willis will not be involved. All right, read it the card. Is it my turn? Yes. yes. Little known fact. The Hubble Space Telescope was originally designed with a blank. I hope it's a self-destruct button. Do we have to put A or N? Or Can we cross out the A? Okay, so the yes. universe is expressing its no, upset like actually, that we have why? to remember to shave it. Matthew's beard. We're starting to get... Thunder outside. <laughs> You're on the edge of severe <laughs> weather. Wait, what is Protect us the way Donna Musgrave uh, did earlier Cosmo today. And bring out with. goodness and light with your donations to CosmoQuest. That's temporary. Yeah. Well, somebody donated $100 to save my beard. Uh, yeah, I thought you were going to say we were starting to get lots of donations. <laughs> no, <laughs> that was unfortunate. <laughs> oh, Dusty. Okay. Little known fact, the Hubble Space Telescope was originally designed with a planet killer. <laughs> the Hubble Space Telescope was originally designed with a galactic cannibalism. Tell me to get rid of the article! Yeah, yeah, with galactic cannibalism. The Hubble Space Telescope was originally designed with astrologers. <laughs> The Hubble Space Telescope was originally designed with the collapsing universe. The Hubble Space Telescope was originally designed with angry Richard Dawkins. <laughs> we have $4,105 with three minutes remaining to rescue Dr. Mr. Francis's beard. Come on, people, donate. Uh, this is no contest. Um... 
can see what I've been reading lately. Oh, yeah. Planet <laughs> Killer. <laughs> planet yeah. Killer. Who's yeah. the Planet Killer? Yeah. Planet Killer. Probably Pamela. <laughs> she held up about oh, one five bucks. Paying attention. Yeah. How many minutes do we have left? Can I buy? Is, we is have we are two minus three minutes and counting. Do we have Wait, time for another wanna, question? Yep. One more. One more. One more. One more. Want to borrow my Babylon Five book? Yeah. You can. Okay. Yeah. Supernova occur when a blank collapses. Thank you for talking to the word there. <laughs> 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 I got nothing good. <laughs> oh wow, I have a very thin I only have six cards. That didn't help. <laughs> I'm gonna play it anyways. It doesn't it's matter what you guys card. put in, Angry Razor <clears throat> Dawkins wins. Even though it wasn't played this card round. Yes. Still win. <laughs> it's like Con wins even on those. Con wins everything. <laughs> Supernova occur when a galactic anti center collapses. When a Batman breathing in space collapses. <laughs> when a laser welding robot collapses. Wielding. Wield it, sorry. Like what? <laughs> a laser wielding <laughs> robot collapses. Like the welding mask. <laughs> when a steampunk telescope collapses. When a derelict satellite collapses. And I randomly pulled Bill Nye's hair. <laughs> <laughs> I won! <laughs> like the best card. <laughs> was, that was the best card. Playing in these. We have one minute remaining, folks. Uh oh. We are at T minus one minute. Bum, bum, bum. And I'm refreshing the page. And our server is Decide, turned. Matthew! Refresh, refresh, refresh. Oh, oh was, it, was it my turn? Oh, man, I'm sorry. $124,000, um, <laughs> and I owe everyone a happy dance. I'm happy dancing. I'm happy dancing. My happy dance is really sad. Look at that, she's head <laughs> Okay, she knows how to dance. I know how to ride horses. They're di different, different things. Yay! <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, so we have Rich Hayward saying, "Great, everyone. You guys are all awesome. You guys are the ones who are Whee! awesome tonight." <laughs> it's my dissertation. I can tell you, my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have in the past 36 hours managed to raise. We are now at 10 p.m. Not enough money to force me to dye my hair blonde. Thank you, internet, but not thank you. I love you and hate you simultaneously. Uh, we have raised $24,125 in 36 hours. Besting last year. We bested last year. We also went four hours longer than last year, but even four hours ago we had bested last year. Um, internet... <laughs> People is good. You guys have done a fabulous job, but this is only just the beginning. We have done a 36 hour hangout a fun to sing for our supper. We are now going to continue for 36 more days at a slower pace. <laughs> no, no Look play for 36 we will days. We still have cool stuff for you guys to win or get. Uh, I'm thinking of bringing back um, Matthew, you may remember this from the Do It Yourself Science Zone fundraiser. The Abstract Mad Libs, which are yeah. very not safe for work, but we think of bringing that back as a uh, uh, an option for donations to do play Mad Libs when we hit certain levels and have everybody uh, join in that game. So and and I'm have gonna, all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to continue doing my uh, random YouTube videos about our project. So there's two of them up already. Both of them with no makeup, because um, apparently that's the voice I use to say I'm wearing no makeup. If she's going to be serious, I'm going to curse a lot. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and I'm going to be very sincere, because that's what I do. Um, and we're going to work to try and bring Some in money so that you guys can help fix what Congress has done wrong when they said we need to send the scientists home because the space race has been won. Um, there are storms moving in. They, so the universe is angry that we have not raised enough money, but you know, I'm pretty proud. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Sincerely. 
thank you, everyone. Everyone who's been on the show, everyone who gave us gifts, everyone who's donated, everyone who has shared and retweeted and just done all the amazing stuff. Thank you. You guys freaking rock. And we do this so we can keep this community going and hang out with you and do science with you. So thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to stop this broadcast and for the tornadoes <laughs> and look at a weather report. <laughs> um, I'm be safe. I have been following the weather. We are safe where we are. Everything that's bad is south of us. Um, our our hopes, our wishes, our sincerest, all the feels are with the people down in Arkansas who are having terrible tornadoes today. We have had a great day. We have been lucky. I know not everyone has, so stay safe out there. Take care of your neighbors. Um, and thank you for taking care of us. Have a great rest of your Sunday, Monday, wherever you are in this world. I'm signing out. Good luck, and may the space, make space, make science, not war.